Hello, I'm Elaine King and I'm Chief Executive at the Children's Conservation Board. Thank you for joining us today for what looks to be a really interesting programme of talks and activities around citizen science. I just wanted to talk to you about why citizen science is so important. For us as an organisation, we really rely on really good evidence and data that can be used to inform policy decisions. It helps us as an organisation decide how we're going to do our work and how to do it in the best way. But it also means that the data that citizen scientists collect goes towards a huge body of information that can then be used at a regional and a national level to help our government decide how best to look after our special landscapes and all the wildlife and the cultural features and all the important parts of the landscape that makes our country so important. So thank you for joining us and thank you for what contributions you're making towards collecting citizen science. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Tom Beeston, I'm the Chief Officer at the Children's Society. Um, citizen scientists, or as we call them volunteers, are critical to all our work across the Chilterns. Um, without, without citizen scientists we wouldn't know the state uh, of our biodiversity today, which we need to do a lot more work on. Without citizen scientists, we probably wouldn't even know the state of our climate. We certainly wouldn't be able to report back uh, to the water companies, to the government and everybody else on the state of our chalk streams across the Chilterns. And all I've really got to say is thanks and a massive thanks to all those volunteers that help. And I think because of the, the, the point of this conference, I think in particular I'd like to uh, thank those that have worked on our GIS project. Um, where people come back and they look at all the great LIDAR work that's been done and they find great things and through Citizen Scientists I believe we've even found new hill forts or a new hill fort on the Chiltern Hills uh, that we didn't even know existed before. So it's just a great big thank you to you all uh, and keep up the great work. Hi, I'm Eliza Algsar and I manage the environment team at Buckinghamshire Council. So how do we use Citizen Science? Well, we rely on data to do our work. We get data from recorders and volunteers who go out and gather data from the environment for us. We use that so that we can give advice and make decisions on planning and development. It's really important that we get this data because it fills gaps in our knowledge and understanding of the wildlife in this county because it's very difficult to protect or conserve something that's unknown. We use national initiatives like butterfly counts and the hedgehog hunts and local bioblitzes to receive data. We can use this data for mapping habitats which we can then use to create new habitats, to connect habitats, and to work on bigger initiatives like tackling climate change on a local level. That's why citizen science is so important. Have a great conference. It's always really important to reflect on the value of volunteers to CCB and BBOUT across our area. Volunteers are the lifeblood of our organisations and bring many and diverse skills to the work that we do. And importantly, they carry out the citizen science work that we vitally need, that information about biodiversity on the ground that we need to make really, really high level, top level decisions about what happens to our environment locally. So it gives me great pleasure to say a massive thank you on behalf of, of our organisations to all of our volunteers for all that you do for us for free, year on year. Thank you very, very much and have a wonderful day with Chris Packham. Good morning everybody and welcome to the Chilterns Champions um, Outstanding in Their Fields Conference. Apologies for some technical hitches, hoping um, you, you managed to see the introductory video there from, uh, from, uh, from our guest speakers and uh, so welcome. Uh, welcome. Um, so as setting the context today, the UK is the, um, the envy of the world um, in our citizen science and um, we're pleased today to really bring you a whole celebration of, of citizen science and, it, and its broadest guises from wildlife, from heritage, and to really say a big thank you to all of those of you out there who are involved in citizen science projects and to share with the other ideas, other schemes that are out there and, and the big difference that, that it really makes in a whole range of different contexts. So we hope you enjoy the day. Um, we hope you that the, the technology holds and forgive us if it's a little bit, um, a little bit maybe a little bit clunky as we go through, but hope you can bear with us on, on those fronts. Um, we have a wide programme for you today. We have 29 speakers, um, so if there's something in it for, for everybody, um, feel free to dip in or dip out as, as we go through the session, but hopefully you'll find um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of things for interest as we go through the, through the day. Um, the YouTube link is open all day, so you're able to dip in, dip out, go for lunch or go and make a cup of tea or, or have a brew. Um, and it's going to be recorded as well, so if you miss a session, then you'll be able to pick up on those sessions um, 
on our YouTube after the event. Um, feel free to, to dip onto social media and to chat about the day or your thoughts on some of the sessions. Um, and if you want to use the hashtag Children's Champions, that will be fantastic. Um, and in terms of how to get involved and copies of information of all the different opportunities to get involved in citizen science projects, we'll send around various information after the event and place things on our website. So um, hopefully you'll enjoy the day. Um, my role really now um, from the Children's Conservation Board, again, is to, to welcome you to all to say thank you to the National Lottery Heritage Fund for funding the, the wider chalk shows and chairs and, and beacons to the past projects and uh, to thank them. And now to, to introduce Chris. Um, so thanks, Chris, for um, taking the time out to, to join us this morning. Conscious you're in a very busy time at the moment with um, a small TV programme starting next week. So thank you for your, your time this morning. Um, and I guess people of, kind of my, my kind of age will probably remember you, Chris, from your first days on the really wild show with slightly uh, more eclectic haircuts and, and other things. And have kind of stayed with me through my kind of um, involvement into kind of wildlife and conservation. But I guess more latterly, your um, your involvement with Spring Watch and Autumn Watch and, and Winter Watch have, have really kind of um, stayed with us all and probably inspired us all. And speaking to to some of the young younger people we have on the programme later, they've all said how influential Spring Watch and, and Autumn Watch has been in their journey into wildlife and into citizen science. So so thank you for, for your your efforts there. But equally um, behind the screen, your attempts as a and, and your championing the cause for wildlife. You're a real champion for the sector and it's great to have you here today. Um, couldn't think of a better speaker to open our conference and to open the first session, really looking at why citizen science matters. So Chris, over to you to lead us through the first session. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Nick. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to, to kick off today. Uh, the Chilterns is an area which is of uh, enormous importance when it comes to UK's flora and fauna. I've had the privilege of visiting a number of sites there over the years, of course. Um, I even once went to High Wycombe to make a, uh, a film about bodgers, the chair makers. So it's not, of course, just the natural history that we're interested in today. It's the human history and the culture as well. And we'll be hearing about that a bit later on. Uh, so my plan is to speak for about 20 minutes now, and then I'm going to hand over to four other speakers in this first uh, section. Uh, Gavin Serdwadina uh, is going to be speaking to us uh, as well, Michael Pocock, Megan McCleverty and Arjun Dutta. Um, but before I get started, I just always like to share something I've recently found. And, and this was sort of pertinent, I, I think, um, to the Chilterns. So here is a skull that I picked up on my dog walk uh, a couple of days ago. Um, I, I won't be running this as a quiz. I'm going to tell you what it is straight away. And I imagine many of you will have identified it. So if you look underneath, you can see it's got herbivorous teeth here. Uh, the front section of the of uh, the nose here is missing uh, but what's distinctive are these two short sharp horns uh, here which are formerly uh, would have been covered um, in uh, in an, uh, an outer covering and this is this is a uh, the skull of a male muntjac so a reeves muntjac there are 12 species of muntjac around the world. The Reeves muntjac, so named after uh, someone Reeves who was in the East India com uh, Company, is also called the Chinese muntjac. And they were introduced into the UK. They were non-native species. Um, Woburn was one of the original sources of their introduction, but I think the majority got out of Whipsnade, uh, Whipsnade Wildlife, uh, Wildlife Park, and they have spread widely. Um, so as a non-native species, they do provide us with some problems in the sense that they are ferocious browsers of uh, undergrowth and its removal means that we, we lose the foraging uh, habitat of uh, many woodland bird species, things like uh, chiffchaff, willow warbler, gap, black cap and nightingale like to forage in that 30 centimetres of plant cover in, in woodlands. And that's exactly what the muntjac loves munching. Um, and uh, as a consequence of that, they can have a, a, a negative impact there uh, as well. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that the front of the skull is missing because the two tusks here that they use for fighting would have been, uh, would have been present. Um, and when they do fight, they use these little antlers to twist each other over onto their sides and then they stab one another with their tusks, uh, normally solitary. And what's also interesting, if you look at the skulls, I'm gonna get, it's just this large indentation here uh, because they have a, what we call a pre-orbital gland. 
uh, and you can see what appears to be a, a, an enlarged tear duct if you look at these animals and they they squeeze a sticky solution out of the preorbital gland which they put onto twigs and pieces of vegetation about their head height. So that would probably be about 40 centimeters off the ground. It's black and sticky. Um, and it's obviously uh, filled full of pheromones, chemicals, which communicate to other muntjac um, that uh, this particular animal has been, has been present. So interesting animals, but they come with uh, an interesting cultural history, human history in terms of their introduction, but also a contemporary history when it comes to how we manage them and treat them in our in environment. That one's, that skull has shed all sorts of uh, relatively uh, unpleasant things over my kitchen worktop, which I'll clean up in March or something. Um, so Chiltern's Champions Conference, uh, celebrating citizen science is what we're about today. Chalk, cherries and chairs is, is the project. And I thought I'd just, um, before we got started, if you're not familiar with the project, tell you a little bit about this from the website. So I'm just gonna read directly from that. It, it's, it's described here as an ambitious five year scheme, which aims to connect local people to wildlife and the cultural heritage of the central Chilterns. Um, and it operates under three themes, wildlife, heritage and people. Um, going forward, it, it, the, the, the scheme is conceived to address, and this is where I think we get to um, more important th issues, um, the real and immediate challenges facing the central Chilterns. And you will know that they include things such as the HS2 development, um, the loss of ancient woodlands, not just through H uh, HS2, but because they're being sold off, fragmentation of wildlife habitats, which we see not obviously just in the Chilterns, but all over the, the UK. Uh, all over the world, unfortunately, hedgerows disappearing, and also critically, uh, an, an, an increasing disconnect between people and their local landscape. Its mission is to leave an important legacy, uh, to establish improved conservation and land management, close partnership working, improved skill sets, motivated volunteers, and engage and aware communities who care for the future of their heritage. Um, very generously sponsored, sponsored by the Heritage Lottery Fund. I sincerely hope that all of those objectives are met. I think that they're, as I said, not peculiar to the Chilterns in any way, shape or form. I fear that our connection to our community, our community countryside in, in some context, is something which is doing us enormous harm. This spring under lockdown, many more people connected with that community. I think they went out into spaces which they knew well, perhaps they walked or drove through them when they typically traveled to work or to take their children to school or if they were school children as they traveled to school. But during that period when our lives were slowed down, we didn't just see things, we looked at them. We didn't just hear things, we listened to them. And many, many people re-engaged or engaged with nature for the first time. And the lasting impact of that, I think will be significant. People's eyes were open to the fact that they were surrounded by an enormous richness of life and an enormous richness of opportunities for them to connect with that life and benefit from that connection. People spoke freely and candidly about how in this time of crisis, their mental health had been significantly improved through that engagement. They found solace and respite in simple things. Those bird songs, which had always been there in, in the background of their lives, but were brought to the forefront because they took the time to listen and they were enchanted um, and, and, and they were, their spirits were lifted. And this again is the underlying aim of, of chalk, cherries and chairs. It's saying to the people who are fortunate to live in the Chilterns, um, don't let familiarity breed contempt. You, this is a wonderful part of the world. It, it's filled full of all sorts of extraordinary, Munjak, and ordinary, um, like there's a very long list of fabulous species that, that grow in this area, military orchid, wow. I mean, fantastic stuff. Um, so it, it's, it needs to be looked after and, the statement of the very obvious is that the best people to look after it are people living in those communities. I care for your area. I care broadly, as, as, as we all do, um, when it comes to trying to look after our landscape and its wildlife and our environment. 
But my greatest focus as a resident of the New Forest is on my doorstep. It's, it's where I can see things, react to things most quickly. It's where if I make a, an investment, um, I see the reward uh, most easily. Um, and so looking after our own patches is, is, is really very, very important indeed. How do we motivate people to do that? Let's hope we don't have too many more lockdowns and they're forced to, to do it. Um, I think citizen science is a brilliant way of getting people to achieve a number of, of great objectives. But let's think about the first one. Um, and that is people have to go out and look at or look for things and they have to record them or report them. And this means that they will be therefore looking for these things in their gardens, over the fence, in, in their, the, the, their immediate surroundings. Um, and they will engage with them. Now, a number of citizens science projects are, 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 are very successful in the UK. We have the RSPB's um, uh, Garden Bird Watch, which runs in January. We have Butterfly Conservation's um, uh, summer citizen science project, which they, they run ev every year, looking at uh, butterflies. Uh, birds and butterflies are amongst those species which we frequently and easily in, in, engage with in, in the UK. And we've generated enormous amounts of data, and I'm sure some of our speakers later on today will, will draw uh, upon these and, and, and other recording schemes. Um, the BTO has a long legacy of fantastic data acquisition through volunteers, uh, citizen scientists, which mean that in the UK, our finger is more firmly on the pulse of our wildlife populations, distributions um, and changes in those than anywhere else in the world. I would argue that we are, the UK is the best known in terms of, of, of its um, birds, butterflies, most of it is significant flora and fauna. And that comes down to, to amateurs, volunteers, citizen scientists. There are lots of brilliant scientists out there, lots of brilliant employees of Wildlife Trust, RSP, BTO, all of the others. But the, the bulk of the people collecting this data are unpaid volunteer citizen scientists. What motivates them to set their alarms and go out and do it? Their passion, of course. Their passion to reward themselves through that engagement, the thrill that they get through you know, finding new things or seeing familiar things um, that they, they love very much. Sometimes, of course, we partake in projects which are new to us and we're encouraged to go and look for things, even as naturalists, even as dedicated birders or entomologists. We, we are challenged by citizen science to go and look at new things. And this opens our eyes to even more of those riches that I've spoken of previously. So I think engagement is the first thing that we must acknowledge and not underestimate its importance. Citizen science is not all about data and it's not all about results. It's about communities seeing what's on their doorstep and learning to love it, develop an affinity for it and therefore want to look after it. And that's a very important component. The second thing is data. Um, as I've already said we have an ex extraordinary uh, uh, group of scientists in the UK using up-to-date technologies to learn more quickly uh, about more things than we could ever have imagined in our youth. Um, but there aren't that many of them. And in these times where funding is tight, um, uh, it, it's, it, we would love lots more, but they are reliant on us volunteers to go out and, and, and basically tick the boxes, fill in the squares, write down the names, upload everything and send them to them to, to, to be crunched. So the legion, as I've mentioned, um, although not grammatically accurately when I say legion, um, uh, of volunteers uh, is in, incredibly important. Does the data matter? Does it work? Um, not always. Um, some citizen science projects that I've helped launch and, um, and participate in, I would argue, were probably not delivering the strongest scientific rewards, but don't underestimate their success in terms of getting people out and, and interested. Others, of course, are ex ex uh, amazingly uh, rewarding in terms of the science, and increasingly so as we utilise those new technologies. Um, so our data matters um, and in the right hands that, that data can be used and ultimately that's what we're about. 
Um, what we would like from our citizen science projects in terms of that sort of reward is the, the ability to present the data so that people can make better informed decisions about how they uh, manage the species or the environment or our human communities. And best informed decisions is what we should always be aiming for. I'm afraid we don't always get them, and I won't spend too much time talking about HS2. Um, but one could argue that that is a project where best informed decisions have not always been made, and maybe it's time to stop and rethink it, given the data which has been provided by scientists and citizen science uh, scientists too. So I think that. Um, those are, are for me the, the, the key attributes to, to, to that. Um, and then there's one more which we must which, 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 which we would add must add to it. And that is that you know I'm speaking as a, a lifelong naturalist, someone who, who's never had any trouble setting that alarm clock and getting up and getting out there. Um, but I'm 59 years old. And um, I'm not going to be so rude as to ask how old Gavin and Michael are, but what we do recognise in the UK is that we, we are in an ageing sector when it comes to top quality naturalists. Um, people who've dedicated a lifetime to focusing on, you know, one or two subjects whose expertise is globally unrivaled. I'm not saying that there are not young, extraordinarily brilliant naturalists, there are. My argument would be there was not as many of them as there used to be. So engaging young people with nature is something that we are all uh, very aware of that, that needs to be at the forefront of our interest concerns and uh, activities. And citizen science is a brilliant way of doing that. It's a task orientated objective. You have to go and look at things, count things. You have to complete the task by uploading or sharing that data or maybe even analyzing that data yourself. Um, and many young people during their, the process of their uh, classical schooling are taught to be task focused. They have essays to complete. They have tests to complete. They have exams to take, all of which have a beginning, a middle and an end. Uh, relatively in short term. So their mindsets are, at that time of their lives fit many citizen science projects. So in a way, it's a template, if you like, which they can readily um, engage with. Um, and that makes it slightly easier for them. It's formatted. It's, it's not something that you have to be self-motivated to develop. Someone else has sat down and put together the program for you. It's a bit like school at uh, college and to less extent now university, but in my day, that was very formatted too. Um, and that makes it accessible and easy. And for those young people whose interests are not principally wildlife, environmental care, culture, history, whatever they are, but it's on the periphery of their interest, then citizen science is a way of drawing them, uh, of drawing them in, into it. And many of the citizen science projects which are uh, developed in the UK are certainly developed with young people principally in mind or as, uh, uh, to be made as accessible as possible to them. And I imagine if we were to conduct a poll of the competent batch of um, very exciting and able young naturalists that we do have um, coming through the ranks, if you were rising rapidly through the ranks, I would have to say, at the moment, that many of them have, have taken part in citizen science projects uh, and, and would continue to do so. So I think that there are, there are reasons, that those are the principal reasons to, 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 to do it. Um, from a personal point of view, um, I, I do as many of these surveys as I possibly can, and, and I do most of them close to home. Um, because that's where it's easiest for me to do them. And it's where I would have an, a, a, an interest in. So imagine there's a citizen science project, there was one a few years ago, um, uh, looking at earthworms. Now, I'm sure you've got some great gardens and great patches, parks and nature reserves, and they're probably full of, you know, uh, earthworms. But I'm, I would, I'm, I'm interested in what's in my garden. 
And then I'm interested in what's over the fence um, and where I am, not too many earthworms because the soils are really acid, to be honest with you. But that's what's going to get me out with my, my fork, um, my meter quadrat and my little tray to count worms. It, it's, it's looking at my patch. And given that I'm, you know, I don't know too much about worms, I could start telling you about the 27, 28 or 29 British species. So obviously I've got a little bit there, but I still have a lot to learn. And that ability through a guided process, because someone else has come up with the scheme, to be led through a, a learning process, I find irresistible. You know, I'd love to learn more about the earthworms in my garden um, or some other species. So these sorts of projects excite a great range of people. And uh, as a consequence, uh, I think that they are, are tremendously important. Anyway, enough from me. Um, let's move on to the first of our uh, guests this morning. And I've got his uh, biography here. Uh, so that to get, uh, Dr. Gavin Serdwadina uh, from the British Trust for Ornithology was brought up in Aylesbury, got into Birdie when he was 11, a little bit earlier than me there, Gavin. I, I got into it when I was about 12 or 13. Joined the RSPB members group when it first started, evolved into a lifelong interest in wildlife, uh, leading to a career in ecology and conservation at the British Trust for Ornithology. And again, um, Gavin probably won't say it as he's a, an employee, but I will. Um, the BTO is one of the best things in Britain. You know, we've got the RSPCA, we've got the big issue, we've got the BBC, but we've also got the BTO. And the BTO has done enormously important work for ornithology and now other species in, in the UK. It, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. And if you're not members of the British Trust for Ornithology, then I would urge you to, to think about joining the BTO. Um, He's worked for more than 20 years there, mostly on research and monitoring farm and birds, um, and also looking at the BTO's national data sets. He's currently head of terrestrial ecology um, at that NGO, and in his spare time, he doesn't get much birding done anymore. Now that, Gavin, is a tragedy. I would urge you that the, the minute we're finished today or tomorrow, you get your bins out and give yourself five minutes off to go and see the real thing, um, because you don't want to leave that behind you. Uh, but he does say that when he goes on holiday, he's a manic birder. So Gavin, give us your presentation and um, well, I'll tell you what, before you get started, tell us what your favourite bird is in your community and, and why. Oh, that's, that's put me on the spot, Chris, thank you. Um, so favourite bird um, for fairly nerdy reasons, because I've worked on it a lot, is yellow hammers. Um, yeah, I love a yellow hammer. It's, uh, it's around all year round in the farmland around here and most over most of the uh, most of England. Um, it's really interesting demographically, doing lots of stuff that other things aren't doing. Um, so, and it's they're really they're really cute in the hand. Nice songs, nice calls. So yeah, that's mine. <laughs> so, um, okay. Well, thank you, any for thank you, any for that introduction. And I obviously I completely um, echo the the sentiment to join the BTO. Hopefully, we'll do something towards persuading you, anybody out there, to do that today. Um, I've been asked, anyway, I've been asked by Nick uh, to talk today about why citizen science matters to decision makers, uh, because this is something that it's, it's the area that I tend to work in a lot, is doing a lot of research and monitoring work and communicating that to, to the government, mostly various different government organisations and, and related, uh, uh, related audiences around, around the UK and elsewhere. And citizen science has a real role to play in that. And basically where this comes from is that if we, if we care about wildlife and the environment as a society, then we need data on where, um, where what is where, what, um, what wildlife or environmental features are in different places and how those things are changing and how the events in the world like climate change, like weather, um, weather events or policy changes affect those things. So some things in those areas like air quality, pollution, um, areas of woodland, areas of salt marsh, those sorts of things are best measured by a uh, sort of highly technical kit, um, which needs to be run by official government agencies. It's things like um, um, air quality monitors and uh, satellite imagery to record the spread of habitat. However, that sort of thing can't tell us anything about how many skylarks there are, um, whether those populations are going up or down, or the same for sm small tortoise shells, ash trees, you name it. We don't have any data from, from that. We need to go out and measure those things, count them. 
And to do that for mo mobile wildlife in particular is really, really difficult. Um, to get reliable information on numbers or status of those things. And to illustrate that, if, if I say to you, if you feed birds in your garden, for example, can you say how many blue tits there are you feed in your garden each year? Um, you've got them, they come in, but how many actually are there? You may see three at a time, four at a time, you've no idea how many there really are. You may see hedgehogs from time to time, but can you really say whether they live in your garden or in your street, or are they passing through? What's actually going on? You don't really know. But fortunately, with a combination of recording observations of this sort of thing in a controlled or structured way, and using the right methods to analyze the data that come in from doing that, which is basically citizen science, we can then extract information about the status and trend of these, of these animal groups from the sorts of records that can be made by anybody who can identify those species. And this is specifically where citizen science comes in. Um, by organizing recording by volunteers into schemes, we can generate the sort of large scale long term information that simply can't be collected in any other way. It would cost, we do, and we do do surveys with um, professional field staff, people we send out who expert um, naturalists to do this. But to collect that, this level of information at a national scale would cost an absolute fortune and it just, it's just not feasible. Um, so we can get collect this information using volunteers and using these sort of survey schemes. Um, and the other side, the side of this is that it, the more organization we apply to this data collection, such as um, asking people to go to randomly chosen locations and to, and to count things, to record things in standard ways, as Chris mentioned, using a, a meter quadrat in your garden and a, and a sort of digging to a certain depth in the soil to count worms, that sort of thing which is the sort of approach we've taken in the, in the breeding bird survey, for example, not with, not with forks and quadrats, but with large one kilometer squares. This, if we use this sort of organization, the more we do that, the more we can do with the data that are collected as a result. And hence, thanks to the efforts of the thousands and thousands of citizen, science across the, citizen scientists across the UK, we, can, we have lots and lots of high quality data that will allow us to identify declines population declines in species that we're interested in, and to find hotspots of population that we need to protect. We can also do loads of scientific studies on the impacts of things like climate change and what I've done a lot of, the intensification of agriculture and urbanization. We actually measure the effects of those things on, on um, wildlife. And at the same time, we can then evaluate the impact of policy measures that aim to mitigate those things. And, Another thing I work a lot on is agri-environment schemes where farmers are paid to do some of this sort of mit action and mitigation for um, population uh, effects, negative population effects on birds. And th what that leads us to is a, we can then do things like underpin high, high profile, um, schemes like BBS then underpin high profile reporting of uh, data, which is then used directly in policy. And at this point, I'm going to just show you a couple of, or try, attempt to show you a couple of examples of this. Um, so you should be able to see, I don't know, Michael, somebody give me a thumbs up. Can you see that screen? Yep, thanks, Michael. So yeah, so um, you can see the, the farmland bird, uh, this is sort of a farmland bird index and other large scale um, policy uh, indicators that we use for, farm, for birds for example, at the national scale. These sorts of things, once upon a time, were explicitly part of a government policy target to improve the environment. And that's the sort of level of policy use that's been, um, that these the data have been applied to, but they actually represent the, the efforts of citizen scientists and the data wouldn't exist in any other way. These same sorts of data that come from the Breeding Bird Survey now contribute to bird policy population monitoring across the whole of Europe and tell us about population sizes and the international significance of the populations that we have in the UK. So using this kind of index, it's this sort of, um, it's this sort of measure that actually, uh, that has alerted the conservation and policy worlds to the farm and biodiversity crisis. And this led directly to the, intro, to the um, introduction of conservation measures into agri-environment schemes to, to um, address the problems with farmland birds. And it's provided 
uh, the hard evidence of, ch of um, change in farmland bird populations that was used in policy arguments to, to persuade farmers that this sort of thing is important and that's not a straightforward thing to achieve actually. So also with that analysis of these kinds of data, if we could get this, this going to work, um, with this kind of data we can uh, we can we can combine we can find um, citizen we can get the citizen science data to using things like nest recording which we also do at BTO um, and recoveries of ring birds we tell us about the patterns of bre in, in breeding success and survival in bird populations that oh, does work okay so yeah this so there's just this you don't have to worry about the details here but this is again de data from the breeding bird survey on skylarks and showing the effect of the amount of stubble in the landscape on the population trend. So the population trend is more stable where there's more overwinter stubble in the landscape. This kind of result helps us to show that where you have population, where, where there is more of this uh, management in the landscape, the birds do better. And this is immediately points to a conservation um, solution to the problem. With bird ringing, we can find movements of birds, but you can also measure their survival over time. And with our nest, BTO's nest recording scheme, where people record what goes on in individual nests, we can record breeding success. And these things tell us, combined, tell us that the that's, um, overwinter survival is most important for a lot of bird species. And particularly, it follows this argument that stubble, for example, in the landscape is really important. Um, then more generally, the citizen science data is informs lots of our national data on population changes. So they provide lots of publications about red listing of birds for conservation concern, the state of the nature in, in nature of the UK and bird populations in general. These reports all rely on the same data sets, data sources. And the B and the sorts of things we've done with bird with them, um, with uh, the B, with the BBS data is show the effect of overwinter stubble management, wild bird seed mix options in, in agri-environment, which provide seed in winter for bird populations. These th and the importance of these things, the effects they have on breeding populations of birds. And this all feeds into the design of agri-environment schemes, of which there are different ones in different parts of the UK. But this has all been relevant and the data have fed into the policy picture that we have, that has been applied and are still being used now to, to measure the effects of these things as they go forward. Um, then, we, as I say, we've evaluated this, some of our research results published in scientific journals. We've, we've looked at whether these, um, whether the management of, whether different things in the landscape affect populations. So we, we can test effects of winter weather on climate, climate uh, inf weather information, sorry, wind, winter weather effects on birds, conditions in on the mic on the um, wintering grounds effects on migratory species effects of predators on um, on bird populations which show that basically numbers of, of sparrow hawks which are often blamed for declines are not related to the numbers of, of um, populate uh, the populations of breeding songbirds for example we've tested all these things using the citizen science data and it's all really important for the contribute to the development of of um, policy uh, for conservation Chris mentioned deer browsing. We've we've um, we've measured these effects as well on bird populations in in and published scientific papers. Um, and that's and so there's a whole range of different things we've done, as I say, with the with the citizen science data, and these things continue to happen. Um, what I would say to finish off and to back up something that Chris said as well is all this work depends on the efforts of the volunteers, and they're absolutely invaluable. But we also need to do the data processing and analyses that underlie these things and these things aren't free um, they depend on ngos bto is one but there are many others as well butterfly conservation plant life and um, the botanical society of the british isles the national biodiversity network and um, michael who's following me the agency he works for a center for ecology and hydrology they all these organizations work with um, gov uh, government country conservation agencies like natural england and charities like the RSPB uh, to get the to get the funding in to keep these the programs going, and that needs to be maintained. And we need citizen scientists to keep working to do that. 
Um, and we've got loads of people doing it now, but people drop out and we need replacements for those. Um, and just finally, I'd say, despite all the benefits and positives from all of this, we have, uh, there are gaps in, in the data. Um, there are unpopular animal groups that aren't recorded very well. And remote areas like uplands and less pleasant ones like city centres are under recorded relative to the nice places. Um, so that, and also those things we need more data from. And we can divide, we have good evidence from the schemes we've got about the national picture, what goes on across the whole of the UK, for example, or England. But the data are less reliable, very locally at small scales. So if you want to find out things to go on, that, that find out what's going on at local level and in your own region, that's where you need really detailed and ex, uh, extra effort to go on. And that's where the, the efforts of Nick and the Tracking the Impact team come in and it's really really positive and complementary to what the rest of us are doing at the national scale so that is all I wanted to say I want so I shall hand back to Chris now thanks Thank Gary uh, can I just ask you a couple of things before you go um, one thing that that we always worry about is making sure that we can engage as many people with the projects that we devise and some of the data that you've shown um, may may have been intimidating to people but you know they may think oh like it's all over my head i'm just a beginner i've only just got into you know whatever branch of natural history it is but we, we'd all be very keen to say that most of these citizen science projects are designed to bring people in from any level of interest and any level, level of ability aren't they there's a comp to be honest there's a combination an organization like bto we have projects which are based which are ideal for getting people in who don't know so much you don't have to be an expert you don't have to have been doing it for years and years and we have other projects where you do need to be an expert if you're going to ring birds you do need to be trained to do that safely to know how to identify them properly so that we don't waste the effort that we put in that people put in on doing that so there is a combination frankly but we there's always a way into this and we want to bring people on a journey from starting with the things which are easier to to um to do with have less requirement for specific skills and bring them on to being able to do the more complicated things but absolutely it's the date the what i wanted to show is that we can do really we can do really quite quite complicated as science that has quite, that has high evidence value from these data from what pretty much anybody can do and you there are, you can start from just being able to identify one thing if you can identify that thing and tell it that it's not all the other things, then you can report that and so schemes like our bird track scheme and you can um, provide useful information in that way. Just one other thing, you touched on it at, at the end of your presentation there um, about the, the dearth of data from the uplands perhaps um, and, and our city centres. Um, one of the problems that we have had with citizen science projects in the past is people like to see things and they like to record things. So they don't like going to places where they don't see as much and can't record as much. And I know that in areas of intensive agriculture, where there are less birds, for instance, we get less records. But we've got to stress from the outset here that negative data, things not being there, is every bit as important as positive, i.e. they are their data, isn't it? That, that's right, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. That is absolute, I think absolutely that is true. And I also think it's important. You, there's actually a lot of interest in going out to places that aren't naturally very interesting, if you like, because there are, you will still see things there. And what's more, those things are then interesting for your, where you are. And I think it's, it's most, a lot of birders, for example, get excited about things, rare things in Britain that are really, really common in, in other countries. And, and this is something where you can apply that to any level. And it's the same in your garden. If you get something in your garden you've never seen before, it might be really common a few miles away out in the general countryside. And it's the same thing you can apply. If you, you go to a patch of farmland, for example, like you say, you get to know that area, you'll know the nice bits. And then you'll see, especially if the farmers are doing something um, in agri environment or whatever to improve the habitat, you'll see other things starting to come in and then that becomes it's really interesting and that sort of that sort of patch approach is really worth, I would really encourage that and you can and also what's more you can really engage the farmers that way as well and the land owned people in that area if you quite often if I'm around doing surveys people they'll see walking around binoculars in a place where people don't usually do that 
and that you can get um they will ask you oh what 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 are you doing or what have you seen and if you said oh well then i've seen such and such as oh really i didn't know we had those here and that's really there's often more about than you think i would suggest and if you look you can find it and then you it becomes quite interesting excellent gavin thank you very much indeed um, before we move on to our, um, our next presentation, uh, there's a question that's come in here from Sheena. How does citizen science compare to scientific research using hypotheses and randomised data collection? Um, well, Sheena, if it's done properly, it, it, um, it doesn't compare, it, it equates to that. <laughs> and, and, and people like Gavin and our next speaker, Michael, um, spend a lot of time making sure that these projects are put together as rigorously as possible to make sure that the data collected through all the hard work and endeavour of the participants is, is uh, valid and, and can be used that way. Um, so yes, very, very much so. And the BTO, as you know, I'm going to carry on blowing their, their trumpet this morning, is, is brilliant at designing those projects and also making sure that the data sets are standardised and can be used over a long period. So what the BTO have done is evolved citizen science projects, which have been running now for a long time, which means that data is comparable. And that's quite important as well. If you change the parameters of your project too frequently, then basically it makes, uh, you know, looking at declines, increases, changes in distribution, very difficult. So thinking ahead, keeping it simple, standardizing it, being scientifically rigorous in terms of the, the project's design is something that all of these people are, are very, very good at, in fact, increasingly good at. So rest assured that's okay. Uh, we're gonna move on to our next uh, speaker now, uh, Dr. Michael Pocock from the Center for Ecology and Hydrology. Now, you may not have heard of the CEH as frequently as the BTO, but I've had the privilege of working with many of their staff over over the years. Um, fantastic organisation. In fact, Autumn Watch is just about to start next Tuesday and my colleague Michaela Strachan is going to, I'm not allowed to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, she's going to be up in um, Scotland and one of the things she's going to be looking at is the birthing of grey seals on the Isle of May, where she, ha she has been and will be working with uh, staff from the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. Great breadth of work. Uh, frankly, we should quadruple, triple or add to their funding by 10 times because unfortunately the agency has... Um, had cuts to its funding, like many of our statutory bodies in recent times, which has made life difficult for all of us. However, Michael, it says here, is an ecologist uh, at the CEH, works on the impact of environmental change on the benefits that we can gain from nature, focuses on citizen science and innovative ways to explore how it can be used to benefit both people and nature. Been a wildlife lover as long as he can remember, which presumably is all of his life, um, having spent his childhood on a local chalk downland where he was interested in birds and then expanded to plants and insects. Um, many of these interactions uh, it, it lead to benefits that people can get from nature, he says here, things like pollen and pest control and in his research he looks at where these interactions connect together into whole networks the joined upness is something which is you know fundamentally important when we think about uh, ecology uh, of course which is part and parcel of CEH he, he works at the biological rest world center now at CEH um, which has a history of more than 50 years supporting people who record wildlife and using those records for scientific research. And again, this is to highlight, of course, that if you do get out and get active and you do participate, um, your data is not only useful to you at that point in time or that study at that particular point in time, it can also have a, a lasting legacy uh, because at some stage in the future, someone may repeat what you've been doing or close to it and that ability to strike a comparison will, will be there. Um, so anyway, that, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to um, Michael Pocock from the CEH. Uh, Michael, uh, good morning and, and, and give us your presentation. Thank you. Thanks ever so much. And it's brilliant to be part of this conference. I grew up, um, as Chris said, basically on the Chalk Downlands um, uh, at the end of the Chilterns, um, up near Dunstable. And I now live in near Wallingford, so just across the Thames from the Chilterns. Um, so that's been a big part of my life. So I will now um, share my screen. There we go. So as Chris said, I've been part of, or I've been a naturalist um, for as, as long as I can remember, enjoying a wide range of different aspects of natural history. And so what I've been asked to talk about is why citizen science and being involved in recording matters to you. Um, <clears throat> and 
At the Biological Records Centre, there, um, which is where I work, which is part of the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, there has been this incredibly long history of citizen science. We've got over 50 years of supporting volunteer naturalists across 85 different schemes and societies doing recording of wildlife. Um, and you can see here some of the ways in which that has changed with plant monitoring and some of the outputs that have come um, over, well, over the course of more than a century, 150 years or so. People have been doing this. And actually what we've been particularly keen on doing is trying to um, make best use of those data, the data which people like you have been sending us um, and sending different schemes and societies. So that's for plants, but that's also for a range of different, much more obscure groups, uh, things, um, different fly groups or fleas or um, all sorts of all sorts of fascinating things, which exactly as Chris said, means that we know more about our wildlife in Britain um, than just about anywhere else in the world. But I wanted to begin just by talking about a project which I did a few years ago, which was looking at wildlife on farmland. And a team of us, a dozen of us, spent a couple of years of hard work. It was hard work, but it was happy work, I think, because it was we were out. We were out in nature in all sorts of weather conditions. And we were interested in looking at um, all the different or many of the different species on the farm. And we were particularly interested in looking at their interactions. So we were looking at all these different um, things of um, pollinators feeding on flowers, we were looking at um, uh, pest controllers, a ra wide range of different things. So huge amount of hard work. And what we did was we ended up producing this network of over 600 species and each one of those lines represents an interaction that we um, observed in the field. And, and it shows the importance and the interconnectedness of nature. And it was really wonderful to be part of it. It felt like a real privilege. Not only were we able to understand the breadth of ecology and the interconnectedness of all these different species, um, of which, of course, there were many more species on the farm. Um, but we were also, as we looked closer and closer, we had that sense of, um, or and discovery, we found a species that was new to Britain, this tiny little parasitic wasp that's so small that it lays its eggs inside the eggs of a weevil, the type of beetle that lays its eggs inside thistle flower heads. So an incredible sense of wonder by looking really, really closely, in this case, from rearing insects from thistle flower heads. Um, so that was really important and we were able to talk to scientists and um, various other people about the importance of the interconnectedness of nature on this particular farm. But me and my friend who were working on this project thought, well, that's all very well to talk to scientists, but we wanted to go beyond that. Clearly, it was important to try and engage with people. So we ran these projects talking about the interconnectedness of nature and toured around um, uh, shopping centres and various other things and as part of that what we did was we gave people these little tubes with a leaf in it and that leaf had a leaf miner and we asked people to rear the leaves and to, or to look after them until what emerged was either the leaf or the parasitic wasp which was predating um, the leaf the leaf mining moth um, and that evolved into a project a national project which we call conquer tree science and as part of that, we got people to um, look at the damage caused to the conquer trees, the horse chestnut trees, by this leaf mining moth. And we also asked people to have a go at rearing um, these, the, the insects in this leaf. And so people could put the leaf in a plastic bag. And what would emerge was either a tiny little moth, um, just shown next to that penny coin at the bottom, or it would be one of the tiny little parasitic insects which was preying upon that moth. And so people were getting involved in this and we got several thousand school children involved in this particular project. So citizen science, where people could get involved, they didn't need to have massive skills of being able to identify species, unlike many of those who contribute to the Biological Record Centre um, and, and the schemes that we support and work with. 
But instead here, here was a type of citizen science where people could get involved in real science. We published this in a scientific journal, the results of it. But we also asked people what they found when they were doing it or what they felt. And um, you can see there a word cloud of the comments that school children left on our website. And brilliantly, um, you can see words like interesting, enjoyed, fun um, came out of there. Um, there is a boring somewhere, but that's very, very small, indicating that not many people wrote that down, which was good. Um, and so it began to help us realise that the, the motivations of people getting involved in citizen science, clearly there's something where people got a lot of enjoyment out of it. And the motivations for being involved in citizen science are really, really diverse. And this is where it gets to some of the, the things that that matter to people like you. Um, and so there's been a range of different research over the past few years, which has been looking at these um, motivations of people being involved in citizen science, nature based citizen science, contributing to science, that sense of responsibility or duty is something which people often say is important. But increasingly, it's, it's things like connecting with nature, that sense of discovery, a sense of um, being prompted to go out and look and have a sense of awe and beauty. Actually, for many projects, it can be being part of a virtual community and providing you with information to inform action, empowering maybe the make way that you manage your garden or things like this. Um, it gives a sense of connection to place. And actually, it might be that people um, or what it's been shown is that people get involved in citizen science for one particular reason, but then that sense of place and that connection with seasonality and things like that are the things that keep people involved. It might even be that people are concerned about threat. And actually quite a lot of work on invasive species, for example, um, has been, citizen science has been prompted through that fear of threat. Um, and that has clearly been really important, as Chris touched on at the beginning, during the time of lockdown, um, the sense of connecting with nature has been a real solace. Natural England did a large scale study and they found that um, the vast majority of people were saying that being in nature makes them happy during this period of lockdown and that they've engaged much more with everyday nature. So maybe that's birds in the garden, um, noticing, actually noticing the tiny little weeds in the cracks in the pavement or the birds flying overhead, a whole range of different things. Um, that people have engaged with. And actually, a, a large number of people were saying that nature is more important than ever to their well being during this period, the, the, the anxious, crazy, uncertain times um, that we've had this year. One of the ways in which people engaged was that people were recording more as well. And so um, this infographic shows some of the uh, the increase in records that we've received through the iRecord platform, which is where people, one of the places where people can submit records um, of things that they've seen. And you've seen an almost doubling in the numbers of bats, of butterflies, moths and of bees that have been recorded um, during this period of lockdown compared to previous years. And one of the things that we, we do within the Biological Records Centre at UKCEH is, is we've been looking to try and increase the accessibility to citizen science. So it not just being for those, those nature nerds, like many of us may be at this conference, um, those people who are really willing to invest hours and hours, but can we, can we make um, our citizen science more accessible? And, and the benefits that that brings in terms of nature connectedness. And so we've nowadays, we've got apps obviously, which make recordings so much easier. There are online identification guides on websites and built into apps as well. We're exploring ways of automated identification so that you can take a photograph of something and it tells you what it is. You don't need to be an expert in the minutiae of being able to identify this or that, but you can get tools to help do that new approaches with these much more um, sort of instruction based um, citizen science, the things where you go out and you can follow the protocols, you can get involved without having particular skill already. 
and being able to give enhanced feedback as to where and how um, it would be helpful for people to go and record. And so we've been exploring all of these sorts of things increasingly as time's gone forward um, at the Biological Record Centre. And um, but one of the things that we've begun to think is, well, actually, some of these things, maybe putting some technology, giving somebody a phone and telling them to go out, maybe that actually puts a barrier between them and nature. Maybe giving them an instruction sheet and telling them to follow it closely. Again, maybe that puts a barrier between them and nature. Maybe it does help them engage a bit more. So in order to discover that, um, we ran a project over the course of this summer called Nature Up Close and Personal. And we were particularly interested in exploring this idea of um, how can citizen science or does citizen science boost our nature connectedness? Um, and that's important because it's been shown in the past, particularly through collaborators at the University of Derby, that nature connectedness relates to our actually our physical health, but certainly as well our, our well-being and our mental health. And so what we asked people to do during this project, it was a randomised controlled trial, we did it all scientifically and properly, was that we asked them to get involved in one of a few different activities. It could have been recording butterflies through the I Record Butterflies app, something simple they can do for 10 minutes, something a bit more complicated, putting out um, a quadrat and counting insects as part of the UK pollinator monitoring scheme, or something which our colleague Miles Richardson at Derby University has done in the past um, through the Wildlife Trusts as part of their 30 Days Wild, has been, was asking people to go out, look at nature for 10 minutes, and then write down three good things that they noticed. And and what we found over the course of doing this project was that actually whichever activity you did, whether it was citizen science or whether it was something that was more um, a more explicitly emotional engagement with nature, all of these benefited people's well-being. Um, and actually, it didn't matter how often you did it. Um, it didn't matter how much time you spent. What mattered was the fact that it was the quality of your engagement with nature. And clearly then, as we showed during this project, citizen science has a role, um, is one of the ways in which we can have that more um, purposeful, mindful engagement with nature, which then benefits us. Um, and I'm sure many of you found over the, course of, over the course of this strange spring and summer, that was something that I experienced. And so, with all of that, what we're really keen on doing um, increasingly is to try and create these win-wins. So you've got citizen science, as Gavin said, the data has been so, so valuable and continues to be valuable. We're working on um, pollinators quite a lot and been looking at the impacts of pollinators and pesticides on pollinator populations from the um, records that people have sent in. All of this is really, really valuable. Um, it feeds into policy, it also feeds into the way that we um, manage nature, which might be in our gardens if we've got them, or the way that we influence management in local parks, things like this. Um, so all of this is great, but how can we create more and more of those win-wins where we get those real benefits of, of um, data provision, including in the places where we don't have so much data, but also in ways in which we truly benefit each of each of us as individuals taking part. Um, so there's the, clearly there's this incredible diversity of people um, who could be engaged with nature through citizen science, right from the nature nerds through to those who have um, in the past been barely noticing nature. And this is something which we're, we're desperate to try and increase more and more. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, we are running a little bit short on time, but I'd like to come back to you with one thing just to expand on, if you can. Uh, you talked a lot there about our, how we as individuals um, can benefit from citizen science. Um, what about the fact that it's also a great way of community building, particularly these days when we're using social media? So whilst someone in another part of the UK may be doing the same project as you, someone you would never have met under normal circumstances, uh, when you start to participate in many of these projects, it, it is about publicly sharing your, your data. And, and it's great for 
you're expanding our communities, meeting new people. I've just been looking at your Twitter feed, you see, um, and uh, which I'm about to advocate to people. Um, and I've seen things like there's a couple of things I spotted on there I immediately want to read. So in a way, through my interaction with you, through our interest in citizen science, you're going to expand my knowledge indirectly. That's quite important, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, definitely. And that sense of community, I think, can be at the local level. Clearly, there's a limit as to how much we can do in person right now. But there are really great examples where, where being part of citizen science and volunteer recording builds that sense of community through personal social interactions. Um, uh, the National Plant Monitoring Scheme has been running a lot of training online during the period of lockdown. So then there's been that connection, a virtual connection. Um, and then there are other examples where there's been a network of wildlife recorders who've come together entirely through social media. And um, many of them had never, ever met and yet been part of a strong community. So all of that's really important. Excellent. Michael, thank you very much indeed. You've muted yourself, Chris. I, um, so, yes, thank you very much, um, Michael. That's brilliant. Let's, um, let's all become part of the community. Let's become part of Michael's community um, and that of the CEH. You can follow him, MJO Pocock, P O C O C K, MJO Pocock, on Twitter. Look, what he, I just found this, you see. There's a, an, uh, something that uh, Michael has uh, retweeted there, could moths be the secret to understanding climate change, euronews.com. I wouldn't have found that probably if I hadn't have just been on uh, Michael's Twitter feed. So become part of that community and I'm sure it's a rewarding experience. I mean, I have to say, I've always got to have my nose in the news when it comes to natural history. And I find quite a lot of stories which transfer into my work, professional work, um, on social media. Or I meet people that tell me things there, um, all of which are quite inspirational. But when it comes to inspirational, we're definitely going in that direction now because our next speaker is Megan McCleverty. She's a BTO Youth Ambassador, uh, a Cameron Bespolka Trust Ambassador. She's 17 years old, currently doing her A-levels, Biology, Psychology and Geography. Um, her aspiration is to go to university and study zoology and to pursue a career in conservation. She enjoys sharing her experiences through her blog and Twitter platforms. I've just um, followed uh, Megan on uh, Twitter as well. And I can tell you that her tag is at Stone Chat, Stone Chat as in the small passerine, um, underscore 42, at Stone Chat underscore 42. So follow Megan there as well. Let's continue our community building exercise this morning. Um, um, Megan, uh, we are running a little bit short of time, so I'm going to cut my waffle so we can enjoy your good sense. Uh, uh, over to you and your presentation. So yeah, my name's Megan and I'm going to be talking a little bit about why citizen science is especially important for young people and how it can be used to address some of the issues we face when engaging with the natural world. So before I start, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Uh, thumbs up if you can see that. Can we see that? Okay, great. Okay, so just to quickly introduce some of the things I do, which we briefly talked about. Um, I'm a young ambassador for the Canberra Spoker Trust. Um, I'm a uh, on the BTO Youth Advisory Panel and I volunteer at my local Nature Reserve College Lake and all of these things have a real focus on engaging young people in the natural world. So how do we make a difference through citizen science? Oh one second, I'm in front of my screen. Okay, so citizen science is really important for engaging young people in the natural world because we can sometimes feel like our sort of lives are, con um, are just surrounded by schoolwork all the time and external stress and activities. And we sometimes feel like we don't have time to engage with the natural world in that sense. But as a young person, I've always wanted to generate a meaningful impact and create a difference. And citizen science is wonderful in the sense that we can engage in our own terms. Oh, sorry, I just, can you still see the PowerPoint? Oh, I'm having an absolute nightmare with this. Okay, I can't see my PowerPoint. Can you still see your PowerPoint, if that helps? Um, okay, right. Does anyone know how to get rid of the tab with the speakers on? Because I can't read it. Okay, just give me one second. Sorry about this, guys. Okay, right. Now we're back. Okay, so citizen science helps young people engage in the natural world in a meaningful and personal way because we can engage in our own terms. So in that sense, because there's so many different ways we can engage. Um, okay, I'm just going to move on to the next slide. Okay, so what are some of the issues that we face as young people? 
one of the issues we do have is accessing transport. So many young people can't drive or have to travel alone or can't travel alone because it's just not safe um, and it doesn't feel safe. So we'd rather travel with other people we know or be brought to nature reserves with, uh, in groups. So we struggle to access nature reserves and are mainly restricted to our local areas. This means that we have to complete surveys in our own gardens or local areas. While some surveys may require you to travel to a certain patch or certain area, some can be conducted in a local area. So one that I do and I really enjoy is the Garden Birdwatch with the BTO, which can be conducted from your own home if that's what you wanted to do. This makes citizen science particularly accessible to young people because it can be completed in your local area, allowing you to still make that difference you want to. So how do young people start gaining confidence when you're going out? Some young people will lack confidence when they're first starting out in the natural world, especially with things like ID when you're just getting started. But one of the great things about citizen science and a way it can combat this issue are there's so many different opportunities, regardless of your knowledge level or area of interest. So if birds are more your thing, you can do the, uh, the breeding bird survey with the BTO. If butterflies are more your thing, you can look into butterfly conservation, which is an amazing organisation. Or if you want to learn more about mammals, you can submit data to the Mammal Mapper app. What I'm trying to say is that there are areas of uh, citizen science all across the natural world, which means you can engage in something specific to your interests, which provides a great learning environment for gaining confidence in your own knowledge. So how do you meet new people? As a young person, it can be really difficult to find friends with the same interests as you within the natural world. But citizen science, such as volunteering, can be a really good way of bringing people together, especially those with similar interests which means that once you get to, be, to know people who have the same interests as you, you can share your passion and learn from one another. And for me, I think that citizen science is really, really good work experience. So learning more about how data is collected and eventually presented can give a really strong understanding of conservation. It also allows you to meet professionals with the environmental sector who can act as mentors, who can help you find further opportunities, but also increase your knowledge of things you're currently doing and help you complete uh, surveys with more ease. So one other thing that I really enjoy about citizen science is that it can build really positive mental health. So many young people are affected by stress, and I say especially under the current circumstances with both work and the current circumstances, but getting involved in citizen science can be a really nice way of sort of getting over that. So getting you outside and engaging in wildlife can be a really nice stress relief and a break from, get, from doing your work, but also it's a really productive way to spend that, especially if you want to go into conservation in the future, it can give you that understanding as well. So not only is it fun, but it also gives you extra knowledge. Doing something constructive for the natural world can also give a sense of achievement and satisfaction when you complete that data, especially on a regular basis when you get to see the sort of findings and how things are going. And not only the does it help you um, with a great understanding? It also involves you in the wildlife community and could be a really good starting point for conversations, especially online. So why does citizen science matter specifically to young people? Not only does it give you a great sense of achievement and a sense that you are making a difference and contributing to a community, which is of such value, but you also get to learn and know from people in that community and make new friends and connections, which can help you in the future. And among all of that, it helps you increase your positive mental health. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. That was an excellent presentation. I, 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 I always like things in plain, simple terms, particularly when they're pertinent. And, and I think your closing slide there um, epitomizes all of that. Just one thing um, to, I'd like to ask you about, because it was important in, in, in my development as a young scientist, you mentioned mentors there and citizen science being a route to, to meeting people who know more than you do, who are keen um, to educate as well as they are to stick their noses into whatever fascinates them in the natural world. That, I would say that was a very significantly important thing. I met a number of mentors who, who's, without whose help, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you this morning. And, 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 and that is important for many young people, isn't it? Um, yeah, I'd say it's a really good starting point for me. So after I went to bird camp in 2017, I met a lot of mentors from the BTO who've helped me find all of the opportunities that I've been involved in to this day. And so meeting mentors has been a really key thing for me and also other people that I know within the wildlife community. Um, and just a quick note on my Twitter, I had an absolute nightmare with Twitter and I've now got a new account which is called Megan's Wildlife, so go follow that if you'd like to. <laughs> Oh, OK. Yeah. So I did look at your Twitter. and In fact, I was going to very gently chastise you for not posting very much since August. And that's that is that's because you've switched your account, is it? 
Yeah, I had an absolute nightmare. I couldn't access it. So I just decided to get a new account so I could get going. Okay, again. Well, look, okay so I'm going to unsubscribe from Stone Chat underscore 42, which is the one that I should resubscribe to. Tell everyone now. Uh, Megan's Wildlife. Megan's well, at Megan's Wildlife. Yes. At Megan's Wildlife. Okay, everyone, um, you know what to do. Megan had trouble with her account. We need to engage with her and a part of her community. So at Megan's Wildlife is where to go. Megan, thank you very much. That was that was great. I'm going to move straight on now to our last uh, contributor this morning, another young person, 17 years old, also doing A-levels um, and intends to study geography at university. Bird watching has always been a great passion. Um, he's also an environmental campaigner, keen on photography, youth ambassador for the BTO, sits on their youth panel, helping them to become more accessible to young people. And also, especially so that diversity and ethnicity can be, uh, is less of a barrier to people enjoying the natural world. Volunteers for the National Trust and is on the youth panel for the London Wildlife Trust, as well as, um, as, as Megan has, has outlined, being, uh, an ambassador for the Cameron Bespalka Trust. I'm talking about Arjun Dutta. I'm very pleased that he's going to be speaking to us now. He's a clearly very active young man, and I salute that. Now, there's no time for sleeping at the wheel at this time, is there, Arjun? And on that account, I'm going to hand over to you rapidly for your presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll just quickly share my screen. Can everyone see that OK? Hopefully, just let me uh, share it. Yeah. Right, so yeah, good morning everyone. Uh, so I'll just talk quickly a little bit about how I first got involved with nature and bird watching, especially. So age seven, I had a strange obsession for dinosaurs, which my mum quickly got fed up of, and uh, she quickly shifted me into getting into the big garden bird watch when I was, yeah, so when I was around seven or eight. And it really that just continued as a hobby all the way until I was 12 and went to Malaysia. It was meant to be a family holiday, but it quickly became a bird watching holiday and the wildlife and birding there just inspired me to get involved with conservation, especially when I came back home, because being able to see conflict there between human and nature and trying to understand why that's such a problem just was so important to me. Um, and yeah, over the few years following that, I quickly found a patch local to me. I'm based in South London, which means green areas can be quite difficult to find, but I quickly found Morden Hall Park, which is owned by the National Trust, and by the 514, I started to get uh, to volunteer there. I'll just quickly move the slide, it doesn't let me do that. Yeah, so after, after a little while, I, I joined Young Volunteering Programme, which is for 11 to 24 year olds. And what we do there is a big range of things. We help lead projects from, uh, if you look in the bottom right corner, we had a biodiversity project last year. And again, this links back to citizen science, really. It was the idea of engaging young people and giving them almost the responsibility to get involved and lead a project. And I was really lucky to help lead that because what we did, we started with nest boxes, nest, nest recording and getting involved with bio blitzes, which I think is such an important way of engaging young people with nature. The uh, top right picture on the screen is from Spurn when I joined BTO Spurn Young Leaders course last year and myself and a friend helped lead BioBlitz as a way of getting young people involved with nature. So through this, uh, through these kind of projects, I think it was so important because it helped give people responsibility, which Megan mentioned before me, to almost have a role in knowing what they're going to do, how they're going to have a positive impact on nature and community. Uh, but once again, links back all the way to bird watching for me. I've always loved it, and specifically in the last year, especially over lockdown, the idea of sound recording really just it just drew me in because I've always found that with eyesight that's less good than other people. Sound is what I often use to pick up birds and identify them. And just since then, I've become hooked. But it's become uh, nocturnal migration, where earlier on in the year we were able to record common scoters flying over the UK. Uh, inland and that and through citizen science people were able to make maps of their almost the direction they were going which in some ways was just straight over my house in the south of london which was just amazing really just being able to see in virtual maps through technology which is just such an important thing now being able to see how important that is in the bto's work for example just really just i have 10 foot and i still am since then i've managed to record 80 species uh, by sound and i'm basically aiming to get to 100 by the end of the year, which will be a tough ask, but 
just something I love. And I guess that's so important as well. If you have the passion for it, especially as young people, then being able to inspire others is just so important. One more thing I would probably mention that is some, uh, so part of BTO are, as, Meg, uh, as Megan mentioned, were the big uh, wetland bird survey, uh, wetland, wetland uh, web scouts, which I do at local pond, and also you can just get involved through eBird, which just shows that there's all there's so many different ways, almost small ways you can get involved without having to make huge impacts, just doing your little bit for the environment. I think ringing is another important, a great way to get involved. And I think young people always, even if I don't agree with the word cute, I, I think like Chris, I think we're good, we're good with that. Um, it's such an important way of getting young people involved because the idea of being able to see a bird in the hand, of knowing cuckoo is going over to Africa and the record breaking journeys and time and speed and all sorts of things like that is just so important. So quickly, I'll just outline some benefits. So mental health is such an important one for me. Being able to have somewhere I can go and record species is just so important. And I guess that leads back to community as well. The friends I've made as, uh, through this and the community I've got. So in the bottom right corner, we've started London Young Birders Walks. So and there's always someone doing the checklist of the things we've seen and the things we're going to do next time, planning for the next occasion where we're all going to meet up. Just builds that community of young people wanting to contribute to the ways of birding and science, which I just think is so great. And through so many organisations as well, it gives young people working experiences that they probably never would have had before. So for example, as through the National Trust, I've been able to help lead projects, which I don't think many people uh, age 17 would have been able to do. And I'm really, really lucky to be able to be part of that. But the only way to have more young people involved is getting them involved. And I think, uh, yeah, just getting people exploring and just through organisation, giving young people opportunities through mentors and conservation, just outdoor activities all the way from a young age, maybe in education, but that's something that people ad advocate for and I really support. But overall for me, it just links back to a passion for nature and inspiring young people around the age of, let's say 10, all the way up to 20 to 25. That gives that almost the base for a ne the next generation of young naturalists to inspire others. Right. That, that's, that's brilliant. Um, in case there are some people, young people watching, and I sincerely hope there are, um, how do they get involved with the BTO um, schemes that you've mentioned and also those with the Cameron Bespalka Trust? Well, I would say the BTO website is a great place to start because there is almost a young, young birders page with blog and being able to, um, so it's free for under 18s and being able to use that to get towards ringing, for example, is a really good way to start for young people, but also reaching out, I think so, it's so crucial. It can be, that just leads to a, I know, competition and can be quite divisive, but at the same time, through social media, be more opportunity. And I think, I know, reaching out, I think that really gets the PTO organisation going local, just Okay, Arjun, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. I'm afraid the resolution on my screen doesn't allow me to identify which species of bird you've got flying over your left shoulder there. I'm, 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 look, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I'm thinking it's a falcon of some kind, but uh, you'll have to tell me that later. We're having a little bit of a problem with your sound. Um, I, again, in our community building, I'd, I'd ask you to follow uh, Arjun on his Twitter account as well. So he's Arjun Dutta 230, um, A-R-J-U-N D-U-T-T-A, 230, Arjun Dutta 230. I haven't followed him yet, and that's because I've been concentrating on doing what I'm doing here, but I will do in, in a moment. And, and do you know what, um, Arjun, if you can still hear me, um, would you do something for me um, when you finish? And that's tell your mum off for, for, for not allowing you to be obsessive about dinosaurs. <laughs> Nothing beats dinosaurs. T Rex, the best animal that's ever lived. Um, and then also thank you for informing me that common scotters fly over London. And, and again, I didn't know that. And I love learning new things. And I'll be looking into that. Again, that might be something that we might be interested in for Autumn and Winter Watch as well. That sort of mapping, um, listening for birds at night, has become 
uh, really popular recently. Arjun, thank you very much. We're just going to run through a couple more questions that have come in here before we wrap up. Uh, Rebecca has said, what are the keys to designing a good citizen science project? Well, I would say um, keep it simple. Make sure that it's very clear for the participants in, in terms of what they have to do. Make sure that it's standardised so that the data can be compared at the time and perhaps even and later. And make sure that the data management is easy. Uh, that I have done a couple of citizen science projects where actually uploading the data, filling in the forms has been quite onerous. And I imagine that if you were lacking in any amount of you know, dedication and tenacity, you probably wouldn't have done it. So yeah, standardizing, keep it simple, keep it clear, make sure the data management is, is, um, is easy. Lily has asked how much knowledge and how confident you need to be to become a citizen science. Any amount of knowledge that you've got is, is enough to get started. Um, and we have mentioned that, as Gavin said at the outset, there are projects which are designed around people who require training or a, a degree of expertise, uh, such as ringing, um, for very obvious reasons. In that case, the welfare of, of the birds. Um, but there are plenty of other projects which you can are, are very much entry level. And of course, once you're on the ladder, you climb up it. You start at a, a relatively simple project and then you can progress up. And lastly, Richard has asked, um, are citizen scientists usually involved in the planning of projects? Well, Richard, plan your project, mate. Come up with your own project. Uh, you could run it for your family, uh, use them as tests, as guinea pigs, if you like. Um, and then you could maybe try it in your community or uh, community, not necessarily a physical one, i.e. your neighbours, but a community of like-minded people around you. Um, I think that's a, a brilliant idea to, to come up with a, an idea and try and put it together for a citizen science thing. You know, that might catch on and, and, and spread into a much larger project. And I imagine that's how many of these things uh, actually start. Um, so I'm going to wrap up our first session there uh, this morning now and thank Gavin, Michael, Megan and Arjun for their uh, contributions. Uh, there are plenty more um, sessions coming up throughout the course of the day. You can find details of those on the websites. Um, before I hand back to Nick to, to move on, um, I'm just going to run a little quiz for you. Um, so I'm going to ask you what you think I might be doing with the rest of my day. Do you think A... That I'm going to do some filming for Autumn Watch, which starts next Tuesday at eight o'clock on BBC Two. Do you think that I'm going to be walking my poodle, Sid and Nancy, who have been patrolling the kitchen and thankfully being relatively quiet throughout the course of our, our discussion this morning? Uh, do you three think that I'm fixing the slow puncture on the back tyre of my car? Or four, do you think that I'm going out to photograph some wolf poo? Well, there's not going to be any prizes. Um, I'm going out to photograph some wolf poo, and I'm not going to tell you why, but that's my task today. Oh, Arjun got it right. There we are. Perfect, perfect. Nick, um, thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to give a little speech this morning and then chair this. Um, are you popping back to tell us what's coming up next? Chris, thank well, you very much. There he is. There he is. I'm not sure about the wolf poo, but thank you very much, Chris. That. Thank you, Gavin. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Megan and Arjun. Fantastic session. We wanted to, to use the opening session really to show how much sit and science matters. And I think across all of your contributions, you've absolutely nailed that. It, it matters on a national scale. It matters locally. It matters to us. It matters in so many ways. So thank you, Chris and the guys for your session. Much appreciated. Um, we are running slightly behind, which is fine. Uh, we're about 15 minutes behind. So I suggest we move the, the program back 15 minutes. So if you wanted to, to run out and get a quick cup of tea, um, we'll join you again around about um, 20 past 11 for the making, looking out for our wildlife session. Um, and thank you guys. We'll see you in about 15 minutes. So I'll, I'll hand over um, straight away to get us started to, um, to Gavin, Sarah Wardner. Gavin, thanks again for your, your, your time this morning. Um, I'll share the, your presentation with you, but to give us an overview of the, the British Trust for Ornithology's Breeding Birth Survey, which I know a number of us will be involved in. Um, Gavin, I'll, I'll share your screen and, um, and hand over to you. Okay, thank you, Nick, and um, hello, um, everybody. Um, just apologies to those of you sick, sick of the sight of me. I promise this is the last one I do and then you can, um, there'll be other people later in the day. So as Nick said, I just want, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what we get from the breeding bird survey um, in the UK, uh, which is basically 
our from run by the BTO. I work for the British Hospital Ornithology, um, and I'm a I'm a research scientist there, ecologist. Um, I also do the BVS in my own in my spare time as a volunteer. So and I've analysed the data quite a lot. So I know this at sort of both all ends really of the of the um, of the uh, the scheme itself and what it does and how it works. So basically, the BBS is a uh, the national bird monitoring scheme in in the UK. It's large scale. It does randomised. Um, the sites are randomised, and it gives us national scale information. It's not so great at very small local scales, and that's why we need things like tracking the impact. Um, so this is going to work. Yes. So the BBS has been going since 1994. It is the main monitoring schemes, I say, for UK birds. We have thousands of volunteers doing this and across the whole of the UK, there's nearly knocking on 4,000 one kilometre squares covered each year now by people, which is really good. Together with the predecessor scheme, the Common Bird Census, it gives us trends on bird populations going back to 1962, which is un unparalleled in, in the world, basically, in terms of the data set for population monitoring. Um, if you know your common birds, and those of us, those of you who were on the uh, call earlier on today, um, Chris was talking about uh, how you get into this sort of thing. If you're going to do the breeding bird survey, you do need to know your common birds by sight and sound. You don't need to know absolutely every bird because most of the rare stuff you're not going to find in most places. But if you know your birds, it's a really simple thing to do. It takes about an hour and a half um, in the morning. You walk. Uh, two kilometres of transect in a one kilometre square and you have to do it twice in the in the the year and be contact the BTO to get uh, to be allocated a square in your area and they're distributed pretty much where people are this is where people have actually covered them in the country where people are in the country is where the BBS squares are, are have been covered um, it tells us lots of information on both uh, annual fluctuations and long-term trends so this graph shows from the from the long-term CBC and BBS trend on, on for the wren. Wrens are small, they're sensitive to, to cold winters. And so the population may go up and down um, a lot from year to year as the blue dots show. And there's an underlying trend in this case for an increase over time. This is the kind of thing we can get out of the scheme, which we can then use for other purposes. We record birds from the BBS at different discs, how far they are away from the line that you walk, which you just do on a simple form. And this allows us to estimate the, the density. So we can show for things like house martin here, the, the sort of hot spots and cold spots for where the birds are in the, in the country, which is, uh, gives us lots of information on densities. And we can say, hey, there's a lot of house, there's, um, uh, the, there's a lot of house martins in uh, areas like um, the southwest, for example, but in London there aren't so many. But you can see here there's actually a change in density, so lots going up in rel also relatively going down in um, in central London. So real a lower population and a fall in population there. So we can look at that sort of pattern. Um, the biggest result we've done got from this sort of data in in recent in the last sort of few decades has been identifying the plight of farmland birds in the in the environment. So huge declines in farmland bird populations like skylark, particularly through the night from the 1970s, to do with changes in them. Um, our research has shown it's due to changes in things like cropping practices, the amount of winter stubble and um, winter, winter sowing of uh, uh, wheat in particular in the landscape. And this is applied to a lot of a lot of different seed eating species of bird. So this sort of pattern we can show, and this, is, this has been important for policy as well. Um, we can combine all these changes together to produce indicators of for multiple species, there's average trends, and this, so this is an average trend of in farmland bird populations going down much more than all species in general, water and wetland birds. Woodland birds also on average going down, but not as badly as, as farmland birds. So this is the kind of thing we can show. And the data then feed into things like county bird reports, and European trends, uh, whether things are red or amber, amber listed and therefore of conservation concern and requiring um, management. At the species level, we see the rapid loss of species like turtle dove. And one of, when I first started the BTO, I did, I had a turtle dove in the, the square that I covered, um, the first square that I went to cover. And that, 
I saw it that year and never again. And that's, that was, it's really, um, it's really striking. You can pick that, that sort of thing up. And that was, and over that period of time, which is almost exactly the sub period shown in this graph, the population has just dropped like a, like a, uh, a rocket or the opposite of a rocket a stone. And so that has actually been a quite a, um, that sort of thing is really worrying, but it really flags it. And we can use this evidence for policy communication. Conversely, we've got other things going up, black caps um, going up very, very smoothly and strongly over the same, over the same period. And to anybody in the Chilsons will be, of course, familiar with the red kite pattern, London P, people in the London area will be familiar with the parakeets, these things also tracking upwards. And we can follow these trends really well. And really the, the, the green sort of shading on these graphs is, shows us how confident we are in these, these patterns. So the fact that these are very narrow shows that we're really confident these things have gone up by massive amounts. This again helps with communicating the results to people. Um, more recently, we can show some quite interesting patterns with species like willow warblers. So in England, willow warblers have declined quite a lot over time, but in Scotland, they're increasing or stable. So there's something going on and we could, we could some, and this is from our BTO's breeding bird atlas um, from 2013, but it shows that there's a, a relative loss of species in the south of Britain, south and east, and in uh, and Brit and Britain and Ireland, I should say, and in the north and west, um, some some point there are increases as well as as decreases so it's there's some real regional issues there which we don't quite understand yet and we're looking into um so that could be something to do with climate change we've used uh, the data from bbs to look at in, important conservation issues such as this is a ag tests and agri environment and the effects of overwinter stubble most seed eaters have better bbs trends where there are where there is more winter stubble and we actually got positive effects on populations, which we can demonstrate. We clear, we also use the data in, to, we're working on this at the moment to look at using complicated models of our bird, of our BBS data to show how species like Dunnock and other species in urban environments respond to urban development. And the idea is, well, what we can do is inform the, how planners can actually, and landscape architects, developers can make um, the kinds of environments that we can all live in that actually are better for wildlife at the same time. And the one key result from this is that there's no such thing as something being good for birds. It's good for some birds and it's uh, that will be not so good for other birds. And you need a combination of things across multiple different species. We just, this fits in, this is all just sort of policy relevant stuff. And then at the in terms of outputs, there's an annual report from the BBS, which goes into sort of detail of what happens in the, um, the trends that have been seen. And we're now looking at mammals within BBS as well, and gives examples to recorders of, um, of, exact, of how their, their evidence has been used, how the data have been used. And just to finish, really, um, this is actually, uh, so with, as well as the future bringing new challenges that we need to work on um, with BBS and we will be using to, to investigate, such as the effects of Brexit and climate change, or all these things are all going to affect birds through changes in landscape, changes in, in um, the way the land is managed. And we need to, we can track that, test that, and actually identify what's really important and what's happened and where we need more conservation effort. And then this slide is just included just to say that people have actually really actually find it really fun to do and it's really rewarding and if you do your same patch year on year you same that you see the changes going on in that in that area and it's that kind of personal engagement that works really well as well as the the sort of date knowing that you're contributing to the data um, so that is all I was going to say so I'll hand back to Nick now Gavin, that's fantastic. Thank you for that. A number of us, I know, particularly from the Tracking Impact Project, are, are covering breeding bird survey squares. So um, brilliant way of showing that literally every blue tit count really kind of makes its way up and, and feeds its way into the analysis and feeds its way into the trends that you've you've shown us there. So Gavin, thank you very much for that. Um, obviously, it's not all about birds. Um, it's equally important from, from a perspective of, of understanding the broader ecology that we also look at um, the rare. So I'm going to ask Ollie Pescott from... Um, from UKCH, who's, who's overseeing working on the National Plant Monitoring Scheme to give us a similar overview from, uh, from the NPMS. So, Ollie, if you're okay to share your screen and to um, 
and to, to lead us through your session, please. I will have a go. Thank you very much, Gavin. That was a fascinating overview of all the excellent data that's been collected on birds over the last 40, 50 years. And we are trying now to do a similar thing for plants. So looking at small scale habitat patches and trying to get a really good idea for future generations of how the countryside um, will have changed going into the future. So I'm just going to give a, an overview of this very young scheme, the National Plant Monitoring Scheme, uh, and we're only reaching the end of our, our sixth field season this year. So quite a long way behind the BBS, but on the other hand, in a similar way, we are building on a, a long legacy of botanical recording in Britain. There we go. Sorry about that. I just had my mouse on the wrong screen. I've got a laptop plugged into a monitor. So as I said, we've got a long history of recording plants in Britain, uh, but most of that until very recently has been recording the occurrence of particular species at quite large scales in these traditional atlases. Um, the two maps in the top left of the screen there for Parnassia palustris, they're just taken from the two major atlasing efforts that we've had uh, in the 20th century and 21st century for the new atlas. Uh, the old, older looking black and white one is from the, the, one of the first efforts to, to map a country's flora anywhere in the world. The Atlas of the British Flora published in 1962. And the, the blue colored one is from the, the second effort in 2002 to, to remap Britain's flora. And that threw up a lot of fascinating information about change in both of those maps that you see there. The, the lighter coloured dots, whether blue or grey, show species, uh, this Parnassia that was recorded in that 10 kilometre grid square in a historic period, but then which wasn't recorded more recently in each of those uh, time periods. So that's a really, obviously, a really striking impression of change in, in that case in Lowland Fens, in Parnassia palustris, the grass of Parnassus habitat. But obviously, as, as Gavin showed, you know, the power of abundance information at small scales can really give us a much more detailed picture of ecology, of what's happening in habitats, what the impacts of land management are on the ground. And so, although we passed through all this wonderful history of recording plants at large scales, even covering hybrids more recently in 2015, um, moving forward, uh, the BSBI, Plant Life, UKCH and JNCC are very interested in recording plant communities within habitats and that's where the, the idea for the National Plant Monitoring Scheme came in in uh, 2015. So we have had long aspirations towards habitat information. I just included this interesting piece of history here from Edmund Warburg who is a professor in the Department of Botany at the University of Oxford for whom the Warburg Reserve in the Chilterns is named and this was when they were planning the methods for the first atlas of the British floor in 1962 and they were aiming to record habitat information about uh, species records so it wasn't just it's been seen in this 10 kilometer square they did have aspirations to record habitat information and that was record included on the recording cards but in the end that information wasn't really used for anything it just sat in a database or on actually in filing cabinets more accurately. Um, so although there has always been interest um, and feel very recently there's not really been uh, the information at least not collected by on a volunteer basis and not annually to produce the type of indicators and trends that we saw in the last talk. So as I say these were the motivations for the National Plant Monitoring Scheme. It was going to be habitat based at a small scale focusing on plant communities um, so in other words, the coexistence of plants at five or 10 meter scales to give us an indication going forwards of changes in plant abundance and diversity, and not just presence absence of these very large 10 kilometer grid square scales that we've seen in these historic atlas maps. So in a similar way to, to Gavin's uh, illustration, we have a, um, a methodology which we asked volunteers to carry out at the one kilometer level. So rather than having two transects as we saw in the last talk, in this case, because we're asking people to focus on focus in on small uh, samples of habitats, we have um, this kind of gridded approach where we ask people to walk around their one kilometer square and try and target these numbered square plots to particular habitat occurrences. So for instance here, if you had access to this um, uh, this grassland here at number two, square number two, um, you would go there, see if it was the habitat that was expected, which might be, for instance, some semi-improved grassland uh, of, a, of a neutral character, perhaps, and you would lay out a, a small, relatively small five by five meter plot and then record a set of indicator species. We also um, try and record linear habitats like hedgerows and streams and arable field margins. And for those, the volunteers try and pick out plots where they intersect these gray grid lines. And that's to try and reduce bias in the data that we collect. So there's a, a rigorous methodology that's not just 
people going and recording their favorite bit of the landscape in that square. So it's a way of trying to make these samples representative. Um, and of course, these plots are just set up in the first year and then are handed on to, to new volunteers in the future, perhaps, or continually sampled by the same person going forward. So we have that, hopefully accumulating that long time series of very detailed, small scale information of plant abundance and diversity in those habitats. So we are uh, just now in the, the sixth end of the sixth year of the scheme, getting uh, into the to the point where we can actually combine some of these indicator species information. So those estimates of percentage cover in those small plots. So for the sets of indicator species that the scheme looks at in these different habitats, we are now at the point where we're just starting to be able to produce some experimental trends. And we're very proud that last week when the UK biodiversity indicators were published, um, for the first time they did include a set of experimental statistics based on this small plot information collected by the MPMS. Uh, we covered these four habitats that you can see on the screen here, and these maps are just maps of the, the samples which were included in those four new indicators. So you can see even though we're, we're a relatively young scheme, we've still got, we're still gaining excellent coverage, again with similar biases to those which Gavin uh, outlined, which you know obviously we do better where people live and uh, have easy access to the countryside and less well in remote areas. Um, but still, we're, we're starting to accumulate a really fascinating data set of plant communities at small scales. And just finally, this is uh, what we published um, last week in the UK Biodiversity Indicators. As I, as I said, this is a, these are experimental statistics, so we're still working on ways of accounting for those different biases in the data that we're collecting. Uh, but we're very confident that we'll be able to better do that going forward. And we look forward next year uh, to producing a new set and also um, up to about 400 individual species trends, because these statistics that you see here, these indicator trends are obviously based on averaging across uh, between 25 and 30 indicator species with any one particular habitat. And so, as I said, this is the first time an annual habitat indicator has been contributed through volunteer effort. When I say habitat indicator, I'm obviously talking here about indicators of the plants themselves. Obviously, we saw like the farmland bird indicator and woodland bird indicators telling us other things about particular habitats but this is the first time where we've had that detailed information of the plants that, that make up those habitats um, so it's a wonderful complement to the historic effort recording plant distributions and looking at how those have changed at broad scales um, and so going forward we're very excited about how all these different types of information could potentially uh, be combined as well so I think that's yeah thank you very much for listening Ollie, thank you very much. Um, it's impossible in eight minutes or whatever the kind of brief was to really encapsulate the scale of, of what you've achieved in, in, in a relatively short space of time, really, when the six years of MPMS has been up and running, it's it's fantastic. And, and the way that different survey methodologies adapt from a from different spatial scales, um, fantastic session. It's been the work we've been doing with the brilliant to get involved in, in the scheme. So Ollie, thank you for your for your session. Um, and moving back on to things that fly. Um, Megan Lowe from Butterfly Conservation um, going to walk us through now the wider countryside butterfly survey. Um, see very susceptible to weather and we've had a very species group uh, very pertinent to us in the Chilterns with the, the wide variety of butterflies we have having that patch. So Megan, thank you for taking the time to, to come and join us today. Um, if I can hand over to you for your, your presentation on the wider countryside butterfly survey, please. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. I'll just share this. Are you able to see that? Yes, yeah, looks good. Brilliant, thank you. Hi everyone. Thank you very much, Nick, for inviting me along today. Um, I'm gonna give you a really quick introduction to the Wider Countryside Butterfly Survey, um, what it is, why we do it, and how we use the records collected by it. So the Wider Countryside Butterfly Survey, um, I might refer to it as WCBS, um, just to shorten it a little bit through this um, presentation, but it's a national survey that feeds into the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, alongside data from other standardised surveys such as butterfly transects and single species counts. It was established in 2009 to help us get a better idea of how butterflies are faring in the countryside. Um, there was some concern that our standard butterfly transects tended to be slightly biased towards butterfly rich sites or habitats, so we wanted to um, set up this more randomised sampling method. Um, so unlike standard butterfly transects, the wider countryside butterfly surveys take place in randomly selected one kilometre squares across the UK, 
and they're allocated to volunteers through a network of voluntary local champions. The survey methodology follows that of the BTO's Breeding Bird Survey, who we've already, obviously already heard from, so there's quite a lot of similarities here. Um, and BTO volunteers can actually also get involved with the butterfly survey through their breeding bird uh, survey squares. So in short, the method involves counting butterflies along two one kilometre routes through the square that are roughly parallel to one another. So as you can see on, on the map here, they're, ten to, um, they're always made up of 10 sections um, and no less than 200 metres apart um, to avoid double counting of butterflies. So we ask that volunteers visit and record butterflies in their square at least twice a year once in July and once in August, but obviously more counts are very welcome, particularly during the earlier spring and summer months. So just to give you an idea of the coverage of the survey, in 2019 we had around 650 recorders visit a total of 846 squares. This map on the right here um, shows you where the counts were carried out, the blue circles being the BTO squares and the pink being the butterfly conservation squares. As you can see, we have quite a widespread coverage, um, but we've still got plenty of work to do, particularly in the more remote areas. But when we combine these with the rest of the data in the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, we're actually receiving results from over 2000 sites a year, which gives us an incredibly valuable set of data. And I'll talk about that um, a little bit more in a minute. Each and every record collected through the Wider Countryside Butterfly Survey helps us better understand what's happening to our Wider Countryside species. It helps us look at population trends and can help us better understand species distribution or how widespread particular species are. We can look at this on a national scale. So for example, this map, um, this graph shows us trends for the top 10 most widespread species recorded in 2019. So this is based on how many wider countryside squares each species was recorded in across the UK. From this graph, we can see that the meadow brown shown as this blue line, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the blue line across the top there is the meadow brown. Um, and this is arguably our most widespread butterfly in the UK as it's consistently recorded in almost 90% of all wider countryside squares. The trends can also show us patterns in migration. So you can see from the orange line towards the bottom of the graph, and this is a painted lady, which as you may know, arrived in great numbers last year. We can use the wider countryside butterfly survey data to look at lots of different things. So we can compare butterfly abundance year on year to look at short-term trends and identify our winners and losers, if you like, from one year to the next or we can break down the data further and look at trends at the country level or even regional level, um, should we wish to look at more detail. We can also look at differences in habitat, for instance, whether a particular species is declining more in one habitat type than another. We also share this data in various different ways. So similar to the, um, the breeding bird survey, we also produce a UK BMS um, annual newsletter and also a wider countryside butterfly survey annual newsletter. Um, and as I mentioned before, all of the data generated by the wider countryside also feeds into the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, which I think I'll refer to that now as the UK BMS. Um, this is our most valuable data set as the UK BMS data is used to produce official statistics, internal and external reports, and helps inform conservation and policy. The data is shared through reports such as the state of butterflies in Britain and Ireland, um, the state of nature report, and various butterfly atlases. We also collaborate with many different universities who use the data to inform science. Butterflies are increasingly recognised as environmental indicators, partly due to their rapid and sensitive response to subtle habitat or climatic changes. The government produced biodiversity indicators using the records collected through the UK BMS, looking at both wider countryside species and species that have very specific habitat requirements. And last, but by no means least, uh, the data helps inform conservation effort. So as an evidence-based organisation, all of our conservation work is underpinned by our distribution mapping. Your records help us identify those species and landscapes in most of need of help. By monitoring butterfly abundance, we are able to see whether our conservation efforts are working or even if other environmental schemes such as agri-environment schemes are working. 
Um, I was just going to finish by giving you a, a bit more of a visual example of how your records make a difference to our knowledge and understanding of species. So this um, map here is actually slightly out of date now, um, but it shows you uh, the distribution of speckled wood in the UK and how over the years the speckled wood has expanded its range. So the dark dots are where it was found up until the 80s um, and the lighter orange dots are slightly more recent. So it's the individual records of many hundreds of volunteers that have helped us map species distribution and increase our understanding of the problems that they may face. So just to summarise, um, by taking part in the Wider Countryside Butterfly Survey, your records um, help on a local, regional, national and international level. Every record really does help us better understand and conserve butterflies. To find out more or if you um, fancy getting involved after today, then you can visit our website or just contact me for, for more information on the email address here. Um, I just want to finish really by saying a huge thank you to everyone who's already involved. Um, the results will from this year will hopefully um, be made available early next year. Um, and thank you all for listening today. Megan, thank you. Um... Thank you, and to echo your thanks and, and Gavin's and, and Ollie's really, that, that every record, every hour you spend trudging up hills or on your knees counting plants or you're, you're working your transects on your on your surveys, it, it really does make a massive, massive difference. And and seeing the results presented as we, we've just worked there, I'm, I do a lot of bird surveying myself and we're constantly having conversations or how are things going in your patch and your patch and is it a good year for, for such and such? Actually, when it all comes together, you really get that national picture of of what's happening and even better when it's over a longer period of time you can see the the trend graphs unfortunately some of them aren't quite going the way we want but, but we know about it which is so important so so the national schemes are incredible amount of input and thank you guys for for your your time and sharing those with us with us now um so just a quick um introduction really by way of um, of introducing mick uh, mick jones who um we apologize for the, the techie um, issues there mick would be uh, chairing your session far better equipped to chair the session than than me but um mick is uh well i've known mick for a while now but mick is um just a top guy in terms of recording around it on a site level um involved in in all kinds of projects with the local wildlife trust mick also chairs the advisory group for uh, the bucks and milton Keynes environmental record center so so apologies, you haven't got Mick chairing your session. Um, Mick, if you if you're speaking now, you'd be able to talk more professionally and in depth around your your involvement with slime moles and plant galls and moths and beetles and fungi and and a whole range of other species groups that you you I think you'll probably know every individual on Dancers and Nature Reserve almost personally. So so um, apologies, you haven't got Mick to chair your session here, but um, a real kind of store and in depth knowledge of, of recording in our patch. So. Hopefully, one stage we'll get to get to, to hear and, and speak with Nick at a, at a later stage. So, so the first side of the session was looking at national schemes, and hopefully that's kind of giving you an overview of, of where your data goes and how it's used. Um, from a from a Chilterns Constable Board perspective, I'm involved in a project um, funded by the National Lottery Heritage Scheme, and, and one of the areas they're working on and delivering this year for the first year a project called Tracking the Impact. I just wanted to share a little bit now of, of what a group of um, 80, 90 so volunteers, and hopefully many of you are on the call, and if you are, hello, and, and thank you for your efforts in this very, very tricky spring um, in getting the Tracking the Impact project off the ground. And I'm going to tempt fate now by trying to share my screen. Um, yes, like it's working okay. So, so Tracking the Impact, and, and Gavin, Megan, um, and Ollie have been involved in, in shaping the project um, from, from where it's at really. So we're, we're looking at things on a slightly more or more of a regional level. So on a national level, um, all the, the, the randomised and the stratified surveys that the guys have spoken about there, they are brilliant on a national level, but what they don't give us locally is a sufficient coverage to tell us what's happening in an area locally of ourselves, such as the, as the Chilterns. So we set about um, a couple of years ago, with, we're working with most of the guys on, on the screen there with, um, with the record center, with our local wildlife trust and, and our national agency say, well, how can we take the best of the national schemes and adapt them and put them into a more local context so we get a better picture of what's happening, in our case, the, the, the Chilterns area itself. Brilliantly exciting piece of work and, and um, quite a challenge in a way, not so conceptually to, to take the national schemes down, but operationally and how best to, to kind of set them up so we get a the representative sample and we get the data we need from a children's perspective that complements um, the national schemes. So 
a lot of conversations out there. We decided actually we would look at um, launching a scheme that, that mirrored exactly the methodology of the, the breeding bird survey, of the wider countryside butterfly survey, and of the national plant monitoring scheme um, to exactly mirror the, the methodologies, the timings, to all intents and purposes carrying out um, the national recording schemes, but in a local context in, in the Chiltern, so we can begin to build. And Ollie, you spoke about the NPMS being involved for six years. This is literally our first spring. So the aim is a very lofty one to, to begin to, to start a tracking scheme that in 10, 15 years time, we'll start to have the trend analysis that we've, we've seen on some of the schemes. So, so the aim was to mirror those three schemes um, and, and help recruit and, and excite volunteers to come in to take on those squares in our path. Um, we looked at here, so this is a map here, you probably won't be able to see, but you can see um, so the town's mark, so Wickham and Chinner and Wendover, you hope you get a bearing as to go the project here, we're rolling this out. And all the, the purple squares you can see are 51 kilometre squares that we've identified we would like to get coverage of breeding bird survey, plant monitoring scheme and a wider countryside butterfly survey in these 50 squares to build that data set, to build that trend analysis as we go through. So very ambitious scheme. Um, but brilliant the way that um, many of you on the, on, the, on the conference today and others have responded in getting involved in monitoring locally, making that difference as, as Chris was kind of saying, in your local patch, you're caring about the Chilterns and, and your local area. So, so this spring was our, our, first, um, our first go at actually getting off and delivering. Um, if I was giving this presentation at the end of March, um, these would be the kind of the headlines that I would be really excited to share with you all around, I guess, the response from the, the the guys out in the, in the children's it's been absolutely fantastic so so we had at the end of march allocated 89 of the 150 squares to to, to volunteers wanting to pick up those, those individual surveys and obviously helping through and part of what we're also trying to do is bringing this kind of next generation of of citizen scientists or volunteers through as well so we had a whole program of of training set up for people who were really keen on their species and understood their species id but wanted to get to take the first step into formal structured surveying um, quite a leap, as um, we've covered in some of the sessions earlier today. So, had training sessions lined up for the, the three survey schemes, and and equally as exciting, I suppose, looking even further down the road is is a series of training for people who are maybe taking their first step into wanting to survey, but would wanting some help in terms of their species ID. So we had a whole range of of ID training courses put in place out in the field with really experienced mentors and botanists and birders and others to help people get that, that basic kind of species ID training. Um, what then happened when we went into lockdown a whole, <laughs> as I guess Ollie and Gavin and, and Megan, you've experienced as well this summer, um, the whole situation with COVID and lockdown has really severely restricted what we've been able to actually deliver. Um, frustratingly, so we couldn't really run any field-based training and some of the early surveys had to be postponed. But but not to be um, not to be held back. Um, a lot of the guys, the volunteers, were saying, "Well, actually, surely we can still get out. Surely we can still carry on some run of the program." So we've we've delivered a whole series of um, online training sessions. Um, we've got a very active WhatsApp group now, where people are sharing photos and ID and pictures of birds, of butterflies, of plants, of fungi of all sorts out there. So so trying to keep that going. So so in essence, this summer would have been the first year of, of full blown surveys. Slightly curtailed. What I'm pleased to be able to report is that actually the the resilience, if that's the right phrase, I guess, and the keenness and passion of all of our volunteers involved in the programme just wanted really to get out and get started. So we've managed this spring to, with late visits, um, once lockdown was was restricted, uh, was lifted, sorry, um, to get just over 50 squares with the first visit in, which has been a brilliant response. And I thank everybody involved for your patience with the whole situation, your willingness to want to get out there and get started. It, it's been fantastic. And we're, and we're starting to build a data set now that we can learn um, we can take into what will essentially become our baseline year next year now. So, so a big thank you for my part for everybody's um, passion, enthusiasm, and getting going. And hopefully, this time next year, we'll be able to start to put up some some more um, kind of species graphs and those kind of things to show what actually we're getting from the baseline from our first year of these surveys. So, so a brilliant response again, and, th and thank you everybody for your involvement in the project. We hope to expand that through. So, tracking the impact has, has covered um, obviously the structured. Um, surveys as we've spoken about. We have a number of other projects as well that are very much in the spirit of citizen science and getting out there and, and helping to record in a number of different ways. And I want to, to thank in particularly Pete Edwards and his team at the um, at the Hewenden Ringing Group who've been working on a farm and bird ringing project um, with us. So working on five farms now, um, we're working into this winter looking at regular um, ringing sessions to start to look at the health and 
and some of the kind of the, the breeding success and otherwise of our farm and birds in particularly focusing on our linnet and our yellowhammer and where we still have our strongholds of, of our corn bunting. So, so another kind of arm to the to the project, if you like, looking at um, a ringing side of things. And now this year, looking at a colour ringing project with our corn buntings. Um, we have also a number of groups and picture you can see on the screen here was uh, Debbie from, from the Wildlife Trust working with us on a rapid habitat assessment. So ways of looking at assessing um, habitat quality and looking at sites as well. So quite a bit more time and hopefully next year we'll be able to roll this more out. So looking at more informal um, or more kind of ad hoc sessions, looking at um, surveys of habitat, looking at habitat condition and indicator species on, on our sites that we're working on. And equally a great partnership we have with our local owl and raptor group, the Bucks Owl and Raptor Group, who are not only installing owl boxes for us across the farms that we're working with in, in some of the other projects, but monitoring the breeding success of those boxes. So going up every year and looking at the tawny owls and, and ringing tawny owls or barn owls or kestrels or, or little owls out there. So a whole raft of other projects that are coming out of, the, of tracking the impact all aimed at getting more people out there and more citizen science and more data to help us not only inform what's happening, but also to engage our learners, to engage our site work and to give us an understanding of what's happening on our sites themselves. So, so a very exciting first year, albeit frustrating at times early in the spring with, with COVID restrictions. Um, but a huge thank you to all of our volunteers who've been involved in, in whichever way, shape or form of those projects. It really is, is helping us in the Chilterns Conservation Board really get these kind of pieces of work off the ground and, and up and running, it makes a massive, massive difference. So thank you to everybody. Um, a very quick whistle stop tour of, of what we're doing here. But I would say next year we'll have more data, we'll have more to share about the, the great work you've been doing in our local patch in the Chilterns itself. So, so thank you for that. Um, I'll stop sharing now and put my mic hat back on and, and share. So we've covered national schemes, got a bit about what we're doing on a regional level, but equally importantly, and I want to hand over now to Andy Corson Phillips. Andy, thank you for joining us. Um, this morning to look at the work that you're doing in, in Barks, Bucks and Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust with your site-based monitoring. So yeah, my name's Andy, I work for the local wildlife trust. Um, I will spare you the full corporate introduction to be about because that will take up all of my allotted time, I think. But I'm assuming or I'm hoping that everybody knows at least who we are. And if you don't, uh, there is a website address at the bottom of the screen so you can go and check us out. So I'm going to talk to you briefly this morning about our reserves monitoring program. Um, about how it got going and what it hopes to achieve. So it is slightly different from the national schemes because we at the Wildlife Trust, we need to know what's going on and are on our site so that we can best direct our limited resources and time. So the reserve monitoring program is what we call all of the evidence that we gather across our suite of nature reserves across our estate. Um, and it's just one of the very many ways in which volunteers can contribute to the smooth running of the trust. So, I mean, we have obviously things like volunteer work parties where you can go and get out and do coppicing and scrub bashing and all the rest of it. Uh, we also have very valuable input from our volunteers at things like events or fundraising activities. But the one that I'm involved in particularly is the, the monitoring programme. So, I mean, we started this program as a program in 2002 um, and suffice it to say the Wildlife Trust has, has always collected records and information about our sites but we used to tend to do it in a fairly unstructured way so you know where somebody was interested in a particular species group or it was someone's particular patch then we had lots of good information but not really repeatable across the trust and certainly as we started to grow larger around about 2000 it was it was recognized that the information that we were collecting wasn't doing what we needed it to do in order to, to as i say make best use of our, our resources so we started using more repeatable methodologies more standardized methodologies in order to collect data so that we could certainly compare information across the years but also compare information across the reserves and across the counties so that we made sure we were doing the best that we could um, some of these methodologies are perfectly standard and they very closely mirror some of the national ones which we've just heard about but we also have and use some sort of fairly bespoke stuff which is just you know for our needs so that we're getting the, exactly the right information that we need to know so for example things like our, our monitoring protocol for the monkey orchids at Hartslot you won't find that anywhere else quite sort of self-evidently uh, so if we move on which is that one yes 
Okay, so the reserve monitoring program has got four aims, and I wouldn't say any of these are more important than any of the others, because depending on how you look at it, they're all extremely vital, but just to run through them. First of all, we collect data to direct our reserve management work. So when you are in charge of sites and responsible for them, how you look after them and the wildlife on them should be a sort of a feedback loop, of which there are a couple of elements. One is the observation and collecting data, and then you have a review process and then you feed that into management work and then you collect more observations and data. This should be how it's worked. So the reserve monitoring program is the evidence collection part of that. And we look at a whole range of things on our site. So it could be species and we could be looking as coarsely as presence absence, or we could be doing something slightly more detailed, looking at populations. And once you've got time repeated observations, you can start looking at trends over time, um, which, feeds back into the, the efficacy of management. We also collect uh, a lot of condition assessment data, which again, feeds back into, into directing future management work. Um, and we also collect various bits of environmental data. So things like water level readings in dip wells or you know, soil sampling, that kind of thing as well. So a whole range of evidence that's collected. Um, and as I say, this goes and gets fed back in to our reserve staff uh, on an annual basis and also we do uh, a three yearly internal uh, conservation report which is a big assessment of all of the monitoring data that we've collected in that three year spin and we'll, we'll try and bring out sort of case studies and, and things through that to look at particular issues so for example in the last one we did quite a big thing on how deer impacts in our woodlands had changed over time because uh, a few years ago we did almost nothing to mitigate deer impacts and then we have started doing more and now we're, we're starting to be able to tell what those impacts are looking at the monitoring data that we've collected. So that's the first thing that we do. Um, we also use the monitoring data to further direct future surveys so if things are increasing or decreasing or if we're not collecting the right sorts of information or if we're collecting it too quickly or too frequently and we can back off or we need to actually collect things on a more regular basis. We, we also use the monitoring data to inform those decisions. Um, inspire, train and involve volunteers is an, a massive part of this programme. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and at the bottom, we've got contributes to national data, uh, national monitoring projects as well, like we've just heard about the butterflies and we, do, we feed into BTO and we feed into things like the Dormouse monitoring programme. So again, like I said, none of these are in any particular order of importance because depending on how you look at it, they're all vital. Um, I just quickly threw in this slide, I'm not gonna to spend too long on it, but it's just to illustrate that running a, a, a reserves monitoring program such as we do is not just a survey season uh, focused activity. We actually have to, to get involved in this pretty heavily all through the year, whether it's crunching through massive spread, spreadsheets of volunteers and allocating surveys in the winter to to dealing with vast hordes of data coming back in in the autumn after the survey season. So that's that's just an illustrate how much it, it actually takes. So uh, I'll give you some numbers um, in a typical year and you can discuss what typical means given the light of 2020, but we would try and aim to do around 300 surveys which are lifted out of our, um, out of our work programs. Um, of these, we reckon that about 75% of them are either directly delivered by or heavily contributed by volunteers. Um, so you can see what, what a vital part they play. Um, and the rest of those surveys just incidentally are either picked up by us in the office or by paid contracts if it's a particularly specialist thing. So in 2019, obviously we don't have the 2020 numbers yet because survey season's only just finished, but we contributed 41 butterfly transects, which we use for our own purposes, but we also feed into the, the monitoring scheme run by Megan. Um, for an example of those, we had 53 surveyors and it, that's probably our singest, single biggest use of volunteer surveyors because they are obviously weather permitting weekly surveys for six months of the year. So that's a huge, a huge contribution. Uh, we run, well, we ran 29 bird transects, but that's only of the, mon of the our modified breeding bird survey methodology. That's not to include things like the CBCs or the webs counts that we run at reserves, or even some of the bespoke monitoring, which we run things like night jars or nightingales down on our heathlands. They've all got their own sort of particular survey protocols. 
uh, we did 60 condition assessments last year, which, uh, like I said, feeds back into the, the, the how the management is impacting the habitats on the reserves. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more specialist. So although we have volunteers that help us and we're very grateful, we tend to coordinate those surveys directly from the office ourselves. Um, that 100 plus at the bottom, that's probably a bit out of date. This year we reckoned, or sorry, last year, 2019, we reckoned 130 skilled volunteers helped us with our surveys. Um, and just out of that, it's worth uh, highlighting a couple of contributions. So since the programme began in 2002, we've got 11 surveyors who have surveyed with us every year. So 18 years over that, over that period. And a further 64 have managed 10 plus years with the programme which is fantastic. I don't really need to kind of spell out what that continuity of experience and involvement gives for the, for the um, how good quality those surveys are. Um, and I also just have to mention a couple of things. So Margaret Cochran, she works at Foxholes, which is over in the, in the Cotswolds, but she's walked the butterfly transect there every single year since it began in 1976. And we reckoned I think that she was one of four surveyors nationally who have participated every single year to the butterfly transect scheme. Um, and another one who deserves mention is Marjorie Reed, who's been taking our Ditwell readings at our Cot Hill reserves near Abingdon since 1993. And as well as that, she also does condition assessments and she has been doing um, small mammal trapping all over the place around the Oxford area. So huge, huge contributions from those people. Um, and I also just have to mention the fact that all of these surveys that we're doing generates masses amounts of data, which would simply swamp us if it was not for a couple of volunteers who we actually get to come in the office and help us with the data processing. So again, they've been, both of those are the 10 year plus volunteers and, and they've been running some of our databases and spreadsheets. And, and again, without that, we wouldn't be able to cope with all the data that comes in. So a couple of examples of things you might get involved with as volunteers on our surveys. So this is Snakes Head Frick Counts in Ifley Meadows in Oxford City. Beautiful spring day, that one. Uh, the flip side of it a little bit, this is counting brown hair streak eggs, I think at Ashen, although I'm not 100% sure about that, but that's the opposite. That is a frosty cold day in the middle of winter, but it's sort of gives you a, an idea of the sort of spectrum of things that our volunteers get involved with. And then to highlight the fact that this is not just purely a data collection exercise, there's a very human angle to this. This is what the volunteers do. So we ask that people who come and survey for us have at least some uh, uh, skills at ID in at least one group, that they are able very practically to spare the time and even more practically that they are able to get around to our reserves. But that's not necessarily the end of it. Obviously, people leave the scheme and people want to join. So if you start off as an inexperienced volunteer, that's absolutely no barrier, because what we will do is either be able to put you on training courses that we run in house or certainly recommend training courses that you can go to. And probably even better than that, we would invite you to come along and shadow on some of our surveys, maybe buddy up with an experienced surveyor. And then you can get out there and, and start to see what it's all about. Um, and then again, so the benefits, again, pretty self-evident, you get out and about, you can increase your knowledge and more importantly for us, you can contribute to the evidence collection, which means that we are better able to make use of our resources to look after the wildlife on our nature reserves. So a massive thank you for doing all of those things. And, and as I say, if you are at all interested in surveying, and I know many people watching this call probably do already, but there is a web address and I'm sure it will be circulated later on. Um, but if you don't want to do it for us, I could just add in the kind of altruistic bit at the end here that if you want to survey for the BTO or for NICS project or for uh, butterfly conservation or for the National Trust or any of the other bodies that are involved in conservation in our region, we are all on the same team. So please just get out there and get involved. And that is all I would like to say. So I will hand back to Nick. Andy, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, such an important message to finish with there. There are so many ways in which you can uh, get involved in, in citizen science and every every record, whether it's work for the Children's Conservation Board or for, for the national organisations or yourselves at BBAT or others, it does make a difference. So hence so why we're trying to showcase as many opportunities we, as we can today. Um, Andy, just picking up on a couple, just a couple of bits from your presentation now around just the scale. Again, the numbers we're talking about, we're talking hundreds of people, hundreds of visits over a, over a season in different projects. When you add it all up, it makes a massive, massive difference there. 
and, and being involved a little bit with the, the Be About project, just that real connection from a volunteer perspective and had to know that actually my records of breeding rebunting in that corner of the reserve is an indicator that management is either working or otherwise. It is such a kind of close, a real kind of motivating factor. It makes a big difference on a on a site level as well. So, so Andy, thank you for your, your time this morning. Much appreciated. Um, so from the national to the regional to the site, and I, I think Martin, the word unstructured is the way that you kind of like to describe this session here, but there are so many other ways in which you can get involved in, in recording on your walk in the park or as you go out with the, with the kids or take the dog for a walk in other ways that aren't necessarily part of a, a really kind of structured and, and regimented way. So, so I'd like to hand over to, to Martin Harvey from the UKCH to talk some more about the work he's doing on some of the unstructured recording um, schemes and tools and techniques that you can apply if you want a slightly more um, informal way of looking at things. So Martin, thanks for joining us and I'll hand over to you. Okay, hopefully that's uh, visible to everybody. Yep, good. Okay, so th many thanks for inviting me to, to take part today. It's been fantastic to hear the, the series of talks this morning. And um, certainly in this session, we've been hearing a lot about the structured monitoring schemes. And um, Nick has asked me to say a little bit more about what, what unstructured recording is and what difference that makes. Um, so the basics of what is a wildlife record are often referred to as the four W's, what it is you've seen, where you've seen it, when you've seen it, and who you are, who's a, who has seen it. Um, so that, that at its basic is the, is the sort of least bit of information that you need to actually make a record of uh, a wildlife species. And there is some structure there, but it's a fairly simple structure. What we mean by unstructured records are the records that we see sort of at random when we go out and about or we might go and visit a nature reserve and have a walk around and we see some records but we're not actually taking part in an organized survey in the way that some of the surveys we've heard about this morning are set up so um and this is not a sort of either or cho choice you, you can choose to do organized um, structured surveys some of the time uh, but you can't spend all of your time doing structured surveys and we all see wildlife at other times when we're out and about and looking for things and those records can be really really useful in addition to all the great data that we get from the structured schemes and the other really good thing about these records is that really anybody can take part we do need to try and make sure that the records are as accurate as possible, but you don't need to be a top level expert. All you really need to be able to do is to recognize one species. And as soon as you can recognize one species, you are in a position to start adding records and contributing to our knowledge of that species. I work at the Biological Records Centre, which is part of the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and BRC has worked with the wide range of national recording schemes for many years now um, to help them in their work to bring all these records together. One of the things that BRC has done in partnership with all the national recording schemes is to help them produce species atlases. And I think you'll all be familiar with the idea of an atlas that uh, just shows the, the main distribution of the species in question. It so happens that the latest atlas that has come out covers a group of the water beetles and the map we're looking at here is just one example from that. But there have now been over 100 species atlases published over the last 50 years or so. And every single dot on every single one of those maps can only be there because somebody has been out and found the species and taken the trouble to report it. And this is really absolutely fundamental knowledge, just knowing where different species are found and which ones are common and which ones are rare. It's that basic framework that we really need to do everything else that happens in conservation. Taking the dot maps a little bit further, once we start to know where things are and what they're and how often they're seen, we can start to sort of pick out some priorities, which ones seem to be doing particularly badly, which ones seem to be doing well at the moment. And again, this is absolutely fundamental knowledge that we need in order to conserve our wildlife. We need to know what's changing and which um, types of wildlife and which habitats they're associated with are the ones that might need a bit of extra focus to try and do something about them. And once again, it is people going out and taking the trouble to send their records in that really gives us this basic information. 
one of the ways of doing that, and this is a system that the Biological Record Centre supports, is known as iRecord. It's available on a website and there are a number of apps that feed into iRecord as well. And iRecord is one of the ways of bringing together data from lots of different places. Anybody can add their records to the system. And the map on the left here shows all the records that have been added just in the last month. And it always amazes me just how much interest and how much involvement there is from people sending in their records in this way. So just a month's worth of records, but with, there is very wide coverage across the country. <clears throat> And in that, just in the last month, there's been about 58,000 records contributed. So it's a fantastic contribution. iRecord was developed to try and bring together a, a wide range of different records. It's not the only system out there. And it is one of the problems, I think, with biological recording that because it is such a large and complicated area, there are lots of different ways of getting involved. And that can be quite confusing. But we do try with iRecord to make the data as widely available to people as possible. And it all starts, of course, with a person out in the field or in the garden or in the park or wherever and seeing some wildlife and then taking the trouble to add that record into the system in some shape or form. Once it arrives into the iRecord network, it immediately becomes available to the national recording schemes. So schemes that cover the different species groups, um, many of them are involved with iRecord. And it is their experts who play a very important role in checking the records as they come in. And they often provide really useful feedback about um, the identification process and whether the record can, can be sort of flagged as fully accurate or not. The records also become immediately available to the local environmental record center for the area in question. So the data starts to get out there and can be used for all the, the really important work that the local record centers do to feed the records into local decision making and, and checking that way. Um, the vast majority of the records then go on to the National Biodiversity Network, who have this National Atlas website that makes data more widely available again. And from there, they go up to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which makes this data available to researchers and indeed to anybody all around the world. So from that initial step of getting a record into the system, they can go a long way. I mentioned iRecord is not the only way to do this and BirdTrack of course is uh, equally well plugged in and best placed to deal with bird records. Um, for other species groups, all, all species groups can be added to iRecord but um, obviously there are, and for particular purposes, there may be other systems that are better placed to deal with the particular records. Once the records are into the system and passed through to the national recording scheme so that they can check them, um, they are then made available for a huge range of research. These are just four examples from the last couple of years of research that some of my colleagues at UKCH have been involved with, but many other research bodies and indeed BTO, Butterfly Conservation, BSBI, and many of the recording schemes themselves also take part in research or initiate their own research. And having the data available in the first place of course is absolutely key to this and the unstructured records that people have just put in and have been checked are often combined with the structured data to come up with some really important insights to what's happening with our information and with with wildlife we've seen a couple of examples already this morning of the uk biodiversity indicators that were published by government just last week and once again both the structured data and the unstructured data feed into these indicators which are sort of treated very seriously they are regarded as official statistics and they are produced every year and do provide an evidence base um, upon which to uh, uh, base and lobby for policy change if you're involved in doing that. Unfortunately, a lot of the graphs do paint a rather sorry picture, but there is good news in there as well. Some species are increasing. Um, but of course, this emphasizes that recording on itself, whilst very, very important and provides the evidence, is not enough. And we also need all the other types of conservation work that the Children Conservation Board and BeBout and many of the people that are listening to this um, conference today, um, all that practical management and conservation work on the ground is equally important, of course, or even more so in some cases. But we do need to have the data to see what's happening to what, with what we do. So I'm just going to finish by coming back to people in the field. Um, this is a lovely photo from the Chiltern Rangers who do lots of fantastic work encouraging people to get out in the field. And it's 
to me, it's one of the real joys of biological recording. Um, personally, I just love going out there and seeing species and, and I would do it whether they were recording systems or not. I just get so much reward from it myself. It's uh, something I would probably do whatever. But I also, by adding records into the system so that they can start to feed into all these different places, it just seems to me a fantastic example of how we can get collaboration from people on the ground doing what they want to in their own time, having fun doing it, but at the same time feeding into things like local record centres up to national and even international mapping projects, the research, the government biodiversity indicators, all this can come from just getting those records together in the first place. And just to finish by saying thank you to everybody who already does that, and if you'd like to get involved, we'll be circulating links as to where you can go to, to start that progress if you haven't taken the first step already. Thanks very much. Martin, thank you for, for your session. Uh, it really hit me the way you've pulled everything together, that actually a sighting on a walk or a sighting um, out there of a particular species is exciting. If it's logged somewhere, it becomes a record. If once it's a record, it can become data. Um, and that's when it becomes really powerful. And I think your session really, really kind of encapsulated how we can easily, very easily turn a sighting of a particular species out on a walk into something that really does make a difference from a conservation perspective. So, so thank you very much, Martin, for your, your session there, much appreciated. So in, in trying to catch up a little bit of time, I'm just going to, um, to wrap up the session really, and I will share a screen if I can find it. I'll maybe leave that for a sec. But uh, um, to share all these different opportunities where you, so if you've been inspired either by one of the national schemes, by something that Gavin's spoken about from the Breeding Bird Survey, or that Ollie's spoken about from the National Plant Monitoring Scheme, or Megan from the Wider Countryside Butterfly Survey, from myself from tracking the impact, or from Andy from the Bee Bout Reserves, or from Martin's session on, on Unstructured, if you fancy it, getting involved or want to find out more, We'll share all these contact details with you after the event today. Um, you'll have all the websites and all the information you need to, to get involved and, and have a go and, and, and find your own records and start contributing your own data to this, this fancy, fantastic bank of data that we have building. So, so thank you everybody for your time this morning. Um, apologies again for the, the technology. We're, we're just about catching up time. So I'll, I'll close this session off. Thank you again, all of our speakers. I hope you found that in informative and inspiring and, and understanding where your data works to. And I'll also introduce now my colleague Alan Beachy, um, who some of you may well know, who's the project officer to the Chilton Chalk Streams project. So as Chris kind of mentioned in his opening um, session, the Chilterns is, is incredibly um, rare habitat for a number of different things, but most notably for our chalk stream. Um, incredibly valuable habitat that we have running through the Chilterns and Alan in the fortunate position of running the, the project really it's in place to to oversee and to help and to improve the the chalk stream so i'm going to hand over to Alan now to look at a session with it looks at called a stream of data about how citizen science contributes to his work and other work in terms of, of really valuing our, our chalk stream so so thank you guys for your session and Alan i'll hand over to you thank you very much nick um good afternoon everyone um, yep, so I'm going to now um, present uh, a couple of um, different speakers and also I'm going to talk uh, about uh, a certain subject that I'm very familiar with uh, to do with river fly monitoring um, in this little section on monitoring the river environments of the Chilterns. Um, so um, as Nick has said, I manage the Chilterns Chalk Streams project, uh, have done so for quite a long time. Um, it's a frightening long time really, 15 years. The Chalk Streams project has been going for um, uh, over 20 years. Uh, it was set up originally in 1997 and the, the catalyst for, for its um, sort of creation was the low flows um, that were very prominent in the 1990s and continue to be so um, as the impacts of abstraction and climate change have impacted these rivers. Um, the project's uh, led by the Chilton Conservation Board and has a number of partners as you can see there uh, on the screen. Um, just to give you an idea of, of the, the distribution of chalk streams, the areas that we're going to be talking about today, um, this is a map of the, chalk, uh, of the Chilton's area of outstanding natural beauty and the chalk streams that um, have their source in the A and B, um, starting um, from the River Ver in the north all the way down to the Uelm Brook. Um, and also, although they're not mapped on this particular map, uh, there are a lot of little chalk springs and chalk streams that flow from the northern face, the northern scarp um, slope. Uh, through places like Princess Risborough, Chinna, Wendover, uh, and all the way up to Barton the Clay in the top there um, of the area. Um, so before I go on um, and talk about myself and uh, the projects that uh, 
that, that I've been involved with. Um, I'd like to introduce you to um, our first of our uh, today's speakers, um, uh, a colleague of mine uh, who we've worked together for a very long time. Now it, um, it would seem um, uh, Professor Kate Heppel from Queen Mary University of London. And Kate and I have worked on a number of projects over the years, um, mainly um, around the River Chess, um, but, um, and also doing quite a bit of education work with MSc students along the way. Um, Kate's here today to talk to you about a project that uh, we've, uh, 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 we've been partnering with Queen Mary University of London on uh, called Chess Watch. Um, so if I may, I'd like to hand over um, to you now, um, Kate. Um, and uh, yeah. That's great. Or shall I try to sh share the screen? Yeah. I'll, have to... I say, I'll just stop sharing. So there you go. Brilliant. Sorry. Thank you very much for that. That's great. Let's see if I can do this. To share. Do you tell me, can you see that? Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Alan, for inviting me along today to talk about Chess Watch, which is an online observatory for the River Chess. Um, as Alan's explained, the River Chess is a groundwater fed chalk stream in the Chilterns AUNB and this river currently fails actually to meet good ecological status um, and that's one of the reasons for looking at water quality in the river chess and trying to understand uh, part of the story there and citizen scientists are really active in the catchment for lots of different reasons as part of the Chilterns AUNB but one one thing that citizen scientists are doing is carrying out measurements of water quality in the river chess using some sensors that we've installed in the river. So I'm gonna be telling you a bit about that project, um, which is run as a partnership with Queen Mary University of London, the Chiltern Chalk Streams Project, the River Chess Association and Thames Water as well. So um, I'm sure Alan can tell you much more about this, but in terms of why groundwater fed chalk rivers are important, um, there's greater than 200 of these in England. Um, the water is predominantly from chalk aquifers, which means it's very clear when it ends up in the rivers. It's alkaline and mineral rich water and it's ecologically rich. Um, there's lots of in-stream plants. So you can see here, for example, in this photo top left, a ranunculus, um, that submerged plant within the river. You can see uh, the fish as brown trout and, uh, for example, water vole as well. And these rivers are really internationally important. England has 85% of the world's chalk streams. So in terms of the Chess Watch project, there were really initially three um, main sort of threads running through the project. We wanted to install and run sensors in the river to measure water levels and to measure water quality. We wanted to raise public awareness of the river chess and river chess management issues. And we wanted to develop educational material for uh, A-level students regarding chalk rivers, their unique ecology, and to teach um, people about water quality as well. So one of the things we have done is set up uh, a website about the river chess with the educational material on it. I'm not going to tell you too much about that during the talk, but if you want to have a look at the website for the project, then you, I've got the URL there for you. Um, and just a screenshot of the front page of the, of the website as well. So I'm going to focus um, much more on the water quality sensors. Um, so we can see uh, that the project itself is designed to raise public awareness of the threats to the river chess um, and to involve the public in river management activities using a network of four sensors as an engagement platform. So you can see top left here we've got some um, what we're calling sensor guardians, so the citizen scientists looking after the sensors in the river. Um, and one of the activities that they do is to clean these sensors on a regular basis um, and to help with downloading the data from the sensors to measure water levels in the river as well and keep an eye on, on the data stream that's coming in from these, from these sensors. So you can see uh, a toothbrush here, a very important piece of equipment that we use to clean these uh, probes that are part of the sensors. So each sensor actually has on it uh, a number of different probes that measure different aspects of water quality. 
And in 2009, we put four of these sensors into the river to provide um, citizen scientists and stakeholders with real time water quality data at 15 minute intervals. So this is quite a, a data rich data source on the river. And the idea was this would support catchment management activities into the future. So we'd be able to identify current problems with water quality in the river, but also to support um, a management plan being put into place for the river moving forward. So in terms of what are our sensors monitoring, they're monitoring the uh, depths of the water in the rivers, they're measuring the oxygen concentration within the water. That's a really important parameter, particularly, for example, for fish health. Um, fish will suffocate at low levels of oxygen and leading to, to fish kills. So oxygen has proven to be a, a really interesting parameter for us, us to measure. It measures uh, pH, measures water temperature as well. We measure turbidity of the water, so that's the clarity of the water, how clear it is. Chlorophyll A is a measurement of algae and algal species moving through the river, and tryptophan measures organic matter in the river. And the idea with the data set, it's intended to support future decision making in the catchment, um, and particularly as part of a five year smarter water catchments initiative that's been led by Thames Water. So one of the things we wanted to do, first of all, was really try and capture what local people felt about the river system and what their concerns were for the river chess. So in summer of 2019, we held what we call a participatory mapping exercise. We went around to local community events to try and capture how local stakeholders and citizens valued the river system and any concerns that they had for river health. So we asked people to put sticky dots, coloured dots, onto aerial maps of the catchment to identify where they thought particular problems arose and to fill in a, a, a brief questionnaire to tell us about what their concerns for the river were. Uh, so you can see there on the right that picture of the, um, the aerial photography but with the, the sticky dots on from one of the uh, events that we held at, at, um, at Rickmansworth. Um, they also, we also asked people what their favourite parts of the river were in the river valley and um, what they used the river for as well. So understanding whether they sort of jogged, walked, cycled, uh, what other kind of activities they were carrying out along the Chess Valley Walk. Um, so we captured all of this information on an online geographical information system, so like an online um, interactive map. Um, and the idea is to use this to be able to help prioritise activities in the catchment and to help sort of inform the catchment management plan. So from this, um, we could do things like create word clouds of all of the information that people were telling us. So this is just some of the information captured um, in response to the question, what and where are your greatest concerns? For the river chess and we, we had over 209 questionnaire responses from our visits to the stalls, uh, visits to sorry to the fates um, and people were telling us they were concerned about low water levels in the river chess, um, they were concerned about the lack of water, about changes to water quality and things like pollution in the river and rubbish and litter as well. So um, in terms of the numbers of respondents, most, most respondents were, were concerned about the low water levels and the second most important issue for people was water quality and pollution as well. And water levels and water quality issues go hand in hand. So we knew then that it was important to be monitoring some of this, these water quality issues with our sensor network. Um, in terms of um, identifying where people were concerned about issues in the river chess, we could see uh, that we could put together these types of maps. Um, the orange colour here, the intensity of the orange uh, indicates more responses. So, for example, lots of people were concerned about low flows in Chesham and people were concerned about water quality issues as we move through the catchment as well. So we have this kind of information from the participatory mapping part of the project. And um, we could then go on as well and install sensors and think about um, what kind of water quality parameters to measure and how to use that data in the river chess. So we've got uh, four sensors in the river. Um, we're measuring um, river water quality downstream of the headwaters, so downstream of Chesham. So one of our probes, probe one, monitors river water uh, just downstream of the Chesham area. We have a probe that's actually on a groundwater spring 
because that's the basis of water entering the river chest. This river is groundwater fed. Most of the water comes from the, the chalk underlying the catchment. So we wanted to understand what that source of water is like. That's almost a control for us. It's, it's uh, hopefully telling us the, what the water quality of the cleanest water is. Um, we looked at a site downstream of Chesham sewage treatment works. Um, and this allows us to distinguish between what's happening in the river due to the sewage treatment works versus what's happening in the river um, due to the urbanized section at Chesham as well. And then we put a fourth probe in the river uh, further downstream, downstream of uh, change to agricultural land use as well. So the sensor locations were chosen very much to be able to explore the river environment from the urbanized source of the river in Chesham through rural land use to the confluence with the River Colne at Rittmansworth as well. Um, and quite interestingly, during this uh, monitoring campaign that we've had so far, we've been monitoring during um, a period of, of what I would describe as weather extremes really. Our monitoring to date has covered a period of drought with below average rainfall to an autumn and winter with above average rainfall characterized by quite high rain, uh, high intensity rainfall. So if we look at this um, plot here, this is actually a screenshot from a really useful water resources portal for the public. Um, so we've heard about the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology a bit this morning, and this is something that they've developed, which is pulling in data from the Environment Agency. And you can actually view for your local rivers, you can view the water levels, you can view the discharge, you can uh, view rainfall. So all this um, data is interactive as well, so you can create your own plots. So I'd encourage you to have a, have a look at that site. It's really useful if you're interested in your local river, you can find out a lot of information from there. So this plot just shows you the flows in the river Chess from January 2019 onwards. Um, where the black line, so the black line is indicating river flow, where that plots over uh, the red colour, that's where over the long term average, um, that would be a very low flow. So you can see from January 2019 through to October 2019, we had notably to exceptionally low flows in the river chest. So we were monitoring at the start of the project in a period of very low flows and a period of drought. Now, coming through into um, 2020, Actually, we've moved to this period of really of higher rainfall, above average rainfall, with these high intensity rainfall events that we've, we've seen. So during this period, groundwater levels in the catchment have risen. And because the river is fed by groundwater, then so have the river flows. The river flows have risen really um, to actually from uh, exceptionally low levels to exceptionally high levels in March and April. Um, most recently, in October, on October the 3rd, sorry, yes, yeah, Saturday the 3rd of October, we had the UK's wettest day on record with an average of 31.7 millimetres of rain across the UK. So with this kind of data set, you can see very quickly the effect on the river chest, for example, here, this very rapid increase in flow and drop again in response to that rainfall event. Now, for me, um, as a hydrologist, these rainfall events uh, are really interesting. They're, they could become more frequent occurrences due to the impact of climate change. So for the UK, we're predicting um, changes in summer temperatures and changes in groundwater recharge, and notably changes in rainfall pattern moving forward as well with more frequent intense rainfall events. Um, so we may see more of this kind of event happening for us in future. So we need to ask, well, what does this mean for the river system? So moving on to some of the data that we've collected from the sensors and what that what that actually means and how can we um, use it in management plans. So here, for example, um, I've plotted temperature. So this is the river water temperature from April 2019 to April 2020. So um, you can see that this data set, it looks like it, it varies a lot. This has got a big amplitude here on the on the um, on the trace um, and these are daily changes in temperature so over a day you go from obviously warm temperatures during the day to cold temperatures at night so the river water is echoing what's happening in the air um, and that's um, giving rise to this sort of spikiness you see in the signal so each color here is a, a different sensor a different probe in the river 
Um, and you can see this seasonal pattern as well in um, river water temperature. So our data has enabled citizen scientists to better understand the changes in temperature in the river water. And particularly because um, 2019 was a very hot summer. Um, and again, this is something that's predicted to increase with uh, climate change. Um, and as a result, you can see that actually river water temperatures also got really high. Now, traditionally, chalk streams are described as having quite stable temperature regimes, but you can see that this river is actually having quite a, a variation in the temperature regime, and we're, we're exceeding 20 degrees centigrade at particular times as well. Now, this um, could potentially be a problem. Water temperatures above 20 degrees can be really stressful for fish populations. Um, and when we have periods of low flow, so not very much water in the river, water depths um, maybe at less than 30 centimetres, you're going to get a tendency for these river temperatures to rise and low flows and elevated temperatures are going to stress fish such as brown trout and also affect the recruitment st uh, strategies and success of fish such as grayling as well. So this has given our citizen scientists useful information about a water quality parameter that's linked to an ecological consequence as well. Um, so this is something that I think will be really interesting moving forward for developing management strategies for the river and I'll come back to that at the end. Um, two of our sensors are looking um, downstream of Chesham, an urbanised area, and further downstream of Chesham but downstream of a sewage treatment works as well. So just keep in mind here that the, the red data that you're going to see is downstream of Chesham but upstream of the sewage treatment works. The blue um, data stream that you're going to see is downstream of the sewage treatment works. So one of the things I said earlier which is important was oxygen measurements. Um, so in terms of um, dissolved oxygen concentrations the probes will measure these at 15 minute intervals and, and here's some data from the sensors from April 2019 to April 2020. The red is upstream of the sewage treatment works outfall and the blue is downstream of Chesham Sewage Treatment Works outfall. Um, so this is some of the first high resolution data on dissolved oxygen that's been collected by these uh, sensors. Um, and one thing that we noted with this data quite early on was after we had uh, high intensity rainfall events, uh, we were seeing the sharp drops in oxygen that you can see here at point A and here, for example, at point B. Um, and we could combine this data with observations that citizen scientists were making in the river system, taking photographs, seeing changes in the turbidity of the, um, of the water as well, and linking this to the storm tank discharge at the sewage treatment works outfall. So essentially what's happening here is the high intensity rainfall events uh, are overwhelming the sewage treatment works, um, and this is causing an intermittent uh, discharge of uh, untreated sewage to the river chess, which is then moving through the river chess and with it uh, you see these changes in oxygen. So when raw sewage gets into a river system, it's, it's very rich in organic matter in the sewage. The bacteria um, like that as a food source and those bacteria start to use that uh, sewage as a food source. But unfortunately, by doing that, they deplete oxygen levels in the river system. So we see these uh, sharp drops in, in oxygen. Um, and we've seen that about five times for five different high intensity rainfall events from September to March 2020. So this is a, a, a kind of use of these water quality uh, sensors to actually monitor what's happening to oxygen in the river system. Um, and as I say, the changes in oxygen level like this, sharp changes can have consequences for the health of fish in rivers. The other thing we've noticed with the, with the data set um, is the effect of groundwater ingress on the sewage treatment works as well. So um, from February uh, 28th onwards, uh, there was groundwater ingress due to high groundwater levels. So essentially the um, groundwater is, is getting into the sewage treatment works. And again, the treatment in the sewage treatment works is not so efficient then. Um, the storm tanks are filling and essentially this, the, the sewage treatment works is allowing raw sewage untreated sewage to get into the river chest. So this period C here, you can see this decline 
overall in oxygen status in the river system. By day, you've got the action of plants uh, photosynthesizing. Um, so those plants are actually putting oxygen back in the river. So what you end up with is these really large daily changes in oxygen concentration. So we can look um, with this data at these nice fine patterns in the river system. Um, we can track what the um, sewage treatment works operation is as well. So, for example, on the 17th of April, Thames Water started a trial to stop the uh, raw sewage from getting into the river to try and divert that, um, those storm tank uh, discharges back into the sewage treatment work system. And we can see the immediate effect of that on oxygen levels in the water as well. Another thing that we've been able to focus on as a result of these data sets uh, is sediment in the river as well. So uh, the red trace here shows you changes in turbidity. Uh, so turbidity measures how clear the water is. So the higher the turbidity, uh, the less clear the water is. So the more suspended material there is in the river. So this red trace here actually is downstream of Chesham, but upstream of the sewage treatment works. And it's enabled us to see that actually there's a lot of sediment getting into the river system from urban runoff from Chesham as well. Um, and if we look at the plot on the right here, this is the dissolved oxygen for the same time period. And you can see interestingly that this sediment actually doesn't have much of an impact on oxygen, although there's, there's um, a high turbidity level. Downstream of the sewage treatment works, we have, um, an effect on turbidity, but a big effect on the oxygen concentration. So that suggests to us that this uh, sediment getting into the river um, isn't uh, from the uh, from urban runoff, may not have a lot of organic matter associated with it, it may be more mineral in nature. So it, it's a problem in itself because it can smother the riverbed, it can prevent, for example, trout from spawning uh, by infilling the gravels with fine sediment. Um, but it's not um, potentially altering the oxygen dynamics, which is kind of the good news about that story. OK, so there's a number of different issues like uh, dissolved oxygen levels, water temperature and sediment we've been able to look at as the result of these water quality probes. Um, We've been really lucky with them um, having like group, different groups of uh, citizen scientists getting involved that are a bit interested in different things. So one of our citizen scientists, um, he is really interested in putting data onto websites and actually making this data available. So he's created um, a shiny app uh, for the data. That means that you can log into the site and anyone can look at the data. They can toggle different graphs. Um, they can uh, remove layers, add layers, and they can zoom into the data um, to different levels as well. So that's something that we're experimenting with is making how to make this data immediately available to the public to be able to investigate themselves and to the citizen scientists involved with the project as well. But sometimes the data itself isn't meaningful for people. It's actually important to put a narrative around that to explain what the data means to help people interpret and help them improve uh, their learning about the different river environments as well. And that's a, a reason why a lot of citizen scientists get involved. They want to know more about the system and how it operates. So just delivering data in its raw format isn't always uh, the right way to go about things. Um, so we're trying also to create uh, story maps for the river chest. So this is the next part of the project, um, which is essentially a narrative, a story around what's happening with the river, explaining the, the hydrology, the hydrogeology, how the river levels work and how they're linked to water quality. Um, so that's in the process of being uh, created at the moment. We're going to be trialing that at um, workshops virtual workshops with the public um, from the end of November onwards. If you're interested in having a look at the data and um, using these story maps, which are essentially uh, just a, an online web uh, page where you can, uh, it's interactive, you can scroll through it, you can read about the river chess, you can read about the science and you can look at graphs as well. So if you're interested in helping us evaluate these story maps, um, do drop me an email um, and we'll try and include you in the workshops. Um, so what do I think have been the successes and the challenges of the Chess Watch project? Um, I think that the citizen scientists involved hopefully have a greater understanding of how water quality varies in space and time and a feeling of engagement with their issues. The projects provided a detailed shared water quality data set um, that hopefully provides a before intervention baseline for the group. So if now there's um, some catchment management projects put in place, um, we have a before intervention 
data sets and we can then see and track how water quality varies in response to management. Um, certainly because of the data is at 15 minute resolution, we hope people have got a better understanding of the dynamics in water quality and that, that will help drive some management ad advice as well. What are the, the challenges of this type of project? Well, one thing is getting that real time visualization. So obviously for the public, like looking at the data in real time, understanding, for example, in the sewage treatment works isn't operating properly might be really important. And getting this data out to people in a timely manner is quite a, a challenge actually, because you have to clean the data and you have to get that out in a format that people can digest as well. So we're trying to investigate and through the story maps, uh, ways of improving the dissemination of the data um, and how to best help people interpret the data as well. And then the next challenge, I think, the next part of the story for us will be linking this data set to measurements of eco ecological health in the river as well. And I'm sure Alan will be talking a little bit more about that after me. Um, and so if I just have to summarise some of the things we found out about the, the data, First of all is um, summer water temperatures might be problematic for a range of fish. They're now exceeding 20 degrees centigrade um, when we have uh, hot uh, periods of hot weather. Um, and we need management activities to address uh, these summer water temperatures. Um, providing increased riparian cover, so shading by trees, for example, might be an option to explore. The data can be used um, really well in conjunction with pre-existing local knowledge. So for example, um, people in catchment have been taking photographs and um, capturing the effects of road runoff or at least the, the, the road runoff that's been occurring. Um, and we've now got some of the turbidity data to support that as well, to show how road runoff is transporting fine sediment in the rivers. And then this may be problematic for infilling of gravels. And that's a, an area that we think requires further investigation in catchment. We've seen that the greatest variations in dissolved oxygen concentration in our river arise from the operation of sewage treatment works. Um, and that there are issues of storm tan tank discharge from the sewage treatment works, both due to high intensity rainfall events and also due to groundwater ingress. And these things need uh, to be addressed. And then finally, we can look towards combining data from different citizen science initiatives as well. So for example, Affinity Water has reduced groundwater abstraction in the River Chess area recently, um, and perhaps flow monitoring in combination with the sensor data offers a means of monitoring the effects that decreased abstraction have on flow and ecology into the future. So there's lots that we can be doing moving forward to combine data from these different citizen science uh, initiatives that are going on in the river. So finally, a big thank you to everyone who's made this work possible. Uh, a lot of the photographs you've just seen are not mine. They're from um, Paul Jennings and from Alan Beachy, for example. Um, there's lots of people that have been involved with helping out getting this data, keep, keeping those sensors running during a really difficult time period. I wish I'd taken a photograph of everybody together before we were in lockdown. I hope uh, to be able to do that um, sort of uh, when, we, when we don't have to be socially distanced for everything. If you would like to get involved in the project, then please do send me an email at c.m.heppel at qmul.ac.uk. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now and hopefully hand back to Alan. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll agree that's a, a really fascinating um, talk and a really fascinating subject, which I know has posed uh, the work and the research has posed far more questions than it has delivered answers, which is, is common with all good research, I think. Um, uh, just as a reminder to everyone watching, uh, if you would like to ask Kate any questions, um, we do have a Q&A spot right at the end of this section. Uh, you can post your comments via the comment section of on the YouTube page um, below the video. Please do, and we'll do our best to answer the questions. Uh, if we're not able to answer all of the questions today, uh, we will seek to answer the questions um, uh, in our own time, if you like, and make them available via our website. Um, but in the meantime, thank you very much, Kate. Um, I'm, it's now my turn um, uh, in this next spot to talk about the work that um, some of the work that I've been involved with as part of the Chalk Streams project. So um, here we go. Hopefully, I can share my screen and all will be well. Here we go. So uh, yes, the Chilton's Chalk Stream project. Um, it was set up originally. Um, to raise awareness of the, pro uh, of the plight of chalk streams, uh, the chronic low flows, to campaign um, and, and call for greater um, uh, protection of these rivers 
uh, for the reduction of obstruction, uh, but also to carry out practical management, practical uh, projects, provide advice to landowners, uh, to educate and raise awareness. But uh, more recently, um, it is uh, a real key objective has emerged, and that is one of citizen science, um, supporting uh, the, the project has supported local groups for many years, delivering practical um, conservation uh, work on their local river. But um, increasingly, the project has begun to help um, empower those groups to be able to monitor the health of their river um, to, uh, and to, to understand their rivers better. And I think probably the first way in which we uh, got involved in citizen science uh, in terms of monitoring, um, particularly uh, of rivers, was riverfly monitoring, which is what I'm going to talk to you about um, today. Um, so. There we go. So it is going to work. So river flies, what do we, um, what do we mean by river flies? And um, there are lots of flies that you see buzzing about, although less than they used to be, um, even in my lifetime. However, um, a lot of, um, there are a lot of species of invertebrate that live in river systems, uh, including river flies. Uh, and there are three main order of, um, of river flies. Uh, they are the um, caddis flies or trichoptera. And trichoptera means hair wing. So the adults that look a little bit like a moth as you can see there. Uh, actually, uh, there's, th their wings are made up of lots of tiny little hairs, uh, which is different compared to moths and butterflies, which have their, their wings are made up of lots of tiny little scales. Um, all of these river flies have their, their larval or nymphal stages um, that uh, living in um, uh, freshwater environments and river systems. So um, the the next one, uh, next main group is um, Ephemeroptera, the upwing flies or mayflies as we um, call them uh, in, uh, in this country. Everywhere else in the world calls them mayflies to cover the whole um, spectrum of Ephemeroptera, species in uh, the order of Ephemeroptera. We tend to use it a bit interchangeably to mean certain species as well as all of them. But for the purposes of this presentation, I shall try to stick to uh, the convention of Ephemeroptera when I'm talking about the order uh, the, the whole group of um, species that, uh, of, of upwing flies. And the, um, the last one is stoneflies or plecoptera. These are species um, that are uh, sort of characteristic of mountain streams, really very, uh, very pure environments, but we also find them uh, on other river systems and chalk streams uh, in particular. Um, why, why monitor river flies? Well, they are uh, the canary of our rivers. They, um, you know, if, if there's a problem with our river fly populations in rivers, then um, we have a real problem for the entire um, uh, river ecosystem. They are great indicators of, um, of water quality because they're relatively uh, sessile. Um, they tend to stay in the same area, if you like. They, they, unlike fish, they can't sort of um, migrate long distances. Yes, they do drift downstream with, with flow and the adults when they hatch very often are pre-programmed to fly upstream in order to um, correct for that downstream drift. Um, but uh, the, the larval, the nymphal stages are relatively sort of kind of uh, sessile or sedentary. Um, they're quite long lived. So, for example, you know, the green drake mayfly and uh, the common misconception is that they last for a day as an adult. They might last for up to a week or more, depending on the weather conditions. But the weather conditions are right. Yes, they'll last for a day as an adult, but they will live in the river system for two years. Um, so they're around for a while. So they are effectively you know, they are open to um, whatever the, the river um, um, flow is like and whatever the water quality is like. Um, they're also the bottom end of the food chain. So they're really critical for the whole ecosystem. As I say, if you've got a problem with the bottom end of the food chain, then you are guaranteed to be having problems or will have problems with um, uh, the ch food chain as you go further up. Um, so um, I'd like to talk um, about the initiative that um, the Chalk Streams project has helped um, uh, sort of uh, kind of spread throughout the Chilterns. It's called the Anglers River Fly Monitoring Initiative or ARMY for short. Um, now this is, um, uh, was the brainchild of um, Dr. Cyril Bennett, um, who was developing, who developed a, a system um, for monitoring um, the river way. Um, he's a, a British telecom engineer by day. Uh, but in his um, retirement has become um, a renowned expert on invertebrates, river flies and river fly conservation. Um, and he was a, a lifelong angler too. And he noticed that there were problems with uh, the, um, the river fly populations of uh, the river way. And he wanted to be able to come up with a system that um, 
anglers could use to monitor the health of their rivers. And uh, so it had to be robust. It had to be um, you know, relatively simple, easy to, um, to, to be taught it effectively um, so that people could use it. It had to be quick as well, relatively um, speedy um, sampling technique. And he created this, um, this sampling technique, which is now known as the Anglers River Fly Monitoring Initiative. Um, it's a neighborhood watch scheme for rivers um, and it is volunteer led. It was originally started uh, the creation, as I say, for anglers, but it um, has since become incredibly popular um, since its launch in 2007. Uh, and there are hundreds of rivers throughout the UK that are now being monitored um, uh, regularly by anglers, conservationists, um, local uh, and members of local community, lo local river groups, all coming together um, to uh, act as effectively the the the, uh, the neighbourhood watch for their local rivers. Um, as far as the Chilterns is concerned, the first Chilterns group was set up in 2010, and this was a, um, a, a project that I started with the River Chess Association. Uh, a few of us went down to Leckford on the River Test to get trained by Cyril himself. Uh, it was a fantastic day. The photograph there shows uh, one of our volunteers, Andrew, um, at that training session. And so we set that one up in July um, 2010. So we now have 10 years worth of data. Uh, for, for that river. Um, it became very popular. We, we um, rolled it out, the Chalksing project rolled it out to uh, the River Misbourne with Misbourne River Action and the Chiltern Society the next year, and then um, the Ver Valley Society on the River Ver the following year to that. But it's very clear that um, the demand for, um, uh, uh, for training courses was outstripping the ability of the Riverfly Partnership, who, um, who, who led on the rollout of this scheme. Uh, their ability to train people. They, they ran about half a dozen training um, courses a year. Um, and so there was just far too much demand. So the Riverfly Partnership trialed this idea of Riverfly hubs, in other words, to um, create hubs around the country that could then train um, monitors for their local area. And it's been incredibly successful. The Chilterns and Hertfordshire Middlesex Riverfly Hub was one of the first of them. And, and it was set up by the Chalk Streams Project working in partnership with a few um, uh, uh, key partners, Hearts Middlesex Wildlife Trust, the River Chess Association, and um, the Colm Valley Fisheries Consultative. And we had support from um, the water companies, Affinity Water in particular, um, Hertfordshire County Council and the Environment Agency. Um, and we set up in 2014, really to train more people effectively and to cover more rivers. Uh, it covers the whole of the Lee, the Colne and the South Chiltern, so it's quite a large catchment area. There's something like 36 main rivers there, um, and we now currently have something like 260 odd volunteers and over 130 sites being actively monitored on a monthly basis, um, covering 17 different rivers That's and seven rivers in the Chilterns out of the nine that there are. We have uh, five tutors um, who provide the training and provide the support and four of those are volunteers and I'm very grateful for their help and support we wouldn't be able to do it without them. Um, this gives you a little the map gives you an idea of the sort of coverage that we have each of those red dots is a river fly site so you can see we've got a really good coverage um, and we still have further to go but um, compared to where we were in 2010 um, it's a world of difference we're getting um, really regular information about the quality of these rivers from top to bottom. Uh, we're serving more, more regularly in more places um, than the Environment Agency is able to do so. So in a sense, our river fly monitoring network knows more about the river fly quality, uh, uh, river water quality than perhaps the Environment Agency do through their own monitoring. Um, so what is it? What does it involve? So what we're doing is, and um, this is the cunning part Cyril came up with, he came up with this scheme um, whereby we're not monitoring to species level in all cases, because if you think about it, we've got 199 species of, of caddis fly, we've got 51 species of ephemeroptera, we've got 34 species of plecoptera. You can imagine um, most volunteers turning up to a train, training course, if they were told they needed to monitor all those and identify all those, I think their heads might explode and they might all run off uh, into the distance. So um, what we do look at is uh, we group those uh, invertebrates into eight key uh, groups and I'll show those a bit later in this presentation. From, from um, uh, our sample survey, it's a three minute kick sample, that's what Andrew's doing in that uh, picture there. Um, we look for in our sample trays um, for the presence and abundance and that the abundance is key uh, of these eight invertebrate groups. And from that information, we can calculate a score for our site every month, which we can then compare to a trigger level, a trigger score that is set by the Environment Agency um, for each site. So it's different for each site. Um, 
And if our score comes in, in in the month either equal to that trigger level or above, then we report that information through to the environment agency. Um, and we obviously also keep that data ourselves. But if there is a trigger breach, i.e. the score is below that line, then each monitor will go out and uh, the effective site will go out and uh, repeat that survey or preferably repeat that survey um, uh, at the time they um, scored the or original breach. And if their second sample also records a trigger breach, we record that and, and report that to the environment agency via their pollution hotline and via our contacts with the ecology department and, the, and that should trigger an environmental agency or environment agency, pardon me, investigation. Um, the, the graph there shows you an example of the sort of returns we were getting originally when, when we started. That was the uh, recording sheet that we had um, showing you month by month what scores were and comparing it to the trigger score. So what do I mean by the target groups? Here, here they are. We won't go into in any detail because um, it, it would take too long and I don't have uh, enough time, alas, because um, this is the bit that I enjoy talking about, <laughs> the, the creepy crawlies in a way. So the eight key groups really are, um, we, we group the caddis, remember I said there's nearly 200 species. Um, so rather than looking at them individually or down to family level, we look to see, we record them as whether they have case, are they case caddis? So some, uh, the majority of species of caddis fly will create a case, a protect, either a protective or a camouflage case, um, so, uh, and so they can exist in their environment um, without being predated, or like some of them, the ones that they make their cases out of stones to weigh them down so they don't get washed away by the current. So case caddis is one group. The next group is caseless caddis. Some caddis fly don't make a case. They might make a feeding web or they might be in, um, uh, might be predatory, um, like the case uh, in, in the, um, the case of Ryacophyla, which is the, the green caseless caddis here uh, um, um, on this picture, um, that is predatory. So it doesn't make itself a case until it comes time to pupate. Um, so, and then, then we um, look at four um, groups are in the um, order of Ephemeroptera. So we look for Ephemeridae, the mayfly. So this is the large mayfly, the mayfly that everyone probably, if you think of a mayfly, this is the one you're thinking of. The green drake, for example, there are three species here in this group. We're looking at Ephemeridae, they're quite a large nymph, um, a very um, a particular color, that sort of ivory sort of buff color. Um, then we look at the blue winged olive, which is very important um, in terms of indicator of water quality uh, and in very important historically for angling. Um, it's, a, it's a key um, food stuff for trout throughout the year. Um, we also look at flat bodied nymphs, heptogenidae, um, like fast flowing oxygen rich water. We also look at olives or baitidae, which uh, there's 14 species in that uh, in that family. And then finally we have um, stonefly, Plecoptera. We look basically, have we got any stonefly at all? So there are 34 species, but we're only looking to see whether we've got stonefly or not. Uh, and then the one outlier is gamerous. Um, uh, which is um, you know, a key species of chalk streams. It's, uh, uh, it's omnipresent or hopefully in all but the most polluted systems. Um, so it's presence and absence as a, because it's a detritivore, it's a key part of the ecosystem. Um, and so it's important, it, its presence is important. So that's why we count those. Um, there's a bit of an example of what a, um, a, an adult sedge would look like or an adult caddis fly. Um, and, uh, Couple of examples of what a mayfly might look uh, looks like. Um, that's the green drake on the left there, and the yellow may done on the right. And then uh, an example of a stonefly. This is the willow fly. Some of these are really quite tiny, uh, just to give you an idea. And then of course the freshwater shrimp here, which, um, as I've mentioned, um, it is uh, omnipresent really, um, and it is really key because it shreds up all of the organic matter that's coming into the system, um, and uh, it, it provides food for other species. Um, so it's really quite important. Um, so what does all this data tell us? Um, so as I said, said that, you know, all these river fly monitors are going out in pairs um, and I've begun to do so again now um, uh, since lockdown eased. Um, they're, they're getting this data and they're reporting it back through to their um, local river fly coordinator. So each river will have a local coordinator. They report that data to the coordinator. The coordinator uh, collates all that information, that data, and sends it to the environment agency and obviously keeps a record themselves. Um, and more latterly, they've now been uploading to our river fly app. Um, so some of these groups have now got quite long term data sets. So it's the, the importance of this data is it's not just about what happened in the previous month. 
was there a pollution problem in the previous month? Yes, of course that's important. But the longer you uh, monitor, um, the, uh, the bigger your data set, the more robust, more important it becomes, the more significant it becomes, because it starts telling you more about the long term trends in your um, uh, on your river uh, and on your river sites. Um, so these are a couple of examples using the chest data here. Um, and this this one comes from this uh, uh, this graph here. Uh, I know Chris Backham likes a good graph. He's probably missing this, but um, it's, uh, it's his loss. Um, this is a this is a graph of river fly scores um, at a site in the headwaters of the River Chess um, called the Meads Water Gardens. This is a site that historically, in my childhood, when I was growing up, never dried up. Um, but it started the first time I noticed it drying up was 1997, and it's dried up on many occasions since, increasingly so. And the indication was that increased abstraction and the impacts of climate change were including, uh, leading to increased dry down frequency and extent. Um, and the river fly data here um, shows you those drying events. So every time the, the score effectively flatlines, the line flatlines, the blue line. Um, that's where really the river is drying. And then so as it's beginning to climb back up after that, that flat line, that's the time length of time it's taking to recover. And you can see that um, when, when they started river fly monitoring, very soon after we had a brief dry down event, but, but um, after the river rewetted, there was a really quick recovery and the scores were pretty high. Subsequent to that though, in the recoveries after um, uh, increasingly long droughts, the recovery has been slower and the recovery has not been back to the levels that we saw in perhaps 2011. Um, and the, no surprise there that the long term trend, the, R, uh, the, the dotted line there is showing you that there is in the long term over the 10 years of data, I realize this is just eight, but the, this has been echoed by the next two years. Um, the long term trend is one of decline. Now, um, those of you who, um, who are sort of um, kind of aware of what goes on in the Chilterns and have been keeping up with the local news would know that very recently Affinity Water has announced that it has shut um, two pumping stations in the Chess Valley um, to try to uh, well, to address the uh, low flow issues um, and by 2024 um, Thames Water will be shutting their Harwich pumping station which will mean that there will be no abstraction in the upper Chess catchment from 2025 um, and so that is anticipated to make a significant dif a difference to uh, flows in the upper river. And it will be interesting to see whether the river fly data begins to show an increase or whether there are other um, issues at play. But clearly this river fly data is important in showing you the long term trend. But it's not all bad news. This is that's quite a depressing one. A lot of the headwater sites, they all look very similar. Um, this is a section just slightly further downstream at Broadwater Bridge. This is a section that doesn't dry out, has never dried out. And you can see from this data, uh, the red line being the trigger um, level, which has been moved around by the Environment Agency a little bit. But the blue line showing that over time, the river fly um, scores have increased. Both the abundance and the diversity, the number of target groups being found has increased. Um, there are lots of different hypotheses for this. It's a very small part of the um, small bit of river. Um, my theory is that over the years, monthly river fly monitoring over the same section of gravel in what is a very narrow channel has gradually mobilized that gravel and, and removed, helped um, get rid of the silt that was sort of binding up the gravel. And the gravel is where a lot of these uh, invertebrates live. And so it's in their action effectively has improved the habitat and has meant that it's been um, you know, sort of more attractive to different species. That's my theory. Uh, the next site downstream shows a decline again, not as strong as Meadowalds Gardens, but um, you know, uh, still significantly, statistically significant decline. So there's something definitely different going on here. Um, but it's you know, only through this river fly data are we are we seeing these uh, trends and seeing them in such detail. Um, one last way in which this data is really important is to monitor um, perhaps the success of river uh, of river restoration projects. Uh, both carried out by the local community and both uh, and also carried out by other organizations such as the Environment Agency or the Chalk Streams Project. This is a project that I want to talk about um, uh, at, on the River Bourbon at Boxmoor. And this uh, river project was carried out um, back in 2017. It was a two phase project. I was involved in the first phase. This was a project that I sort of dreamt up back in 2010 and worked with the Boxmoor Trust um, to, to really sort of sell, sell it to their trustees. Uh, and, and latterly to uh, they to the environment agency who carried out the project uh, and funded it. 
A key part of this project was engaging local volunteers, not only to carry out some of the work, but also uh, to monitor, set up a monitoring program to monitor the success of this, this project. And one of the key parts of that was to set up a river fly monitoring group, uh, which we did um, over a year beforehand, before any work was carried out. Now that was really important because you want to find, you want to determine a baseline. And the longer your baseline data set, the more statistically significant any changes you observe um, you know, will be. You'll be able to be able to mon uh, determine whether they're statistically significant or not. Excuse me. So, one of the key parts of the first phase was to remove a weir, and you can see it in the top right photograph there. Uh, um, the guys from BMW Services uh, knocking it out, uh, taking the weir out. Um, and then there was also wetland creation and river channel restoration, which you can see five rivers doing the year after the, the weir was taken out uh, there on Boxmoor. And the volunteers also got stuck in as well. And the eagle eye amongst you might even see me um, getting involved there too. Um, one of the key parts was to monitor the success, success as, I, uh, as I mentioned. This is data taken from uh, a site that was set above the weir. Uh, that was removed. Now the weir was impounding water, so it was holding water back, slowing flows down, leading to a lot of sediment building up and the habitat to degrade in the 200 metre section upstream of that weir. Um, so we wanted to remove the weir, number one, to, to improve connectivity, to allow the fish to move free movement through the site. This, was, this weir was halfway down the site, so it was really key to do this. Um, and we also wanted to re-energise the river and improve habitat. So you can see uh, here from the, the graph very clearly that the, from the moment the weir was removed, almost the next month, um, you know, uh, river fly scores started to increase. Now, some of that is down to seasonality because, you know, in spring up to the sort of June, that's when we expect to get our highest abundances and, and highest diversity of river fly groups. But even so, looking at the data, you can see very clearly that the both the number of target groups and the abundance of those target groups increased um, after the weir was removed. And um, the, the little pink um, parts of the bar graphs there show you um, that, that stonefly were recorded in that river section. It's the only section that they were recorded in um, on the five sites in that area, but they'd never been recorded before in that, in that part of the river. And I'd carried out river fly monitoring prior to that, way back in 2010, and monitoring had been done before that. So this shows you uh, how river fly monitoring can really show you very clearly the benefits or the successes of your interventions in terms of river, uh, river restoration. And, and, and volunteers obviously are critical to be able to monitor um, these, these projects. Monitoring can be very expensive. Um, and so very often monitoring is missed off um, uh, restoration plans because you don't have the money for it. But if we can encourage um, citizen scientists, volunteers to help with that, we can get some really powerful data sets um, to show us in detail um, whether we're being whether we're doing the right thing in terms of river restoration. Um, well, if I've infused you, I hope so. Um, hopefully, not just infuse you to think about lunch, but also to potentially to uh, join your local river fly group. There are lots of river fly uh, groups out there across the area. You've seen the map. There's there will be one near you. Uh, and if you don't live in the Chilterns and you want to get involved, there are hundreds of rivers across the UK with river fly groups. Um, you can, you can, if you're living in the Chilterns or you want to monitor a, a Chilterns river, uh, get in contact with me um, and you can attend one of our river fly courses. We're just beginning to um, plan our next river fly course. We're now, we've now worked out a way to do that um, uh, in a way that's COVID safe. Uh, so we'll be doing part of it over um, to virtually, so the, the classroom bit, and then we'll be doing some um, sort of small scale practical um, uh, elements. It, it, you know, we do some, uh, some of the training out in the field. So we're doing that in small numbers. We're gonna be doing that uh, this winter. Um, so please let me know, we can get you on the waiting list for the next course. Um, and you, before you know it, day's worth of training and you'll be up surveying your local river, meeting like-minded people who just like to get out there and get their feet wet. Um, the last little thing to mention is recently, this is another aspect of citizen science, we're very fortunate to have four really committed, uh, hugely um, talented and, uh, and knowledgeable volunteers uh, who are tutors at, um, with the River Fly uh, Training Hub, the Children's Hearts Middlesex River Fly Hub. Um, and they do a lot for us in, in, in running the training courses, et cetera, and supporting the groups. One of our uh, volunteers, Rod Cutler, 
who is also um, a, a member of the Con Valley Fisheries Consultative, uh, is an absolute whiz with the development of apps. And he's developed a Riverfly app for our hub so that we all our monitors can record their data um, online. They can do it from the bank, whether or not they've got a mobile reception at the time. It's fantastic. The data is few, free to view. You can go to the RFLIES UK website at, right now and look at any site you want to look at. You can find the data, not only that, but you can also download load it and you can do your own analysis on that data set. So please do take a look. Um, uh, we'd love to see you uh, see it being used more, uh, much more um, and uh, people getting value out. And hopefully in time, you guys might be adding to that data set too. Um, so that's, that's it from me. Um, I, uh, um, I will be now hand, handing over um, to uh, another uh, colleague of mine and, and fantastic um, citizen scientist in his own right, James Wishart. Um, James, he's a civil engineer by trade, but uh, also a lifelong angler. And, and has lived in the Chilterns for over 60 years. Um, and he's been involved uh, with a lot of citizen science initiatives on the River Chess himself over the last five years. And he's here today to talk to you about one uh, that he's currently involved in and leading on, uh, on the management of. So um, without further ado, I shall cease sharing my screen and I shall hand over to James. Good afternoon, James. Thanks, Alan. I'll just uh, share my screen. Hopefully my slides will appear in a moment. Yep, that looks good. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about the flow monitoring. We've heard about quality from Cape. We've heard about the invertebrates from Allen. This is the third element, really, which is to see what the flows are doing in the river. Uh, we've already touched on some of the issues with flows. The, the fact that it's been low for a number of years, particularly during summer months, and the level of local concern about the, the lack of flows. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to say a little bit about more on the background, where we're flowing, monitoring the flows and how we're doing it, a little bit about what the data show and some of the quite exciting recent developments. First of all, I want to give thanks to all the people involved in the, the monitoring side of the work. Um, it's essentially it's a group of volunteers supervised by Alan um, and some of the local authority organisations but with a lot of support from Environment Agency who have provided us with the equipment for the surveys and who also uh, take all the data from us and add it to their data archives. So what we're doing is feeding into an official system, it won't be lost. Um, Thames Water and Affinity Water, who are both have abstractions in the catchment, have also supported the work. Thames have provided us with some equipment as well. Um, and they're both involved in studies, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, been a lot of interest from local groups. Um, so to, before I get to list those, this is just illustrating the sort of problems with flows that have been mentioned previously. So this is in the upper catchment. These are both sites where we should be measuring flows. This was in 2017. There was nothing there to measure at that stage. More recently, and at the moment, there is some flow there, which is good, but it still is very transitory. On the left is the, the site by the Queen's Head pub, which is always a popular one to sample. And on the right is what is called Duck Alley. Um, not a very good place for ducks right now, or it is perhaps right now, but it wasn't for much of the time that we've been doing our monitoring. A little bit more on the background. So I've talked about the, the concerns that there have been. Um, these have been manifest through groups like the uh, River Chess Association and by the local councils in Chesham and other places. This prompted an investigation by the Environment Agency, uh, which was funded by Thames Water and Affinity Water. That began in around about 2017 and was recently reported. And that did conclude that there was likely to be some impact from abstractions on the flow in the rivers. And the three abstractions of particular concern in the upper catchment, two of them belong and are operate, operated by Affinity Water uh, at Chartridge and in Chesham. The third abstraction is operated by Thames Water at Harwich. And together they're taking quite a lot of water out of the same aquifer that is connected to and feeding the River Chess. 
we've already seen, I think, some pictures from Alan of the river and where we are. It's running from northwest down to southeast. It rises in Chesham, which is unusual for a chalk stream. It's actually really starting out in an urban area, coming down through some rural areas and discharging into the River Colne or Rickmansworth. And where we've been concentrating our flow monitoring, because these are areas which are not covered traditionally by environmental agency monitoring sites, are in the upper catchment within that red box at the top of the, the slide. And this is the area which is probably most likely to be impacted by abstractions. This is just a blow up of the area within that red box, showing in more detail where our sampling sites are. So they start right up at the very headwaters, uh, up in the tennis club at site one, come down past the, the Queen's Head pub at site three, and then come down into the rather larger river at site six, um, by the playing fields, recreation ground. We're sampling both on the main river, such as site six, but also on a parallel water course, the Little Chess, which comes down to the south of the, the main river. We're sampling it and measuring flows on Holloway Lane. These two rivers carry on separately for another two or three miles until eventually they join together down at Latimer. And as well as flows on the, the main river and the Little Chess, we're taking some flow measurements at very small side streams or springs where we want to see how they are affected by seasonal variations and possibly by abstractions. The way we do the flow measurements are really very simplistic compared with maybe some of the high tech that we've been talking about earlier on on the, the quality measurements that Kate is doing. This is very much a, a manual system. You go out, you put a measuring tape across the river, and then at that cross section, you divide it into a number of strips, or at least you visually or virtually divide it into a number of strips. And at each point, each strip, you measure the depth of the flow, the width of that strip, and you measure the velocity, the average velocity within that segment. And then you, to calculate the flow, you multiply the velocity by the area of the cross section, and then you add them up across the whole of the water course to give you the total flow. To measure the velocity, we've got a propeller type of uh, meter. You mount this on a vertical shaft, lower it down into the stream, uh, about one third of the, the depth from the, the bed of the stream to give you a representative velocity. And you measure how many revolutions you get in a minute of submergence. Don't have to count the revolutions by hand. Is there an automatic electronic monitor which will, will count them up for you over the minute. And this is one of the small sites. This is one of the, the smaller uh, side streams fed by a spring. And you can see the, the tape just stretched across the, the water. Probably going to be taking 10 or a dozen measurements at closely spaced intervals along this tape. And you can see the, the shaft of the meter with the propeller meter actually sitting horizontally in the water, sort of in front of my feet there. When we've collected together the data, and apologies that this is a slightly fuzzy slide, um, for each of the sites on each look, at each occasion we take a survey, we record the, the distance from the bank, which gives us then the width of the different sections that we're dividing up into. That's the distance, the point at which we are taking the velocity measurement. In the next yellow column, measuring the, the depth of the flow monitor at, at that point, and then the number of revolutions were recorded over that minute at that location. And this is all in a spreadsheet. It adds it all up, working out the flow in each of the vertical slices and giving us in the bottom right hand corner in that red box, the actual flow in cubic meters a second at the time we did the survey. These are just next couple of slides show shots of some of the survey sites. The site on the left-hand side here is site five. Um, 
often not very much flow here. It comes out of a small spring, um, but sometimes flows are diverted and we pick up rather more flow. On the right hand side, we've got site 6B, which is one of our regular good flow sites. Um, it comes close below a major inflow into the, into the uh, river and is always, so far anyway, we've always recorded flows during the period of our surveys. A couple of other sites. On the left is site seven, which is a, a small side stream, um, quite variable, but fairly, fairly consistently always something there. On the right, Holloway Lane, which is on the Little Chess, um, is again always a pretty continuous flow there and often quite a good flow. So what are we getting out of this survey work? What are we seeing? Well, this is probably rather a lot on this slide to take in, in one glance, but it's a summary of the flows we've been measuring at not the most upstream sites because those have often been dried and we haven't seen any flows. I picked the five sites that have been fairly regularly uh, flowing. And over the nearly four, four years we've been taking measurements, you can see the fluctuations through each year and from year to year. So taking site RCA8, which is this pale blue line at the top, that's the Holloway Lane site on the Little Chess. Through each year, you usually start off with reasonable flows in the spring, gradually declining through to October, November time, and then the winter rains, recharging the aquifer and beginning to increase the flows through the following spring and then declining again. 2018 was a much wetter spring than some, so we've got a lot more recovery of the flows in 2018. 2019, pretty dry, and in fact, we didn't really start to get any recovery until December time or November, December time. But well, then we got a really big kick up of flows in the last winter, which was very wet. Unfortunately, our work was interrupted for a period by COVID-19 restrictions. So we missed some of the probably the biggest flows we've had for many years in March, April, May of this year. But even so, when we resumed in June, the flows are still quite high, certainly higher than they've been in many recent years. I've also shown on this slide um, of that red, red line, which just goes straight across here. That is the, the total of the abstractions that are licensed within the catchment. Um, just to give you an idea that they are quite significant volume uh, compared with the flow in the rivers. However, it shouldn't just, shouldn't just assume that if you stop abstractions, all of that flow will be added onto the river flow. There's a number of points to, to consider here. First of all, um, the, much of the flow that is taken out by the obstructions is returned at the sewage works, which is just a little bit downstream of our most downstream sampling site. So the obstructions are not lost forever. They do come back mostly into the river. The red line is also is just the license abstractions. What is actually abstracted is always less than that, although it sometimes gets up towards that at certain times of year. And lastly, certainly if you were to just stop abstractions, the water wouldn't all reappear in the water course. It would, go, it would sit in the catchment in the, in the uh, aquifer. Some of it would come back into the rivers, but the hydrogeology is quite complex. It's one of the things which the studies have highlighted. It's not that clear how much will come back in, but hopefully as we continue our monitoring, uh, we will begin to see the effects. I won't dwell too much on this slide because I think we're getting a bit short on time. This is just showing the more upstream sites which have just intermittent periods of flow in them. So the, there was a spell in 2018 where we could measure the upstream sites. And again, at the moment, they're flowing quite well, although through the summer and into the autumn, they are beginning to drop off. Hopefully the rains we're having at the moment will soon reach the aquifer and begin to see them picking up again. So just to talk finally about some of the recent developments, I think uh, both the previous presentations have mentioned these very positive pieces of news. First one is that Affinity Water 
have announced in September that they are switching off and have switched off their pumping station, the upper catchment. So that should be of some benefit to the flows. Thames Water have also pledged that in future they will be stopping their carriage abstractions by the end of 2024. And also Thames Water and three other water companies have vowed not only to be abstracting less from the chalk streams, but also to be looking at improving um, pollution performance of their sewage works um, and other runoff into the, these catchments. So altogether, we seem to be turning the corner a little bit as far as rivers like the Chess are concerned. So for the future, we're going to be continuing doing our flow measurements. Um, it will be very interesting to see how we uh, and what, to what extent we can see the effects of the abstraction reductions from Affinity and in the future from Thames Water. Um, it's also going to be very interesting in the longer term to see what is going on with climate change and maybe also other things such as HS2, whether we can detect any effects as that comes into construction and operation. So I think you know, with the team of people working with the Environment Agency, we have been connecting together a, a useful data set. Um, we've got a nice comment from a very appreciative Environment Agency, uh, and it's very good that we can feed information into them and feel it's going to a good home where it'll be really valuable uh, and add to the uh, archives on, on flow and feed into studies. So I think that's probably my closing comments and I'll hand back to Alan now. Thank you very much, James. That's a fantastic um, presentation. Um, and I think a real illustration of just, a, 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 we've sort of roughly stuck to one river really through the three presentations, but um, it shows just what a breadth of expertise that there is out there and how much effort is going into monitoring um, our water environments. And that's, that's just sort of one river uh, that's replicated across many of the rivers in the Chilterns. It's building up a really detailed picture of how these rivers um, function uh, and what the pressures are and what impacts those pressures are having on these precious river environments. Um, and I think it's also an indication uh, too of just how much people love these rivers. Uh, and, and being, you know, as a chalk seams project, it's been really pleasing for me. I've taken great um, uh, satisfaction out of the fact that we're helping to um, uh, citizen science groups to, or in local groups um, to understand their rivers um, better and to train them and to give them the technique, the, the expertise that they need um, to, to sort of um, kind of explore and find out more about their rivers and to use the data that they have um, to call, you know, as evidence to call, um, you know, sort of uh, for um, greater protection of these rivers. And it is paying dividends, you know, the abstraction reductions um, that have been announced very recently, uh, not only on the chess, but also on uh, the River Y, uh, and also the, you know, the efforts now looking at reducing abstraction on the Ver uh, and uh, also on the Misborn, I think are partly a testament to, to the fact that the local communities and local groups and people like James um, care so much about these rivers and are doing so much um, to protect them. Anyway, I'd like to thank um, both our speakers, Kate and also James for speaking today. I hope you've enjoyed listening to what they've had to say and maybe even enjoyed what I had to say as well. Um, just a, a, as a, mess a message to everyone, we've had loads and loads of questions come in um, and uh, I'll stick my hand up partly as we're being responsible. We're running slightly over time. I got rather enthusiastic about those creepy crawlies, I did warn you, um, but um, we haven't got enough time really to do the Q&A now. What we are doing though is every question Question, we, we've recorded those, we are going to answer those questions and we will make those answers available either via our website or we will um, send them direct to all those people who have asked those questions along with the presentations today and from all of today's speakers um, so that um, you can read them at your leisure um, but rest assured uh, your question uh, hasn't gone off into the ether never to be seen again, uh, we will respond. Thank you very much for listening today and I'll hand you back now to uh, Nick um, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Alan, thank you very much. And thanks also, James and Kate, an inspirational session again, um, just showing the range and the diversity of, of opportunities for, for citizen science and a difference you're making. And I think the key takeaway for me is just the impact that citizen science has on a local level. James, you were saying then around the, the, the abstraction um, changes and things, actually the, 
the understanding the data presenting an evidence-based case really helps in in making that impact and making that difference on the ground so so thank you for your session thank you all for your efforts out there in the rivers with your waders on um week in week out it really is making a difference so some logistics we are running a little bit over as alan says but we're hoping we've, we're kind of getting ourselves back on track so we're conscious we haven't let you had a lunch break yet or um or get up to have a, a wander around hopefully you've been making teas and coffees and and as we've gone through but we suggest that we we, we um hand over to to wendy morrison for her session at five to two so 13 55 we'll start again so if you want to stretch your legs uh, make a sandwich have a cup of tea um we'll start again at five to two okay thanks everyone we'll see you back in a little while
Hello again, everybody. Well, thank you for rejoining us after your lunch or your, your comfort break. Um, it's five to two. I'm very pleased now to, to hand over to a colleague uh, at Children's Conservation Board, Wendy Morrison, um, to lead you through the next session. So this morning and early this afternoon, we focused very much on wildlife and on, on our chalk streams. Very different um, change of tack now, I guess, but still very much staying the same theme of the, the incredible value of citizen science with, um, with some, well, genuinely groundbreaking, and uh, Wendy, I don't want to steal the thunder too much here, but some genuinely groundbreaking work um, in the heritage sector uh, in which a number of citizen scientists are involved across a range of different streams. So, so Wendy, I won't um, steal any more of your introduction. I'll hand over to, to you to introduce yourself and your session, but um, picking at the, the, the citizen science world and the heritage side of things. So Wendy, all yours. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, thanks everyone for coming back from uh, your extended and lengthy lunch break. Um, <laughs> What I would like to do, uh, we've got great speakers in this uh, next session um, on heritage. Uh, we've got Dr. Ed Pevler, who's my colleague on the Beacons of the Past project. We've got Samia Hansen, who's running a variety of heritage projects. And we've got Nigel Rothwell, who is one of our very dedicated citizen scientists um, to be sharing some of his experience. So rather than take a lot of, um, uh, of time away from uh, there are probably much more stellar presentations. I'm just going to take a few minutes and sort of tee up um, the overall Beacons of the Past project. So, as Nick said, I'm Wendy Morrison. I'm the project manager for Beacons of the Past, hosted here at the Children's Conservation Board and funded uh, partly uh, by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, when we think of citizen science for heritage, it might be... Um, there might be sort of a, a disconnect with the idea of archaeology being science. Uh, what we've heard this morning has been something we more traditionally think of science, data gathering for uh, wildlife, for ecology, for, uh, for river monitoring. Um, we might consider an archaeological excavation the gathering of data as well. And, and Britain has a very, very long tradition of what used to be called an amateur tradition or volunteer archaeologists going out to the field and conducting or participating in excavations. And that, that has a long history going right the way back uh, to the 1800s. Uh, and of course, we still do rely very heavily on volunteer uh, work and engagement with uh, research and community excavations. And that's one type of sort of citizen science data gathering, um, extracting data literally from the ground. But if we want to think about archaeology as being uh, more than just a, a social science or humanity and think of it as, a, as, as, as maybe a proper or harder science. Um, we can also do that uh, by looking at the other forms of data uh, that are available to work with. And in this case, thinking perhaps a bit more about uh, geospatial data. Um, there have been, I'm going to see if my screen share will work here. Um, possibly. Hopefully that is working. Um, Really bad when the chair can't get the uh, presentation to run. Um, <laughs> best laid plans. There we are. Hopefully that's working. Um, yes. So there have been uh, some forays into citizen science uh, in archaeology, most recently the work of um, uh, Lawrence Shaw down in New Forest National Park, or Gary Locke from the University of Oxford, Ian Rolston from the University of Edinburgh, um, who uh, drafted armies to help them either manage or interpret um, archaeology on the ground. The Hillfort's Atlas project, and we heard earlier Ollie talking about an atlas of plants, uh, which drew on, uh, on a variety of data. We have a Hillfort Atlas that was put together by Professor Locke and Ralston, um, which uh, sort of um, provided information about over 4,000 hill forts across Britain and, and, and Ireland. But this really relied on citizen scientists going out into the field, looking at a hill fort and marking down what they saw about its condition, about its morphology, all of that. And I think to some extent, Beacons of the Past has grown out of that, uh, that project because one thing that was, was really highlighted by that project was um, how little we knew about Chiltern's hill forts. So for those of you that don't know what a hill fort is, I, I could talk for hours and won't. Um, but here's an artist's reconstruction of uh, what a hill fort might have looked like. These are late prehistoric, so say 1100 BC to around 400 BC is the sort of um, period of their construction in a variety of different uh, formats. Um, some of them were lived in, some of them were defences. Uh, the name hill fort is kind of misleading because they don't have to be on a hill and um, they don't have to have been used as fortifications. Um, it's sort of a catch-all. Um, we know very little about them, particularly about the ones in the Chiltern. So the idea of this project, Beacons of the Past, was to 
learn more about them, not just as standing monuments, but where they were embedded in the, the landscape of the Chilterns, that prehistoric Iron Age landscape. Um, before we go on to sort of the, uh, the main citizen science part, there are lots of other um, volunteering opportunities that have occurred on the ground, the more traditional sorts of uh, volunteer uh, engagement, uh, which is conservation work. We've done a lot of outreach to schools and to uh, communities with uh, pop-up prehistory events, and we do a lot of training. So here you can see some images of us um, training in the use of GIS. You've heard about geographic information systems from a variety of talks today. Um, so we've been training our uh, volunteers in how to use open source GIS, uh, also in survey and recording techniques. But probably the biggest thing that the project has wanted to do is learn more about those prehistoric landscapes. So the Chilterns uh, area of outstanding natural beauty is about 800 and I'm going to get that figure wrong. So we'll just say more than eight and less than 900 uh, square kilometers um, in size. It's a lot of area. And in that area, there are something like 18 uh, hill forts. But within that wide landscape, um, we know very little about the, um, the prehistoric archaeology into which uh, those hill forts sit. And from this map, you can see all the green bits within the AONV are um, under deciduous tree cover, which means the traditional trick of flying over with an airplane and hanging out with your camera and looking for where a parch marks show up the archaeology. Um, it's not really quite how we do it, but um, it, uh, it means that aerial archaeology uh, prospection uh, can be a bit tricky because everything's under a tree canopy. So the jewel in the crown sort of of this Beacons of the Past project was to conduct a LIDAR survey and my colleague Ed's, Ed is going to come on uh, in just a minute or two and tell you all about um, LIDAR, how it works and what we've done with it. But essentially we flew the largest high resolution LIDAR survey ever flown for archaeological purposes in the UK, not just the area of the AONB, but beyond as well, to encompass 1400 square kilometers. It is a massive amount of LIDAR data being covered. And what LIDAR allows us to do is see what is uh, in the topography of the ground underneath the trees. Um, we, we decided to use this technique after my colleague uh, realized that pushing the trees out of the way to see the archaeology was not the way forward. Um, so there you see uh, Ed in a root plate of a tree, and now I'm going to hand over to him, and he's going to talk to you about the masses of data that the LIDAR survey has produced and why citizen science is so vital to help the two of us go through something like 64 billion data points. Ed? Okay, over to me. Um, and share my screen, the usual thing. There we go. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Wendy, for the introduction and for teeing me off uh, to move from Beacons of the Past as the wider project into uh, the uh, citizen science elements and the LIDAR element in particular. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail today because we don't have huge amounts of time on exactly how LIDAR survey works. Um, but suffice to say, suffice to say um, LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging, so the acronym is very similar to the acronym for uh, sonar or radar, similar techniques that you may have come across before. Um, it is a survey technique using, using pulsed laser, lasers essentially for mapping the topography of the landscape, um, and we can do this very, very accurately and at a very high resolution and, as Wendy said as well, covering a very large area relatively efficiently. Um, and as you mentioned, the Chiltern survey is at 1400 kilometers squared. So you can see in the bottom right there, a map showing the coverage that we have with this survey um, over the Chilterns A, O and B and beyond. Um, and the survey is at 25 centimeter resolution. So this means that we have a measurement of the height of the ground surface for every square 25 centimeters across that 1400 kilometer squared area or 16 measurements for every meter squared on the ground. So if we go back to Chris right at the start this morning talking about his meter quadrat being thrown down on the ground, we've got 16 data points of the height of the ground uh, in each of our meter quadrats on the ground. Um, I've also put on there the uh, little green splodges that Wendy showed you a second ago as well, um, which of course is the tree cover of the Chilterns. Um, the Chilterns have got about 20% tree cover, which is, which is double more or less the average uh, for England as a whole. And LIDAR survey is a fantastic technique for us because it works even underneath vegetation cover. Um, so you can see in the bottom left there, a sort of schematic uh, that vaguely shows how uh, our laser pulses, even if part of a laser pulse may reflect off the top of a tree canopy, 
um, the way this technique works is we can detect multiple reflections from each of our laser pulses. And so the hope is that part of lots of our laser pulses will still make it down through the vegetation down towards uh, the ground surface. Um, so we can detect multiple reflections from each laser pulse. And on top of that, we're sending out an awful lot of laser pulses. So the kit we used was sending out 2 million laser pulses every second that they were flying over the Chilterns. Um, so getting fantastic uh, uh, coverage across the whole of the AOMB and loads and loads of readings, as I say, um, of where the ground surface is um, across our area, across our landscape. And when you're nice and zoomed out, then we get data that looks a bit like this, um, the kind of stuff that Alan, just before us, gets really excited about. You get to look at all the beautiful drainage patterns um, of the Chilterns dry valleys and chalk stream valleys um, in there. Obviously, from an archaeological point of view, we can't see a great deal here unless you're that interested in the course of the uh, M40 uh, coming in down the bottom here. But what we need to do, obviously, is, is zoom in a bit further. And when we zoom in, we start to get fantastic data showing uh, the archaeology in our landscape. So in this case, this is one of our lovely hill forts. This is Charlesbury Hill Fort in Buckinghamshire, um, showing up beautifully in the LiDAR data. So you can see the lumps and bumps of the earthworks of, uh, of this Iron Age archaeology. Um, so a great big ditch uh, and a bank on the inside of that around most of the circuit. And here on the southeast side, um, a double bank and ditch as well. So lovely view of um, this kind of archaeology. Hill forts look particularly good in LiDAR data. Um, but why are we using system science and how are we using system science? Um, so LiDAR data sets uh, have been used by archaeologists since about the year 2000 uh, for, uh, yeah, as I say, for archaeology. Um, but so traditionally, until relatively recently, these have not been particularly accessible to the public. That has changed quite significantly uh, in the last few years because the Environment Agency have been flying LiDAR data over, the plan is the whole of England uh, by the end of next year. Um, and they have started to make that data public now um, in more sort of easy ways. Um, but even so, the environment agency data is only at one meter resolution. So you get far less detail. You can see far less archaeology in it. So it's not quite you know, as much use to us as archaeologists. Um, and then the other element to that is that uh, it still needs a bit of sort of technical know-how um, in downloading, the, finding the data in the first place, downloading it, processing it, and then sort of loading it into programs that allow you to um, query it for, for archaeological sites, essentially. So there's kind of a both an access uh, to data barrier and also then a sort of technical and, and um, software uh, barrier as well that might make this kind of data traditionally relatively inaccessible to the public. Um, but the why we want to get it out there is because the public are hugely knowledgeable about the kinds of things that will be showing up in these data sets. And this is something I hopefully will show you uh, in a second. Um, so we wanted to give the public access to our data because we wanted to harness uh, the fantastic, well, A, work ethic and B, um, knowledge that's out there in the community um, to help us with this data set. So why are we using it? Number one, definitely help. Um, we had 1,400 kilometres squared, as Wendy said. This is the largest survey flown in the UK for archaeology. Um, it is vast and it has thousands and thousands of archaeological sites hidden within it. Um, there was no way that Wendy and I, between us, were going to be able to, to sift through all that data uh, and find everything that we wanted to find. Um, so number one reason is we wanted to, to harness the assistance of the public um, to really help us crunch through all this lovely data. Second reason, you know, the more... Uh, the more fun one is we wanted to share the data. Um, it's just a fantastically exciting data set with so many brilliant and interesting and new things hidden in it. Um, and so as kind of one of the key outreach aspects of this project, we really wanted to get other people enthused, teach people how to read this data, how to use these data sets uh, and get them joining in the fun, essentially. Um, third reason to use it, uh, to use system science in this way is to do something that's actually pretty new. Um, so as far as we know, there hasn't been anything like what we've done uh, on this scale for archaeology. There's been um, one of the key projects that sort of inspired us uh, was the work of Gary Duckers um, at Gloucestershire County Council, where he sort of ran a trial of um, putting LiDAR data online in a way that allowed members of the public to sort of help him um, find archaeology in it. But this was on a relatively small scale, uh, a very much a test case that we then used to, to scale things up to this great big 1400 kilometer squared uh, survey. Um, and then the fourth reason why I wanted to use it was it, it's fantastic for engaging people, um, people from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of different uh, groups, young people, older people. Um, it's really, really exciting. And by having it online, it's meant that we, we can reach people 
not just in the Chilterns, not just in this country, all around the world, really. Um, in particular, in light of the pandemic and the lockdown that we all went through from, from March, um, it's also been a real saving grace for the project to have something that's online and people can do from the comfort of their own homes. Um, hopefully, I like to think that we've given people some good distractions, whilst otherwise we might be getting quite bored, uh, not being able to go out and do what we might otherwise be doing, riverfly monitoring or anything else. Um, so some of the reasons why we wanted to, to get citizen science going with our LiDAR data set. Uh, and there's two main ways that we've got people involved. Um, the first one is what I think is probably true citizen science. And this has been um, inviting everyone and anyone to log on to our portal, our citizen portal down here in the bottom left, um, and record what they think they can see. Um, so this is really trying to take the biggest possible sample of kind of public opinion as, as we can, uh, because there's all sorts of different viewpoints out there, different interpretations of the data. And by, you know, gathering all this huge amount of data coming in, we can, um, you know, start to see patterns that might come out of it. Um, so that's the sort of true citizen science element. Um, obviously, from that, though, we're creating loads and loads of data that, again, makes even more headaches for me and Wendy in how we deal with it. And so we've also been embracing citizen science, um, training up our, our core group of reviewers um, who have access to a sort of higher level portal on the website um, that allows them to assess all the the citizen records coming in, so there's red records in here, um, and turn those into our relatively high quality, um, you know, final master database, our master records, as it were. Um, so those are sort of the two main ways we've been embracing citizen science. But as Wendy touched on, we've also got sort of more traditional approaches coming in that allow volunteers to get out and get involved in the project. Um, field checking, so getting out into the into the landscape and um, checking what we think we can see in the LIDAR versus what we can see on the ground. So we did start off program of this back last winter, obviously rapidly curtailed by, uh, by the pandemic, but we're hoping we can get back out again uh, this winter. Um, and we also have a number of volunteers who are taking on individual sort of research topics and, and, and projects uh, from within the data as well. And I think Nigel, who's gonna be speaking at the end of the session, will hopefully tell you a little bit about his work on that as well. But how's it been going? So we launched the portal uh, 14 months ago in August 2019. And in that time, we've had over 10,000 citizen records sent in. So we're really, really pleased by that. Um, huge amount of gauge, engagement, excitement, um, and just loads and loads of fantastic data that's been sent in uh, from our willing volunteers. Um, that review team that I mentioned, our sort of more trained review team, uh, they've been doggedly working through that data since about January through all those citizen records coming in. Um, and in that time have created about 3,700 of our master records in our master database. Um, so fantastic work continuing um, to this day as well. Uh, another great sort of statistic headline that we can put in there, over 3,750 hours have been spent working on the portals by volunteers. Um, so that's over six months of sort of 24-7 work. Um, so we're hugely grateful uh, for all this time and effort and commitment that uh, loads and loads of our volunteers have put in. Um, a really key thing and what we'd really hoped for, and it, it's it's you know far surpassed our expectations, is the local knowledge that comes out um, and the insight and the recognition, the skills that come out from our volunteers, from our community. Um, it's people who have lived and worked and studied the Chilterns for decades, um, obviously have a far better grasp of the kinds of things that are in the landscape than, than me or Wendy can ever have because we, you know, we've only been in post for, for two and a half years, three years. Um, so fantastic local knowledge, fantastic local connections, people who say, well, I know the farmer, you know, I go down to the pub with him every week, um, or I'm, you know, I, I'm in a community group with the landowner there. Um, and so they can ask questions, oh, what's, you know, have you got any ideas what's going on in this land? They can make contacts with people, we can start to uh, link up, join dots, um, and really enhance what we're able to get from this LiDAR data set, which in itself, on its own, is a relatively difficult data set to interpret and to sort of spot the archaeology. in. Um, so that has been really, really fantastic. Um, just a couple of graphs for Chris Packham's sake again. Um, graph of uh, registrations on the LiDAR portal since we launched back in August. Um, you can see we've had, uh, you know, as you'd probably expect, uh, spikes and troughs all the way through, uh, particular spikes at launch there. Um, when we got into the, the Times newspaper, got a good spike there. Um, and since lockdown began sort of uh, back there in April, you can see we've had really good sort of consistent high level of people logging on, um, uh, signing up to, to help us with the project. Um, similarly, a sort of graph of daily work on the portal. So how many 
this is measured by clicks on the mapping so how much time and effort people are putting into sort of looking at the data and and recording features and you can see again in the 14 months we've had obviously peaks and troughs areas when i guess people managed to get outside and 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 have a bit of a break from being locked down there in sort of august september but in the height of lockdown in particular you know really good peaks there uh people using the time being stuck indoors uh, to hopefully do something that they enjoyed uh, and certainly is really helping us with mapping archaeology across the Chilterns. Um, as I mentioned, whilst the majority of people might be in England and in the UK, they go 83.4% of our volunteers um, in the UK, uh, but um, also really, really satisfying to see people logging on from all the way across the world, from Hawaii to New Zealand. Um, so you know, it's been fantastic to, to, to see that kind of engagement, enthusiasm for, for our little Chiltern survey. Um, just to finish with some of the um, really good stuff coming out of the data. Um, this is a really fascinating site, one of my favorites, um, that we had no idea what it was until a volunteer came and spoke to us. Um, so this is just near Bullbourne in, in Buckinghamshire, sorry, in Hertfordshire, just adjacent to the Grand Union Canal. Um, what this interesting square thing is, is it is a prototype um, inclined plane uh, canal barge moving system. Uh, it was the prototype for, for one that was eventually built at the Foxton Locks in Leicestershire. But what it what it was built for is, is for moving canal barges up and down without having to uh, put them through lock gates because A, that was slow and B, that wasted lots of water. Um, and so how it worked was you had a system of pulleys essentially with two caissons or sort of containers that the canal barge would uh, steer into and then it would be uh, lifted up on a little trackway system to the top of the hill and another case on with another barge on presumably would would, would go down um sort of uh, in sort of in, in, a, in a pulley system essentially and this was the prototype built before the construction of the real one at fox and locks in uh, 1899 i think so a really really interesting bit of relatively late recent archaeology um that we would have never been able to identify without the help of our volunteers um Going back in time a little bit, uh, some of the fantastic stuff coming out of the LIDAR. Lovely stripy areas here. This is up um, in Buckinghamshire, just off the north edge of the Chilton's Escarpment. Um, fantastic ridge and furrow, so medieval ploughing, kind of stuff coming out of the data, uh, next to Great Big Water Treatment Plant. Um, there, so modern archaeology and, and medieval archaeology. Uh, some other fantastic sites, these are down in Oxfordshire. Um, if everyone can make out these interesting sort of rectangles in the landscape, these are um, enclosures, ditched enclosures, and we think from their morphology that these are uh, probably either late Iron Age or Roman in date, so probably late Iron Age rural settlement farmsteads essentially. Um, we're working with a local society, SOAG, South Oxford Archaeology Group. Um, they're running a project looking at the whole of Goring Heath Parish here, um, and they will be getting out hopefully once uh, pandemic allows and, and pending discussions with landowners, etc., uh, to investigate some of these sites a bit more fully that have never been recorded before, have been found completely uh, from scratch with the LIDAR data. Uh, and then a site, I'm sure Nigel may well mention this shortly, uh, one that uh, Nigel was heavily involved in, in uh, finding and assessing. Um, Coming through the middle of here, this is Hodgemore Woods in Buckinghamshire. Uh, that little white stripe down the middle there is the line of a uh, length of Roman road that we had no idea it was here in the Chilterns beforehand, uh, and probably the line of the Silchester to Verulamium Roman Road. So a really major Roman road that until this project, uh, the, that, the line of that road was mapped several kilometres uh, further to the southeast. Um, so it's been fantastic to get volunteers in here finding this stuff and really helping us to write new stories about the landscape of the Chilterns. Um, just to finish with the really exciting one, um, the one that uh, we sort of dreamt of, but had never hoped that we really would find. Um, we have indeed found a new Iron Age hill fort in the Chilterns as well, with the help of our citizen scientists. Unfortunately, we can't say very much about where it is um, because we we're still working with the landowner to ensure it gets protected, etc. cetera. Um, but really, really exciting, um, something new you'd never have thought in, in a landscape that's a sort of walked in and farmed and as busy as the Chilterns, that something quite so significant would have gone hidden uh, until now, until the LIDAR came along and really helped us un unravel that story. Um, so just to finish, um, there's still plenty of time to get involved. So, so please do come and join the fun. Um, the website to register on is chilternsbeacons.org. I think this will be emailed out after the, after the um, conference has ended, but um, just there, childrenspeakings.org. You just have to register. There's tutorials on there in, in sort of how to read the data, how to start to try and identify features as a forum so you can discuss with other people who are looking at data, you know, ideas about what things might be uh, as a news and a blog that I occasionally update. Um, and then the, the data is there under the citizen science portal. 
Um, got our mailing list uh, on the Children's AMB website. Um, and I run regular workshops, training sessions, talks, uh, and our mapathons where we all get together and just discuss a lot of our data, discuss any interesting sites that have been coming up. Um, so please do come and join in if this is the kind of thing that you'd be interested in. But thanks very much for listening, and I'll hand myself back to Wendy now. Hi, Ed. Thanks for that. That was absolutely fantastic. As you can probably all tell, um, Ed's the brains behind this outfit. Um, he gets to do all the fun stuff, all the... Uh, the uh, online engagement since, uh, since lockdown. Um, and as he says, yes, it's a fantastic opportunity to understand a bit more about um, the unknown archeology span of the Chilterns. So there's stuff coming out all the time. Um, and what that's doing is helping us contextualize the, the landscape that the hill fort set in. Um, Ed showed you some of those enclosures. I mean, those are very likely to be late Iron Age, early Roman uh, settlement enclosures. We've seen late prehistoric field systems, which tell us that the old narrative that the Chilterns was sort of this thinly settled space in later prehistory probably isn't true. So it's very exciting to be able to work with citizen scientists to uncover more of um, the past of an entire landscape and, and, and tell new stories about it. So we really are grateful for the citizen science input. Um, we're going to move on from Beacons of the Past now to another fantastic heritage project, uh, again, hosted by the Conservation Board and funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Uh, this is run by my colleague, Sam Johansson. And Sam's going to talk to us about a variety of sort of um, really sub projects, but other projects um, that uh, are under the aegis of the Chalk Cherries and Chairs Landscape Partnership Scheme. Sam? Hello. Is that working? I hope you can hear me. It sounds like you can. Um, so share my screen. Yes, I hope you can all see that. Um, I am the Heritage Officer for the Chalk Cherries Chairs Landscape Partnership. So the heritage stream comprises about six projects there's a couple that almost fall into it and some that kind of work alongside it um, and they can kind of be broken down into two main themes and both themes um, are engaging with citizen scientists and the citizen scientists are kind of crucial to their um, running so we've got social history um, which is kind of looking at the written record but also oral histories and things like that and then landscape archaeology so looking more one of them is looking more at the people, one of them is looking more at the landscape itself. Um, and yeah, they, they are crucially um, reliant upon um, our volunteers. We've got Woodlanders, Lands and Live, Woodlanders Lives and Landscapes, which is the kind of key um, social history um, project at the moment that's running. Um, and that's really focused on the written record and the oral record that we've got of the people living in the Chilterns over the last couple of hundred years, particularly those that are working in the um, chair making industry and the straw plaiting industries and the other small industries like timber beading. Um, those people who weren't working on the farms but were making their money in other ways. Um, and that again, like, like Ed has been saying, it, it's entirely reliant upon people who know stuff. Um, I personally can't write the whole project myself. Um, Helena, who is running this project for me is, is brilliant, but it's not a one person project. So we've got this fantastic group that have managed throughout lockdown to be um, really working on everything they'd already got and digging into the written records that you've got in things like the censuses to really start to understand the families that were involved. Because it wasn't just one person um, we're not kind of looking at the history of one man or one woman. It's a whole family industry. Um, and it's really nice to be uncovering those stories. And that's produced some really nice video and some really nice um, written pieces so far. Um, so we're really hopeful that in the next couple of years, we'll get to do the other side of the project, which is to collect some oral histories, to interview the people who are still um, knowledgeable about this because we still do have people alive who remember these industries when they were high and flourishing. Um, so yes, that is social history and the other kind of broad theme is landscape archaeology and that is um, looking at the landscape. If you look down in that bottom right corner you'll see um, there's a small map there that's kind of showing a bit of what's going on but basically we're looking at um, Grimm's Ditch is the kind of key big one. Um, in terms of earthwork 
And then there's another project that's even larger, but more kind of um, loose, which is looking at the historical routeways. Um, and I think if we click again, you'll see a map. This has not got the historical routeways on it because we don't know where they are. That's the kind of key focus of that project. But this map is kind of showing you where our focus is at the moment. So all these circles are what Woodlanders Lives and Landscapes is looking at. So that's the social history. And then you've got the nice um, sections of Grimstitch there highlighted in dark red. Um, and so again, the Grimstitch is one where we can do the archeology span work, but we can't do it ourselves. We need more people. And so um, it's a great opportunity for these citizen scientists who might be working on all sorts of other things to come and have a go and get involved in what is one of the more interesting earthworks that's got so many questions and so few answers currently um, for us to play with. Whilst if you look at that map, I'm sure you could, if you knew where a sunken lane was, you could point me out a sunken lane, but I personally don't know where they are. So we're incredibly lucky to have the beacons of the past project and the LIDAR that they've produced to kind of model this roots to the past project on to look at how they've run things and kind of build on that um, because though we can kind of look at the lidar and say yes there's one there's another this one was there it takes people who live here and walk here to really let us know what they can tell us about this so i did a walk yesterday in which several stories that i would never have found out came up um, about some of the sunken lanes around Coombe Hill that had I not met these people to um, take them around this place, I wouldn't know. Um, and no one else will know unless they get shared. So the aim of that project is really to try and get those stories that are in kind of the current public mind, but not publicly available um, somewhere that everyone can look at them and everyone can start to work out where the best sunken lanes are. We could have a competition and all sorts of things to try and work out who's got the best, who's the most interested. Um, and there's one other project, which is kind of a little bit of citizen science, but also just that trying to engage public in um, really caring for the landscape again, which is focused on the River Y. Um, and there's a whole element to that, which is we need to, we can do some digging and really understand the history of the Y as an industrial river, but it's got this huge potential also for us to really connect back to the environmental side of the Y um, and try and repair some of the damage that's happened by it being dug into the ground in Wickham and really disappearing from the main stream of thought. Um, but yes, I just would like to say thank you to all the people who are currently involved and the fact that we've still got three and a bit years to do more um, investigation means that we will really have a lot of opportunity to um, learn even more than we currently know. Um, and I think that's about it, really. Okay, thanks for that, Sam. Um, so yes, um, you can see there are some, some significant overlaps between uh, the application of LIDAR data and getting citizen scientists involved, but Sam's projects are also delving into um, social history and um, really getting to grips with um, the lived in uh, uh, landscape of the Chilterns. So there's a lot of potential for that project, whereas we at Beacons of the Past are winding down into our final year. Um, Sam and the Chalk Cherries and Cherries uh, Landscape Partnership, they've got uh, several years in front of them. So um, for any of people listening that are, are Beacons of the Past volunteers, when, when, you've, uh, when you've lost us, I hope you'll roll over to, uh, to, to Sam's projects and continue to hone those citizen science skills um, that you have uh, acquired working with us and for which we are very grateful. Uh, and among those citizen scientists who I know is already involved in both projects and, and many more besides is uh, Nigel Rothwell, who's going to talk to us now a bit about his experience with citizen science. Over to you, Nigel, thanks. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, and, and that makes me a little bit sad actually to hear that uh, uh, we're into the uh, the last year of uh, of the the beacons of the past project. Anyway, good afternoon and uh, thank you to the Chilterns Conservation Board for hosting this event. Um, I'm going to give you a break from slides for a few minutes and mostly talk about my involvement as a citizen in uh, the Citizen Science LIDAR project and perhaps flesh out some of the reasons, Ed, for making this a citizen project. 
So, of course, my thanks need to go too to Wendy and Ed for having been such great stewards of the beacons of the past. Um, and, of course, enough to invite me to share some of my personal perspectives. Uh, and thanks also to Sam, as, as we've heard, these projects are very much interlinked. Now, the concept of citizen science, as we've been hearing today, encompasses a pretty broad and diverse range of topics. And I'm probably going to broaden that a little. For the LIDAR project, the citizen element opens up the world of landscape archaeology for anyone to access and to dabble in. Hold an existing passion or whether or not the subject is, uh, is, is new to you. And being publicly accessible, this enables what otherwise might have been considered to be an elitist subject matter to be much more democratic and inclusive. That seems to be particularly apt in the context of heritage projects, as our heritage is a con consequence of the contributions of people uh, and their legacy in our landscape and our cultural history. Understanding that legacy is often hampered by lack of hard factual evidence and is open to interpretation. So projects such as these, through enabling what we might consider to be something of the, the wisdom of the crowds, can facilitate a more insightful and collective contribution. This element here is the use of, uh, of the laser scanning technology together with the geos geospatial in integration you know, in the service of archaeological and landscape investigation, combining that with the archival documentary sources. So whilst we might be applying scientific study and recording of observations, we also need to be aware that the science label can, and as and Chris Packham alluded to this this morning, can be a bit intimidating and, and risk putting people off which is quite unfortunate as these kinds of public engagement projects rarely require any specialist knowledge. And non-scientists, you know, might be surprised to hear that science itself is rarely objective. There's scope for all of us to participate and hold a view. And there is a great opportunity to use these projects for something of the subconscious or sub subliminal education of the science in the world all around us. So the acquisition of LIDAR data, for instance, is founded on the science of optics. Fortunately, though, in order to participate in this LIDAR project, the citizen scientist needs only to be able to interpret a grayscale and to recognize patterns, simple as really. So what we are really doing here is creating, in making observations under the guidance of the professionals and making an initial attempt at interpretation. My own background is in geology and I started my involvement in citizen science through simply image-based projects on the internet. So I've investigated things like the presence of fossil bones on lake shores in Africa. I've mapped ejector fans from impacts on the surface of Mars, and I've hunted asteroids. And much of this is simply about pattern recognition. So from there, it's only a small step, or was only a small step for me to, to look at bacterial growth on Petri dishes, count penguin poo in the Antarctic, and perhaps a spoiler alert there, you know, satellite images show there to be many more, many more uh, emperor penguin colonies than had previously been thought. Then there's also projects that transcribe burial records of World War I soldiers, of criminals deported to Australia, and all of this is available from the comfort of your own armchair. I think it was Megan who noted this morning that the thing for everybody and hopefully, actually, when I think about it, thinking about everybody, hopefully we've all signed up for the Zoe King's College COVID-19 science, where we, the citizens, are the data. And I've particularly enjoyed those projects that are cross-disciplinary in nature. One launched earlier this month aims to investigate the historical relationships between humans and the natural world. It's run by uh, the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam, it's on Zooniverse. It aims to categorize animal and plant species in the museum's art collection. So there in one project, you've got zoology, botany, and, and art history. And of course, I probably ought to mention that other science platforms are of course available. But when I think about my involvement in those projects, those sort of mass participation projects, if you like, on the internet, 
my own effort has often been quite transitory. When a new project's being launched, it's, it's engaged my curiosity. I may log on a few times and, and participate a little bit, record a few observations. But then my interest wanes because there's not an awful lot of reward beyond that of satisfying that initial curiosity. And I think in large part, that's because many of these projects, the citizen scientist is just adding processing power and sometimes quite literally because you're enabling the training of an artificial intelligence neural network of some sort to do the job. And my experience of the beacons of the past project is, is really quite different. And as Ed has said, it's probably quite unique in the, uh, uh, in the sphere of citizen science. There have been other less ambitious LIDAR projects, North Pennines, South Downs, one quite recently launched in the Weald of Kent, but there's been nothing to any of our knowledge, I think, that's combined the scale of this project with the scope of its knowledge sharing and outreach aims. And so to illustrate this, I thought it might be useful just to con contrast a little. So I'll first highlight some of the similarities between the LIDAR project and other internet-based citizens projects. So perhaps most obviously, as citizen science, it's open to all and therefore like most projects, it doesn't require any prior knowledge or expertise, but an interest, a curious mind, um, observational and pattern recognition skills, very helpful. A computer and some spare time are necessary. And like most projects, it's aimed at sifting through this massive amount of data that Wendy's talked about, recording observations, processing large volumes of material to allow others more knowledgeable ind individuals to focus on what is gradually being kind of honed down to become a screened and high graded data set. For most of the internet based projects that are available, that involvement can be fairly passive. You know, citizen scientist looks at an image, makes a mouse click or two, moves on to the next one. And each of them, it's quite a lonesome and individual endeavor with little opportunity for interaction other than perhaps through a chat box to raise a question or a few queries. With mean, those projects, they're convenient and accessible, but they don't provide very much by way of feedback. The reward perhaps there then comes from involved in somebody else's research project. You've learned something new and you spent a few minutes stuck in the supermarket queue or waiting for the bus or the train. If you can remember, um, not simply just clearing Twitter feed, but actually making a contribution to progressing human knowledge. But the LIDAR project's very different. People to the projects, I, I would guess, is local curiosity, an interest in the Chilterns. Uh, um, Michael Pocock talked this morning about the importance of sense of place. And um, perhaps individuals come with some particular historical or landscape uh, in interest. And I, and I guess, you know, much of that applies to the audience here today. But as Ed has said, you know, we've had some international participants and I did notice that somebody joined from Connecticut last week uh, and they are perhaps are interested in the archeology span or maybe the opportunity to work with uh, uh, the world-class LIDAR data. The LIDAR project then is accessible and therefore it's democratic. So range of people volunteering their time to the project and I met them both virtually and in the real world from students to a range of diverse professionals and retirees to farm laborers and I help run a young archaeologist club here in the Chilterns and we've used both the project website Ed and Wendy's support to introduce this as a topic to a younger age group and they're typically aged between about eight and 14. So we've introduced the science of LIDAR um, and introduced, used it to support the work that we're doing on um, teaching them and getting them involved in uh, understanding the wealth of heritage in the, in the landscape around us. And actually we found the youngsters to be brilliant at this. They've got really powerful observational skills and are quite quick to, to work out how to interpret the data. And I know that's just one of the many community outreach opportunities that the project has facilitated. Ed and Wendy spent a lot of their time dealing with talking with local community-based groups. 
So the LIDAR project then, whilst fundamentally requiring pattern recognition skills, does require a bit more commitment. The citizen scientist needs to register and access a website, need to invest in some basic learning, but the tools are all there. Be prepared to make a few more mouse clicks to digitize a feature, to record some text associated with that observation. But then for anybody keen enough, you might want to do your own bit of research, consult and cross-reference some of the other documentary sources that are available in the public domain. And definitively, the project offers scope for much greater collaboration. Ed's talked about the contribution of individuals' knowledge and their insight, actually engaging with a community of practitioners in online workshops to really influence the interpretation and the documentation um, and for obtaining feedback on what we've been doing. So this is not just contributing to building an anonymous database, but it's actually providing some real feedback to the participants, which in itself is its own reward. And then for those wanting to deepen their involvement even further, there's the opportunity for more research, uh, making a direct material contribution to the knowledge base, um, the opportunity to be part of the team of re reviewers that, uh, that, that Ed had, had mentioned, looking at screening and validating the citizen scientist contributions. So, so this is an effort that isn't just a preserve of, of a handful of professionals, but actually, you know, if you've got a keen interest in the landscape, you yourself can get involved in the reviewing stage as well. And then there's the opportunity, given the richness of what we're finding in the landscape, opportunity to get involved in further spin-off research projects. Um, Wendy said you know, the funding for this runs out in a year or so's time, but actually to be there forever. Um, and hopefully there'll be lots of opportunity out into the future for people to, to, to really pull this apart. So Ed mentioned, for instance, uh, um, I've been looking at Roman roads quite recently, um, particularly uh, uh, spurred on by the, that, that stunning example that we've seen across uh, a, a stretch of ancient woodland there. Uh, but I've actually taken that further and I've been trying to trace out all the Roman roads and the routeways across, across the area, automatically working through the, the existing evidence base uh, and then using the LIDAR to confirm and to qualify and to, and to improve our understanding of those. So whether it's participation in the project at the database entry level or at the next level review stage, then the project offers substantially more reward than a typical uh, internet based science, citizen science project. Um, and therefore it's perhaps no surprise that the involvement with interpretation of the, uh, of, of the online data has fostered something of a community spirit. So we've seen that enhanced communication and engagement across both lay contributors and also the more learned groups of uh, local archeological and historical societies, as well as my group of young archeologists and uh, other educators. And more than once it's been mentioned today that during this extraordinary year, when uh, um, 19 has restricted the movements of us all, involvement in this project and the online communities has also provided an additional um, and much welcome uh, focal point and a mental health boost. And again, that was something that, uh, that, that speakers this morning uh, mentioned. Dimensions beyond a more conventional citizen science project. Um, and these, these, these initiatives that Ed and Wendy have been driving support ongoing contribution, uh, contributor engagement. Uh, if you like, they sort of foster an element of stickiness and, and, and commitment. So as well as Ed running um, regular uh, fortnightly or monthly uh, um, mapathons, these are sort of online meetups, if you like, to foster the exchange of ideas and discussion of problems. He's also held skills training workshops, and he mentioned um, earlier field sessions and practical work groups when we were able to do that pre-lockdown. And those things have included uh, um, skills development in surveying, round truthing observation, as well as helping with site cleanup and, and restoration. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there's no coincidence then that there's strong cross-participation in these heritage projects. You know, participants in one project being motivated to show up and, uh, and participate in others. Uh, in, in many respects, uh, many respects, then reward begets reward. 
and that brings me to something Chris talked about this morning, uh, and that's the question of motivation. You know, place and these heritage projects in particular. Most people will probably say that they value the opportunity to make a contribution in some small way to furthering the science and advancing the knowledge, particularly where that relates to the community and the landscape within which they live. With heritage projects, there's also a thrill to be gained from what you might consider to be the chase, almost the Sherlock Holmesian investigation and analysis, pursuing the other strands of information that are available in the public domain, pulling together an, an interpretation that no one else has made, and by so doing, influence the experts, perhaps discover something new. Along with that comes learning and self-development, the sense of achievement, and I think, of privilege of participating in something useful and important. And I'm not going to ignore here the convenience that citizen science projects offers. Precisely how much of your, your time you volunteer and, and over when you choose to do so. And perhaps one final observation then. The more vested in the in any project, but particularly I think in this LIDAR project, the more and addictive it becomes. But I don't think many of us would be participating to the extent that we have done if we didn't also find it to be immense fun. More than one participant has, has, has noted on numerous times. It's a, it's a very enjoyable and constructive way to waste a bit of time. Not a lot of the LIDAR data to be interpreted. And when we look ahead, think about the long winter days coming up, probably another coronavirus lockdown ahead of us. Please do, do help us get stuck in. And on that note, I'll finish and hand back to Wendy. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that, Nigel. That was a fantastic synopsis of the project and your involvement and a really nice assessment of um, all the different um, bits of the project that um, have uh, appealed to you and obviously to many others. Uh, I would like to say that I did not pay Nigel at all for that massive endorsement for our project. Um, it's been a pleasure to deliver the project and of course we look forward to the next year as well, but it's really nice to hear that it's got that strength of legacy behind it as well and that there are people that have learned skills that will go on to do other things with their citizen science skills and carry on um, the investigative work understanding this landscape which is absolutely amazing. Thank you very much for that, Nigel. Um, I think we have a few minutes left and I think Nick has queued up a couple of questions that have been submitted. So let's see which one of us lucky panelists get to answer it. Yeah, thanks Wendy. So if I address them and then you can choose where it's best to steer them. So a number of questions coming through, um, quite a bit around the LIDAR and how genuinely groundbreaking the LIDAR work is. And I think grouping a couple of questions together about it, it, where, where do you see it going in the future? I mean, it sounds like, um, well, your citizen science work is really uncovering all kinds of various bits. I sound, it feels like we haven't really scratched the surface. Where do you see it going in the future? That's a really good question. Um, uh, apart from the fact that LIDAR isn't groundbreaking at all, um, <laughs> it just bounces off the surface. Um, so yes, it is a lot of information that we've recovered. Um, it's a lot. Of, it's it raises more questions um, than it answers, and that's really a good thing. Um, what we are hoping is that even though this project ends, uh, a lot of the local groups that Ed mentioned, such as the um, SOAG, and we're working with groups in Marlow and in Berkshire, um, if we um, can inspire them to take on pieces of research based on, on the data, then that's that's part of the, um, the, the, the legacy and the usefulness of that data going forward. Um, we're looking at a variety of different avenues for seeking out funding for spin-off projects, if you like, um, because it does seem to be a shame to have this massive body of data and not be able to, um, I suppose the word is exploit, but um, to, to, to build upon it um, and, and to really increase our knowledge further. So although the remit of this project is to understand our hill forts and their, their contextual place in the landscape, um, there, it, it's obvious that there, as Ed pointed out, um, multi-period uh, opportunities um, to, to do further investigation. So that's kind of where we see it going. We see it being picked up hopefully by interested um, research students, uh, university projects, um, somebody who would love to fund Ed and I to do more. Um, <laughs> but Ed, would you like to comment any more on that or? I think just just to add that another key use of the data is it's it's going to be archived with the local historic environment records, the HERs, who are kind of these key custodians of all the data of you know 
uh, archaeology across our counties uh, that mean it's not only accessible to the public and to researchers, but it also gets taken into consideration with regard to planning decisions um, so that we can you know, try and make sure that our archaeology gets protected as well as it can as well. Fantastic. The question, I guess, is probably directed um, more towards Sam, if that's okay, Sam, on this one. Um, quite a bit of conversation around Grimstitch and so the project around the mystery of Grimstitch, but um, what's your hunch? What's your hypothesis? People are kind of asking what, what we think, okay. what, what's our kind of starting thinking about why, why Grimstitch is there and what it does? So, so there's kind of, there's several questions. One of the big ones is, is it all one thing? Are the sections within Central Shortens all one thing? Um, how old is it? What was it for? Um, those are probably the three big questions. And it would be nice to almost answer one of them. My current aim and I think the, the leading aim of the project right now is to try and look at that funny little tiny bit um, that's sitting in between the two long continuous sections. Um, I'm, I want to understand why there's quite such a big gap and if we can either prove that that gap is actually a gap and that funny little bit is not the same as the rest of it, um, that might allow us to then think of it as two separate sections of two separate earthworks that instead of running all the way along the Chilterns, run along the tops of some valleys. Um, if actually it turns out, oh no, you can really trace it really well. Um, we, we've got the LIDAR data, which makes it even easier to look at some of this, but we're gonna have to do some boots on the ground survey work as well. So that's kind of the first step is going to be in that valley, um, which has also got the HS2 running through it. Um, so there'll be some work done on that section, um, but we're hoping to look at the environment around that section to look and see if we can see it continuing. Um, because yes, I would personally quite like to prove to myself that it's two separate things rather than one massive one. That's my thinking. Um, anyway, we'll see. I'm sure Wendy and Ed have opinions as well. It's all linear earthworks. We see lots of linear earthworks in the Chilterns, and I think there's a whole project that could be done to look at more than just Grimm's Ditch. We don't have to just look at the ones that are named. Um, yeah. I'm not exactly Andrew Mara. I've not drawn you into anything now, but no, thanks, sir. And, and I guess one last question, which I think leads nicely into the, the closing session of the day, really. Um, we're about to talk about um, how young people get involved and how they've got involved, I guess, primarily with citizen science from a wildlife perspective. But how, how, how's the world look for, for young people getting into to more heritage um, sectors? How, how would a 15, 16 year old who really wants to get in? What, what would be your kind of top tips to, to get involved in, in some more heritage projects? Right, well, we have had a, a lot of interest from young people um, back when we could still have our pop-up prehistories and open days. And um, we had a lot of um, sort of interaction with not not specifically that older age group as well, but also younger younger children, key stage one and two as well. And Ed and I have developed a series of um, educational programs that go into the schools and introduce archaeology quite early on. Um, we're hoping to make a lot of those more virtual and online uh because of obvious obvious reasons. Um, I think the idea is, and as Nigel will know, because working with the young archeologists, um, get, get them while they're young, get them excited, make them realize prehistory isn't really dull. Uh, it can't all be um, knights in the medieval period and, uh, and, and Romans crashing about. So we wanna get people interested in prehistory as well. It's about um, making, making the past real and connecting to young people's lives. So it's not just saying, look, this is stuff that happened you know, 2000 years ago and, and you have to learn about it because you have to appreciate it. It's more saying that 2000 years ago, there was a little boy or a little girl working here and grinding flour and making bread. And, and, and you have to think about what you eat as well, don't you? And thinking about where you lived and where they lived and making that human connection. So I think you start young there by educating about, um, about history and archeology span and embedding it in the landscape um, like projects like this do make you feel the lived experience, that human experience that we're all just part of another, uh, another link in that chain. So um, it's really about education and access really. Um, and we have had a lot of um, uh, young people involved in the project already, even on um, some of our excavations, some of Nigel's uh, YAC people, Young Archaeologist Club people have come and excavated with us back when we could still excavate. Um, so yeah, I think the future is very bright really. Good stuff. Thank you, Wendy. Um, if, it's, uh, if you're happy there, there, there are probably one or two other questions, but um, okay, so in terms of time, if you're happy to, to maybe wrap up and... Um, yep, that's, that's no problem at all. Brilliant, um, a great session.
Any questions that didn't get answered, we're quite happy to answer and have um, posted on, on the website. And I'd like to just thank all the speakers. Thanks very much for all of that, especially Nigel, for that rousing endorsement. Your check is in the post. <laughs> thank you very much. Great stuff. Thanks again, Wendy. And thanks, um, Nigel and Sam, for your, your session era. Yeah, why did we said a wide and varied programme at the beginning of the day. Um, and, and that's what it's proven to be, really. But inspiration, the breadth of opportunities are just are just huge. And, and the impact that those kind of work brings is, is fantastic. So thanks, guys, for um, for your for your session there. So moving us on um, again to the last session of the day and arguably if well, probably not arguably, actually probably the most important session of the day, um, given that uh, we're kind of wanting to well, in 10, 15 years time, who's going to pick up the mantle? Who's going to be out doing the, the bird surveys or the LIDAR work when the likes of, of myself and others uh, have, have kind of hung up a monocular really. So I really want to move into a session that, that um, John Shaw from Chiltern Rangers is going to chair for us. And John, thank you for your um, your time here. If you don't know the Chiltern Rangers, definitely suggest looking them up. Inspirational organisation, um, doing some great work with young people with disadvantaged groups, getting them into conservation. And I think, Arjun, you mentioned this morning, the best way to get young people involved is to get them involved. Well, John and the work of Chilton Rangers are doing exactly that. That's pretty much their stock in trade. So, so John, I'll, I'll hand over to you to introduce yourself and the session, but um, you've got an inspiring group of young people with you for the next hour. Um, I hope you enjoy it. John, over to you. Hello there, and thanks very much for that endorsement and introduction, Nick, very kind indeed. Um, yeah, I'd just like to, to welcome you all and to, to the panel uh, of uh, young people in front of me. Um, We've been having chat in the lead up to this to really try and uh, understand some of the drivers for these young people to get involved in conservation. Um, and, and it's it's quite an interesting mix uh, of people we've got. Now, just so that you, you understand that they're not all from the Chilterns, they're from uh, around the country, some of them, uh, some are local as well, um, but they've all got different interests uh, and are getting involved in lots of different ways. Um, I'm just going to bore you, I mean, uh, talk to you quickly a bit about me and what I do um, here at Chilton Rangers um, and how I also got involved in this thing in the first place. How on earth do, does one forge a career in the conservation sector? It's not necessarily straightforward, but it, it can be done. Um, we've, we've got to really seriously address this. We've heard from, frankly, the master himself, Chris Packham, in terms of engagement. 59 very surprised at his age although when you think about it at my age and he was my really wild show sort of guru back in the day so perhaps I shouldn't be so surprised but nearly 60 is uh, is quite impressive he alluded to it a few other speakers have done throughout the day we've got a gap we need more people we need young people at the bottom of the chain to come up through to be the new naturalists the new scientists to engage other people because it's really important that we pass the mic, to use a, a commonly used phrase. There's no point older people like me trying to directly get young people engaged. We need them to help each other. So there's lots of what we call peer-to-peer -peer mentoring gonna happen and that need to happen to, to basically get people going, to get people infused. We'll all be aware of, of Greta and her fantastic work. Start off as one person sitting down in a square in Sweden, not the warmest place to sit down with a, a, a placard. Fast forward two years, and there are millions of young people around the world getting engaged in these kinds of things to raise the profile. So the appetite and, and the interest undoubtedly is there. This morning, Megan alluded to one of the problems that, that young people face, and we'll come back to that a little bit later in terms of how we actually get people uh, involved. So we'll think about that throughout, throughout this. If there's questions, we, you can pop them up and we'll try and pick those up as we go. So just a very quick overview of me. Uh, we, we founded Chilton Rangers in 2013, so seven years ago, and as Nick said, we basically exist, as it says, to get communities engaged in the environment through conservation. In that order, we, we're, we're quite particular because without the communities, the conservation stuff doesn't happen. We need to mobilise people in lots of different ways, uh, and we try as many different ways to, to do that as we possibly can. So what we want to do is to give people that platform, take take over the platform of, of talking about things to actually doing stuff, getting out there and getting hands on. I started off by being fascinated as I explained to the, to the uh, panel when I was at primary school and a, and a chap, can't remember his name I'm afraid, brought in a fox and a barn owl to assembly, not at the same time to be clear, but to see 
the wildlife as such they were rescued but that to see them in the flesh opened my eyes and just lit a fire in me that that has burned ever since i was also very lucky i lived in tyler's green near high wickham here in the center of the chilterns uh, me and my family grew up running around in common wood um particularly in the autumn and winter summer was was reserved for cricket naturally enough um but but this hands-on experience i think is, is really quite important and something that might might come out as a thread let's see as we go along so so that's what i did and what i do now is uh, I, I run this small social enterprise that hopefully gets lots of people engaged practically in hands-on stuff which is really really important but also giving people the platform to to do some stuff in terms of the citizen science um and i'm a massive fan of of i record app um and, and i used it you know i actually used it this morning whilst listening to some of the speakers um, putting some of the recordings in from my session on thursday because i hadn't had the time it's part of the beauty of using tech that we can do all this stuff and record everything so that's sort of what i use um you know the eye records brilliant because whether you're a beginner and you just want to track the robin in your garden or the holly blue that you see either of those things are equally as, as important as a, a rare vagrant uh, bird that you might see on your local patch uh, as you watch that perhaps so those are the science sort of things that we we're going to be looking to to talk to and talk about sorry um so i want to sort of run through a few different parts to, to the panel we're going to start now um i'm just going to pick a few of them at random and work through and i want them to start by explaining what they do uh how they've sort of been introduced into into conservation and citizen science and we're going to make a start with maya hi everyone. my name is maya i'm an 18 year old birder wildlife photographer and all-round nature lover so I started when I was about eight years old. I actually started by watching Spring Watch. Uh, so I saw that on the TV, saw Chris Packham and all presenters like that. And it sort of really engaged me. And I started going out to my local parks, went to my local nature reserve and picked up a camera, uh, started photographing the birds that were coming down. So I used to wait for hours trying to get a good picture of a great spotted woodpecker. Um, and from there, it's sort of grown. I've especially over lockdown, I've really sort of broadened my knowledge. So getting into all types of nature, like dragonflies, butterflies. I'm also a trainee bird ringer. I have been for the last five or so years. Um, and I'm a garden bird watch uh, survey ambassador for the BTO. Lovely stuff. Thank, thanks, Maya. It's a, it's a lovely broad breadth of things. And I think that's one of the important things as well that, you know, you don't have to do one thing, you can sort of touch on different things throughout the year. So that's, a, that's good stuff. Uh, I'm going to move move on now. Magnus, can you tell us a little bit about your story, please? Yeah, so um, I, I just started, uh, I had a sort of general interest in nature from when I was quite young. And I just went on one day to an RSPAB event. Uh, at Farnham Heath actually which is um, pull a pine so I just thought oh yeah I'll get a Christmas tree out of this and this will be fun but it really sort of sparked um, my enthusiasm with nature and I actually getting to talk to the wardens there got me um, on Sunday work parties which I've been doing now for the past probably four years um, and it's really sort of just having someone there on the work parties go what's this in my lunch break if I go out and just see what's on the reserve and that really, really progressed my um, sort of love for nature. It's really interesting to hear you talk about that. I think that's one of the things that uh, as a sector we need to really focus on in, in so much as your first way in was actually through an organised event. In this case, it was it was an RSPB event. And I think that lots more events where people are encouraged to, to rock up and take part, that's their first step on, on, the, on the pathway. Um, but obviously what we've got to do is to make that really widely understood and known. And, one of the per sort of perpetual challenges frankly is actually how do we get the message out so that's something we'll think about whilst we go through the, you know the remaining part of this section is how do we get our message across into the ears of the people who we really want to see out there and how do we make uh, sessions like the pull a pine uh, available and work that's a that's great stuff cheers magnus um okay i'm gonna ask for one one final uh, question of charlie charlie can you tell us a bit more um about uh, the sort of the citizen science side of, of of your story as well and what you monitor and look after at the moment please yeah so i'm charlie i'm 17 and live in wiltshire just south of, south of social plain um generally i get involved in the BTO's webs 
um, so Wetland Bird Survey and BBS, the British Bird Survey. Um, I also use eBird regularly quite a lot and then also help out the Great Buster project on Zorch Plain as well. And I think having fantastic, you know, big reintroduction programmes like the, the Busted Project, it, it must be quite a cool thing to be involved with. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like a really well-recognised, nationally known um, reintroduction project. And it's, it's quite nice people asking me about it when I go out birding beyond the county, etc., asking how they're doing and whatnot. I think I think that's that's really important. It's that whole, you know, no matter how old you are, you know, your knowledge and the and the work that you do as a volunteer or or, or whatever, it's, it really has great value, um, and that that's to be recognised and uh, to be able to impart your knowledge and, and your experience and, and frankly the passion for for those birds and your patch onto others is really important. So that. John, John, you've somehow put yourself on mute. Sorry, yeah. that's better. Clang, yeah. technical error. Um, for, for the next part, thanks very much, Charlie. For the next part, we'd like to really uh, think about how you individually got actually got started. Um, we've already alluded uh, to, to spring watch, think, things like that being, being an important part. But I'm going to go across to Finley now. Finley, can you just tell us um, how you got started, what or maybe who um, helped you get along on those first few steps? And Finley, I think, being your mood is Finley, yeah. So quite similar to Magnus, actually. Um, I have always been interested in nature, but what really sparked it is going along to an RSBB work party at Haysley Heath, um, which I started for my DOV, actually. And just since I started that, it's really sparked my interest in birds and all wildlife. I remember like one particular work party, the warden came up to me and he was like, can you see if you can record some more um, insects for the reserve? Uh, and I got completely stuck into that and I haven't stopped since really. So I think that's one of the things that we need to all take away as well if we work in the sector is to not be afraid to ask those questions because often people there are interested in, in some way, shape or form. And maybe actually if we just ask that question, can you just, and, and then give you, empower you if you like, give you permission to go off and look at stuff, that, that might be, the open door you need would that be fair definitely yeah um since i've been into all this entomology stuff i've asked so many people so many questions and it must get pretty annoying but i've never had anybody not answer something they're always willing to help and to give you advice and tips and i think you're starting to get into sort of some of the characteristics of of the people who care because they care that you care that's brilliant they also care about their subject and their speciality and I think we all recognise that we need people to kind of come and take the baton from us uh, and carry on. Also, we all like to explain the, the differences and the subtleties and because somebody would have taught us. It's really important that sort of mentoring or guidance, whatever it might be, it doesn't have to be a formal mentoring programme. It can just be somebody who you know knows. Um, you know, one of my go-tos is, is well, there's, I've got a couple, to be honest. I've got Martin Harvey, who spoke earlier, um, um, on all things tiny, uh, Nick Bowles on the butterflies and, and uh, Paul Watts on all things birds. So you've got lots of different go-to people to answer mm. your questions. I think it's really important that we, we all make better use of that. And if we have that knowledge, it's time to really make sure we give that back, I think. Yeah, definitely. I, as I said, um, everybody is willing to help. So just go up and ask these questions and you'll be amazed by what you find out. That's smashing. Cheers. Thanks very much. Um, OK, I'd like to ask the same thing to you, Ruben. Um, Ruben, I know you're uh, very much into plants, which we've not talked so much about in this section. So if you'd like to take it away, please. OK, so um, I was I originally got into all this through birds, as most people. It was I, I suppose I started maybe age eight or maybe a bit earlier. And it was but I kind of got into birds through looking at kind of picture books, essentially. Of, mm -hmm. I would go around my grandparents, I would see the kind of dazzling, dazzling illustrations in all these old 50s and 60s bird books. And it was exactly the same with gardening books. So I sort of sort of grew to realise how much there was out there. I guess maybe this was a bit earlier than six. It was a sort of natural progression from dinosaurs. Um, but yeah, um, so I, I realised I really wanted to get out and start looking at these, kind of working at how they correspond to what I'd I've read about and yeah through family I've got 
I mean, not the most opportunities, but thankfully I, I live in a really good area, sort of South Norfolk. So I've got so, so many habitats near me. A real and, hot spot. Yeah, I've always been able to kind of get out and start recognising what I see. So, so, so at that point, that getting out bit, was that with family and friends or, or was that on your own? How did that actually physically happen? So through family, I'd always kind of been outside. Yeah, I'd always been on walks, but then I think by myself, I'd got enough independence that I could just go for walks around the village and find things. But I, yeah, it took it took me going to specific events to join organisations. I was, it was a completely kind of insular thing at first. And I think that's fair enough as well. You need that insular sort of interest to build and then eventually get that confidence to, to take that first step. But then when you do, it's really important that when you go to these events, as the, the other two have alluded to uh, already, that there's that really friendly welcome um, and, and that people then can see that there's a young person and let's really make sure that we, we engage and look after them, and give them something to take away, you know, in one way, shape or form. That's great. OK, um, so on, on to the, the same question, I'm going to ask um, a, a voice we've already heard this morning, but Arjen Dutta, um, can you just give us a little bit of information about your, your starting points into what you do? So yeah, uh, uh, hi everyone. Um, like Ruben was saying about dinosaurs, that was actually oddly my starting point as well when my mum got fed up with me there and shifted me into birds through Big Garden Birdwatch. But after that, I would say my journey into conservation started through the National Trust, uh, like Finley with Duke of Edinburgh. And I think that's a really good way to almost promote nature for young people because everyone has to get involved with volunteering as part of it. and there are so many opportunities for volunteering in the natural world because of local parks or nature reserves that need volunteers to essentially run. Uh, so in a way, that was that was how I got started. And through that, I got opportunities to get involved with things like fire blitzes or big wetland bird surveys across the year. And as well as that, every time I go there, I'll be doing an e-bird checklist and also sound recording, which is something that I've got into this year. And yeah, there are so many different ways, but I guess reaching out is often a difficult part. And through the National Trust, I got quite lucky because uh, the young ranger scheme I'm part of, there's only five of across the country, which means it's not easy. It, you can just rely on luck on where you live, essentially. I think that's one of the big challenges that underpins a lot of the discussion that we've had today in this forum, but also throughout the day. And, massively funding and resources are an issue um, without question every single organization um, that we've all talked about would love to put this on more but there is this massive financial pressure uh, which has been obviously increased from from covid but as we look to build back beyond that i think this is where we have to really start to think about how we invest in in programs of events to, to actually get people out to work with schools and all those kinds of things nothing wrong with doing the dinosaurs um, either of course um, so um, just picking up on on what you said there about that that uh, young ranger scheme at the National Trust um, I'm, I'm because obviously you, you know you live um, in an urban area it, it, urban areas are one of those places that can be forgotten yet there's so many sort of hidden gems within them um, we're from High Wycombe here and we've got loads of small patches of green how do we get young people to, to be brave enough and to take those first steps to have a look in, into those places that are not classic nature reserves? Well, I think, as I, as I mentioned, Duke of Edinburgh is a very good way to start there because the idea that volunteering is necessary for that already means people are all almost looking for something. And the idea that often what happens, and especially at my school, is that they needed something. So they just went to a shop or a local, local charity shop. Well, if they actually did like the thought of nature, overcoming the barrier of, of it not being cool and things like that is still quite difficult. But I think education is very important in that, in almost showing how important nature can be for future generations. And yeah, just the presentation that it's, it is actually a good thing to do and the, the environment is really important. And I think that's I think that's really interesting. The fact that you know you've touched on it for, for the first time in terms of um, you know we have to admit sometimes that nature can be seen as uncool and a bit geeky, and that's and that's fine, but it's really important as well. So um, one of the ways I think is good to to overcome that is to actually get kids out and hands on uh, through their schools and things like that, 
give them tools, let them have a bow saw and a lopper and all the rest of it uh, and, and do certain things, but let, let them have, you know, dig, dig holes, plant trees. We've really got to empower, we've got to give young people those opportunities because you'll remember it forever. You won't remember every maths on a Tuesday or English on a Wednesday. You're going to forget that pretty quickly, but you'll never forget when you went out to, to the place and did the thing with, you know, the wild, you know, environment actually at the, at the core of your day. So I think that's a really fair point. Um, thanks very much. Um, final question on that theme, really, just to hear uh, as wide a um, sort of theme as we can. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Ryan to give us uh, his early experiences. Uh, and Ryan, we're going to come back to you because you're a little bit further along the line at the Hi, yeah, thanks, John. Um, so I'm Ryan, I'm from Ellsbury. And um, for me, it all started in my garden, um, starting looking at the wildlife there and especially butterflies. And from there, I realized how much wildlife there was in the garden um, and that that garden wildlife was really important to me just to be able to walk out the back door and see all sorts of species in an urban area. Um, and from there, I started talking to other people on Twitter and they had discovered they were interested in the wildlife in their garden and started um, something called the Garden Bio Blitz. And that involved people going out there and finding the wildlife in their garden and just learning about it and realising how important it was to them in terms of um, being able to see this wildlife. And I think that has really come through um, in the lockdown period as well. So um, it sort of, this interest sort of bumbled along and I wanted to become a vet like many young people do and um, discovered at university though that I didn't want to do that anymore and that wildlife conservation was really important to me and especially um, monitoring wildlife. So um, I started to, I'd already been recording wildlife in my garden at home, but then got really addicted to it and seeing how many species I could see. Um, and that was 10 years ago now and have just kept going and now have recorded over three and a half thousand species just going out there and spotting species and um, contributing to science. So I've now submitted over 40,000 records just by going out there and seeing what I can spot and anyone can make this, um, this significant contribution. So yeah, and I've now um, worked in this sector for a, um, a wildlife trust, the Beds Camden North Ants Wildlife Trust. There's a monitoring and research officer there helping um, people to get involved with wildlife recording and um, yeah. And that, that's no insignificant amount of records. Um, and, and I think this is this is the point that, again, previous speakers have been talking about. It really, and Chris was talking about it uh, this morning with the earthworms, it really can start on our doorstep and, and then grow as, as our confidence builds and our knowledge base builds and we can get get further further afield in doing those things. Um, that, that's, again, that's, that's really, really good stuff. Thank you. Um, so I want to get drilled down into the really stuff, the stuff that fires you. I'm going to pick, pick back with you there, Ryan. You, you sort of said that it's addictive. Um, and I think also that there's the whole nature meets tech thing as well now, which, you know, we're all, you know, connected like we are today through technology. There's forums on Twitter. There's, you know, WhatsApp groups and things like that. It's about sharing that knowledge. Maybe just uh, ex explain to us a little bit more about how, how that works, particularly as in relation to, to Garden BioBlitz, perhaps? Yeah, so I think the Garden BioBlitz worked because lots of people were spotting wildlife in their garden and didn't know necessarily what they were seeing. So um, Twitter really helped there because they could easily post a photo and other people, wherever they are, can help and instantly tell them not only what the species is they're seeing, but why it's that species and a little bit more about it. So that breaks down this barrier of not necessarily knowing straight away. And the thing, I, yeah, I want to point out is that everyone's on this continuous learning curve of, you know, we all are interested in wildlife and no one knows everything. So um, everyone, yeah, don't be afraid to ask those questions. And social media makes it really easy to be able to do that and connect with people that have different var various levels of experience. I think that's really, really important. I think even the great Chris Packham himself was, 
learned this morning from uh, about the common scotter that, that he had no idea was coming this far inland uh, because of Arian's uh, not migging to use the phrase um, recording so again which is where technology is becoming much more accessible to everybody and they can record stuff flying over whilst you're asleep it's perfect isn't it I mean how easy is that to get involved with um, okay, so um, I, I haven't I haven't spoken to all my panel yet, so I'm I'm very conscious of that and what working around uh, the, the room, as it were. Um, I want to just ask uh, Samuel. Samuel, can you just tell us a little bit about your story, um, uh, how you've got got involved, um, but particularly who has helped you along the way to, to get involved as well? So yes, um, so my story is quite interesting actually because I. When I was younger, I hadn't really left the city very much or I hadn't really been exposed to wildlife until I was about seven going on eight. And um, my great aunt took me out into the countryside and actually um, helped to inspire my sort of passion for wildlife. Um, and it's something that I've continued to this day. And um, it's because there was effectively, there were so many new things around that um, one of the things I remember doing is using this here, which is my old notebook, which has all my sightings from uh, all the way from 2008, all the way through to um, December 2016 in here. I've just been uploading this to, all to eBird as well. So it's quite interesting to relive through that. But um, using that notebook, I was uh, helping uh, with effectively citizen science without no, knowing it back then. But um just through watching the birds on the, the bird feeder and um yeah and doing stuff like that but move moving on uh four or five years um I then started volunteering at Rain and Marshes and um there's key individuals there that have helped to inspire me uh, such as Howard on reception and helped to keep me involved as well and um also uh, David Walsh who may many of the people on this panel will know as well uh, when I first met him at um, the bird camp in 2017, um, an amazing event for to help people like us get involved with wildlife and specifically bird watching. Um, he, his passion and, and enthusiasm for the natural world uh, has helped to inspire most of us in this call today. So it's, it's, there's certainly some individuals out there that are helping to bring forward uh, the I guess bird watching into the main frame. I think I think this this whole sort of concept of mentors and in, inspirational people in our lives is really important. Be that great aunts or people uh, like David or, or, or Howard, um, but don't underestimate the role that you all have in that process because you are already be, partly because of the power of social media, uh, but also for the fact that you're willing you're already willing to give back by coming to events like this and speaking openly and candidly, which is brilliant. Um, uh, it, it will really help to demystify and uh, the thing. I think it was uh, was it Finley, I think, said it earlier about not being an expert. And Ryan, again, was was talking about this continuous learning curve. It's so important that because it's ingrained in science, which is the right thing to be at one level, it can be seen as as really quite scary, I think, for first time people to, to actually just get out there in case they get it wrong and they get mocked for it. And again, picking up on what you were saying there, Ryan, about Twitter and the identification of stuff. I think that's a really, really powerful thing. It obviously clearly wasn't around when I was younger. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that we could actually learn and improve on is um, when we put our posts up is to actually say rather than say saw this today, and then just label it because sometimes we can put a little barrier in there that because we're assuming a level of knowledge and sometimes I think that that might be um, you know a bit of a barrier in its own right. I wonder what your thoughts on that might be Megan. Um, yeah definitely I think it'd be good to help people who don't have maybe the strong as strong as ID knowledge as other people because there are always going to be people new into the natural world who need that help and who want to reach out and there are millions of people millions there are loads of people on Twitter who'd be more than willing to help so I know when I first got involved um, I didn't originally have Twitter so all my knowledge came through my parents and watching documentaries like Spring Watch and that sort of thing um, but after 2017 bird camp like Sam mentioned 
um, I started up a Twitter account and uh, every time I sort of didn't understand something or wanted some extra information, I'd go to someone on there and they'd always answer me. Like Finley said as well, there's so such a support system online now. And that's a really positive thing to get that message out, I think, again, through uh, forums like this, that, that the support is there. You kind of, you're welcome, come in, you know, and, and, and learn and, and come on this exciting adventure with us. Um, Willem, I'm going to come across to you in a sec, because um, for, for those of you who don't know, why would you? I haven't told about it yet. He, uh, he's he's uh, local patch is, is in Norfolk um, and he looks after or helps to look after through some of the monitoring and the, and the conservation work he does. One of the one of the fantastic birds, sadly, really, really, you know, declining in that it's the turtle dove. So perhaps you could talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, hi, I'm Willem and I'm 17. Um, I have, I'm luckily enough to have a quite a big garden and um, we have a meadow in there. So I've been helping manage um, the meadow at home basically. Um, but also with that, I uh, help um, volunteer at a local um, wildlife trust. Well, I said, it's called Wheat Fen and um, they have swallowtails, that sort of stuff. So I've learned quite a bit from there. And the knowledge they gave me then sort of um, helped me manage the, uh, the meadow. So I love, been cutting it at least once a year sort of raking off all of the grass um, and so we get flowers such as orchids uh, we've also let the hedges kind of grow and I've laid some of the hedges and this year we luckily had turtle doves um, so yes yeah, pretty pleased with that really and I think that's that's one of the, the the really pleasing things isn't it that when you you do the work and you and you cross your fingers and you hope that what you are after actually comes. And when you then see the orchids come up, if it's bee orchids that have come from a bit of disturbance or whatever, then, um, you, you know, it's really pleasing for you to lay hedges and then get turtle doves. Big hat tip to you. Yeah, definitely. Um, and anyone can really do it as well. Um, I've learned from even like in the front garden, you should mow every now and again and stuff always pops up. So you can have the tiniest amount of garden and anything will turn up. Um, we've had like rare butterflies fly into the garden uh, such as clouded yellow and they come from the europe as well so you never know what turn up so you should always keep your eyes, eyes peeled really i think that's that's right and it's it's part of our our ways to well-being that you know to to take notice just to take time it goes back to again a common theme through today that people through covid lockdown particularly took time to listen rather than you know re really listen to the bird song this dawn chorus seemed louder than ever because there was less traffic and a movement of people um but it was always there. Um, and, and so, like you say, if you just keep your eyes and ears peeled, then, then you just don't know what, what might turn up. And that's, that's a really valid part of, of the whole sort of uh, situation, I think. Um, and trying to make good out of a pretty awful spring in, in uh, many other ways. Um, so I'm just gonna go around that back to you, Finn, at the, from the start. Um, I just wanna really try and distill down what you really love about going out into nature. What is it that, that you, is your real takeaway at the end of a session or the end of a season, mate? Well, I'd say one of the best things is that I'm just going out and finding so many things that the general public will just walk past and not even notice are there. It's just so great to notice these little things um, and like explore their world and see the world how they see it, which is an experience everybody can have, but not many people choose to. I think that's right and again uh, we slowed down this year didn't we a little bit and we we gave ourselves a bit more time to to take notice of of these things um that, that may have been hiding in plain sight but actually if it's not for the work of the hedge laying like the, that willem may have undertaken that actually they they won't be there so it's that kind of combination of taking time to take a look but taking time to make make the situation better um yeah. and that's and that's really good Go on. yeah definitely um so since lockdown where well, it's obvious I've had huge benefits and huge negatives but for me since lockdown started I've really got to explore the wildlife that generally I don't have time to look much into and um, so I bought a microscope and I took part in a couple 24-hour um, bird watches from the garden and it's amazing how much I've seen since lockdown that I would never have seen without it like a garden hen harrier in Berkshire was definitely a highlight and various that's um, a decent tick and, isn't it to be fair yeah definitely um yeah and all sorts of invertebrates i've recorded over 800 species in the garden since lockdown started so it's and amazing what's out 
it's exactly th yeah. those numbers that, that you and, and Ryan before you, uh, you know, were, were speaking of, you know, the, the scope and scale of, of, of our subject matter is really part of its biggest strength that you can find something that interests you, you know, and it doesn't have to be the mainstream, the obvious, it can be the small and the seemingly insignificant. But when we start to look in depth, as you say, we learn so much more. Yeah. And the great thing is you don't need a microscope to see most of this stuff. I just go outside and turn over some rocks, turn over some logs, and you'll be amazed by what you just see with your eyes. Yeah, for sure. That, that, that's the, cu the curious mind of, of a scientist is never f far away. Um, sorry, I clicked on a button by accident then. Um, OK, so I want to start to, to move our thoughts about how we've, we've had. We've had a couple of themes that have come through so far. I want to just to see if we can't explore that a bit further. We need to think a little bit more about the top tips that we can think of that we've either used to get people involved or that maybe there are things that we're not doing that we think we should be doing to get the message out there and to get people um you know of, of all ages involved but particularly for young people um, and i'm going to start with maya maya what are your thoughts yep so i think uh schools are a really good opportunity to really engage with the, the next generation so firstly at my school which is in an urban area i live in crawley uh, near gatwick uh, which has over a thousand pupils. Um, so I began to do a school wildlife garden project. So we had a little courtyard area and over the summer holidays, me and my friends, we sort of um, made it into a wildlife area. So I had support from the Camp Bespoke Trust um, to plant lots of wildlife friendly flowers, put insect houses up. And I really was able to engage with um, the school community on that. So I had a really supportive head teacher who wanted me to engage with uh, pupils because we live in an urban area and some of those might be uh, from disadvantaged areas who might not have a garden because not everyone has a garden um, and so that sort of area allowed them to see the birds that are visiting, butterflies, insects, um, all sorts of wildlife so I think um, getting schools involved like for, from my perspective I think in sixth form have an opportunity to um, take over and uh, really bring wildlife into schools, I think um, is a top tip. I think if young people can sort of get a project going like that in their school or try and get teachers on board, um, I think that'd be a really good idea. And uh, myself, I'm trying to get a project going to get a nationwide sort of scheme to get wildlife gardens um, in lots of schools, especially uh, disadvantaged urban areas. I think that is a massive opportunity. I think you're dead right. If nothing else, you get to reach lots of numbers of people. So you play the numbers game. And if you get enough people involved, then hopefully that that sort of uh, enthusiasm that you clearly show and that leadership that you, you know, even at your age in sixth form, that's that's really, really cool. And, and I think that's massively uh, impressive. We need the adults in the world to start adulting a little bit we need to start showing some leadership i think um and giving people the opportunities empowering them to, to do these sorts of projects brilliant um fair play to you for giving up your summer holidays but actually i think that there's a, a place even in the school day uh for for things like that to then happen because you know if we've got to move people from a place of completely not engaging into engaging we've kind of got to give them the time to do that as well um but i think you know as you, as you rightly say urban urban based conservation often is overlooked i think um but that's where we live 80 percent of us all approximately live in urban areas and that's where our first touch point with nature is going to be um and as finn said th there can be all sorts of stuff you've just got to take the time to look and if you need to create that space i think projects like like the one you've just described at school are, are, are brilliant so fair play to you for, for doing that uh, and thanks thanks very much for for bringing that to your school um Charlie, what, what are your thoughts on, on how we might get other people involved? Um, well, uh, similar to Maya, school is obviously a big part. But I also think social media, as, as mentioned quite a lot um, already, is kind of a massive factor because it's, it's kind of where a lot of children spend a lot of time these days. Um, so Twitter is obviously a big one. Um, but also things like WhatsApp groups, they can, be, they can be really good if you can get yourself involved in some of them um they can be really helpful for um or like id purposes asking asking any form of question 
and just general discussions. No, I think that's I think that's really really um, you know pertinent. I think uh, we're starting again. COVID and lockdown have really helped to speed this up. To uh, um, particularly for us organisationally, perhaps who are a bit more reluctant to to use tech and to work in different ways. And I think that we've got we've got used to a little bit more working with social media, particularly um, to to engage people. It's not it's not the enemy at the gate that it perhaps has been portrayed as actually it's a really important tool that we've all got to use uh, and I'll go back to iRecord I think that's a fantastic uh, easy easy way in for people to record stuff it all gets verified people again I think sometimes get worried about getting stuff wrong so we all get stuff wrong again that's the, the learning curve of, of Ryan's point earlier um, we've just got to be bold and, and, and record that because again it builds the picture um, and hopefully um, you know, the, the science trickles into the national recording schemes and places hopefully get protected and things get learned that we didn't know about before. WhatsApp is an interesting one. Um, perhaps, Samuel, do you have experience of, of uh, WhatsApp groups in your world? Um, yes, I do, actually. Um, we, we, we have quite a lot of WhatsApp groups going, actually, at the moment, uh, helping lots of different young people to get involved with uh, lots of different things, such as... Uh, there's moth groups, uh, visible migration groups, uh, knockmig groups, which Arjun helped to set up. Um, and uh, there's many more out there that are just there to help keep a community. Because one of the biggest issues that we have is that people have an interest in nature, but then don't see people actually sort of within an organization that is like themselves. So they don't see young people, they see people a lot older than them, or they don't necessarily see people just are generally like themselves so it's 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 it becomes a barrier and that's that's when people start to drop out because they don't have those friendship groups that they need to basically support them through um becoming interested in wildlife and without an interest in wildlife you're not going to get people coming forward to help with um citizen science that's that's really interesting that that sort of sort of organizations that don't reflect me what I look like would be that by age profile or ethnicity or ability sort of disabled people all of that stuff I think that's really important that we we look to grow that um I can tell us about the uh, whole not you you've been credited with helping to set that up and being a leading light in that tell me a bit about what it was that a you felt this is a, a good opportunity and then b how you made that actually happen or was it luck and that's fine too well I think one thing that's just about social media in general is that it is does build a really good community of young people and there are so many people on there now i would say if you counted young naturalists in the uk alone there are probably well over 200 300 people and i guess the idea of bringing them together and supporting each other is as important as having role models because like sam david walsh and howard have been really inspirational role models for me as well but I guess being able to support each other in group chats where we don't have mentors from older generations is really important too. And I think group chats like that, so we have a, a Visnik, a Visible Migration group chat, London Young Bird, there's all sorts of group chats like that. It just means that there's always someone that if there's an ID that they need help with or they're looking for information about where to go, there's always people there to support them. And I think that's just, just important in general, really, just having people that you can rely on because while I've got school friends, I'd say some of my best friends are now from the nature community, just from uh, calls online or just, yeah, building community through the uh, various organisations and WhatsApp groups, really. That's, 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 really, that's really interesting. The way that, you know, you're developing friendship groups with people across the country through common interests is, is yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. I'm, I'm quite impressed with that. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, I want to go back to something that Megan said this morning, actually, um, and move forward to some of the challenges that actually are really stopping us as, a, as the environment sector, um, getting young people out. Because there's one thing uh, out and doing the practical stuff, because there's one thing surveying it, and that's brilliant, but we also need to get people hands on with nature. Um, Megan, you cited this morning uh, about the, the challenge of transport. Do you want to just expand a bit about that? And if there's anything else that you think gets in the way? Um, yeah, so I know personally I've struggled to get out sometimes because I just can't drive. And so I have to rely on my parents and I'm not in sort of an area where I can get public transport either. So my only way out of my house is driving. 
um, which means that volunteering uh, opportunities are limited to in my local area. I'm lucky enough to have parents who do support me in that sort of thing, but I know other people don't. So I think a way of sort of overcoming that would be highlighting the social element of birding as well. Because if you get to know other people, then you can get lifts going groups. If your parents are worried about the safety element, then you can go in groups. Um, so I know there are some negative perceptions of birding as a hobby, but in sort of within young people. But if we can show that it's not just sort of, you know, there are young people involved and they're doing it together, there's sort of friendship groups in the social element too. And also um, sort of other than transport, I'd say a lot of young people don't know how to get involved in that sort of thing. They don't know where to find the resources. So briefly touching upon schools, which Maya said, um, it'd be good if, even if schools didn't directly engage, if they provided the sort of links and necessary information for young people to go and find things for themselves. So for example, the BTO website, there's a youth blog and then go from there. Or the Karen Bespoke Trust do a lot for young people. So even just providing them with a website link would be really good. I think I think that comes back to, you know, picks picks up a bit on what Maya was talking about earlier. We really need the the adults in in the room uh, to, to start helping and, and signposting because they have the platform to reach a broad audience um, through providing some of those links. And, and, and I, I put this to you all, really, um, is would do you think it would be uh, a reasonable thing to have the environment better represented in the school across the board in terms of bits of curriculum. I mean, it's one of the things I think might work, uh, but it, we've got to be able to give the teachers the ability and, and, the, and the space to signpost people to different things. Um, and maybe, you know, with, with the citizen science element, I'm thinking maths and science lessons might be a really good way to do that, perhaps. Um, I welcome any thoughts. Samuel, you just give me a thumbs up. Thank you. What, what are your thoughts? Do you want to carry that on from there? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, one of the things that, I mean, it's difficult because during school, certain things are talked about, but it just doesn't go into it within in with enough enough depth because it's sort of skimming the surface, if you like. I don't feel that anything. I mean, obviously, I, I I haven't said this, but I'm actually now at university, so I haven't been at school for a little bit of time. But um, it's 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 difficult to know where it would fit in. Obviously, there's this new natural history GCSE which is going to be, uh, well, is in the sort of drawing board phases, if you like, which is, is a great step in the right direction. But I sort of feel that there needs to be something lower down the school as well, because if you don't already have an interest, it's still, it is, it's still only going to be a sort of, uh, in, a sort of keeping or encapturing the people that are already going to be interested and people like us that are lucky enough to have that interest. So there needs to be another way of finding it out and whether that is through incorporating it into English lessons or um, math lessons or something like that, that's more actual, actually broader and trying to learn through that. I think that might be a way forward. Um, but yeah. No, that's, that's cool. I think, I think there's also a massive role here for the creative arts, um, you, you know, from traditional art and, and graphics and things like that, but through to more, you know, technological driven things as well, filming, photography and things like that, that, that have a, a role at certainly at GCSE and A-level. Um, but perhaps um, we also need to do that lower down the school chain, as, as you say. Um, I just want to ask Magnus, Magnus, what, what are your thoughts on, on how we might do some of these things? Um, well, I think that sort of getting people involved is really what's key and we really need to get people out onto reserves and sort of their local areas that they might connect with. And I spend a lot of my time sort of doing events with the with the RSPB, like upfront, having a stand and sort of communicating with people, say, just passers by and sort of telling them about the nature reserves, things that they might not know in a way sort of like as people have said, the people that really help them, like the adults that have spurred them on in their sort of um, nature career as such. Um, I think if, the, if you have that RSPB stand to ask the questions, I think that people will get much more involved in nature and they'll actually want to question and want to know more about um, what's actually going on around them. Yeah, and I'll, I, th I, think, I think you're right. I think that we, we need to just... Uh make sure we're even more active than we, we are. It does take everybody, it takes time to kind of coordinate events and put on things like that. Um, and it requires lots of volunteer effort working with the staff teams behind the scenes. But I think from multiple examples we've seen today that when that happens, 
people are listening people are ready they perhaps just need that push to get involved to take those first steps and and to feel supported once they've done that i think that's perhaps quite an important theme that's coming through be that peer-to-peer -peer as as young youngsters amongst youngsters or indeed with mentors who are more experienced passing that knowledge back down i think that's equally important and peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and, and and that that doesn't necessarily have to be old and young you know it's, it's it's experience you might have three or four years experience and still only be 20 years old and, and that's perfectly perfectly good um Ruben, I just wanted to come across to you briefly, if I may, sorry. Um, can, can you just give us a little insight on some of the challenges you think that we, we might be uh, encountering and, and, and what you think we might do about that? Okay, so um, we have to look at how most people get into nature, sort of how they become converted. So a, a lot of us just did it in a sort of same kind of insular way I did, whereas originally, but then a lot of people, mo I think the majority, the majority it took to they had to go to events it's it's all about networking it's absolutely a case of when when people connect nature stuff happens yeah no i think that's i think that's really cool so just picking up uh, one of the themes in the chat and um, this is a question uh, for both my and megan um so you can fight out amongst yourself who goes first um but basically one of the key things is how do we get more girls and young women involved in in nature what what are the key things that are stopping them doing um, so me and megan and a few others wrote a blog recently for the bto on this and i think there's a quite a few barriers um as you can see like from this panel, uh, there's fewer girls than there are boys involved, generally in birding. Um, not so much in the nature area, I don't think, but bird watching is definitely three quarters boys, quarter girls, I think. Um, but the barrier sort of safety, I think, is one thing, like wanting to go on your own somewhere, but having that threat of safety, I think, um, I think one thing we could do for that is going out in little groups. Groups of women obviously feel safe together. Um, and also like things like toilets, facilities, um, reserves and stuff. So it's not so easy for us, for us women. Um, so I think that is another barrier too that we have to get over. But generally I think coming together um, as women and going out in small little groups, uh, so bird watching walk or something like that can really help um, and forming them communities, whether that be over social media or through local groups, so RSBB groups, for example, I think that would really help. Um, yeah, so that's what I think. Lovely, that's that's really interesting. And, and I, you know, I totally hear you in terms of the facilities element. It's one of the big challenges that we find here at Chilton Rangers that we we want to take a big group of, of school people out for the day. And yet, where is the toilet, you know, and particularly if it's not a proper nature reserve with a visitor facility, then then that is it's definitely an issue um, and, and something we need to think about, um, particularly if the public loos either aren't very nice, frankly, or, or far away. So a real a real significant barrier, but not an easy one to overcome. I do like, however, the thought of using social media to pull people together and then go out um, and maybe that might be a, a way forward. Megan, what are your thoughts, please? I definitely agree with what um, Maya just said. And I think safety is something that I've definitely come across as an issue. Uh, but one thing that I personally did to overcome that is I start going out with my friends. So not only is that address the safety issue, but it also sort of is a way of getting people who aren't interested in uh, wildlife as such uh, to go out with you as well. So I thought that was quite a nice way of getting over that. Awesome. And, and how did they take to you saying, come on, let's go and watch birds for, for, for a morning on a Saturday? How did that go? Well, I did make a kind of compromise. I said, we'll go out in the morning. I did stock watching at College Lake with them as yeah. volunteering. I said, OK, we'll go out in the morning, but I'll go with you to London. We'll go shopping afterwards. So it's sort of a bit of a compromise, but we've still got to go either way. Yeah, fair dues. I think I think that's right. A bit of bribery and corruption never never hurt anyone, did it? So no, that's really, really good. Um, OK, has anybody got any other? We've, I've been through, through most of you. Well, I've been through you all t today so far. Have anybody got any burning thoughts or ideas about how we open this whole thing up and really get more people involved we've had we've had some thoughts about uh, mentoring about social media safety uh ruben your hands up so i'd, I'd sort of like to very quickly talk about id resources mm -hmm. so yeah please assume, so we assume someone someone's got outside they've sort of got into nature they're seeing things and i don't know may, maybe they can put them on social media as well but 
a lot of them will feel very restricted by the fact they might they might not have books they might not have they might not know where to go online it's I mean, there's so much information on there but it's, it's quite difficult to find at times so i suppose to, to anyone sort of watching this there's on the on the fsc website there's a resource an id resource finder i think if you if you search that on the yeah just google fsc resource finder it should come up with this website and it will let you find sort of online guides to pretty much any species group and then i think, I think you're right and, yeah. and and they're downloadable right yeah another good website is nature spot which i think a few of us use it's massive online collection of images and descriptions so that's that's online resources then in person there's sort of I mean, the other major major one is books, sort of hard copies of them. And I've I've been really lucky in that, kind of I've I've been through people I know I've been given a lot of books, and it, it helps so much just being able to come home, open open up a book, look something up, and know what it is. And then you can also through that you can also help other people. So I think people should maybe try and take every opportunity. It say if they have a kind of two copies of the same book. They should take every opportunity to distribute them sort of to other naturalists make sure no, everyone make sure everyone has access sort of be very altruistic with sort of books and advice resources i think that's a really valid point i think you know sometimes the temptation is just to keep keep everything and be the master of knowledge if you like and and, and, and treat it as yours but actually knowledge is ours to share um, and if particularly if we want to see more people like ourselves in in our sector i think that's really really key um, I picked, funny enough, I, as I picked up the FSC guides, because I, I think they're a really, really good step for young people. You know, they're laminated, so if you take them outside, they, they don't get ruined in the rain. Um, as you say, there's a, a good different uh, selection of, of species, but they're really easy to use. There's some great information on the back. And, it, and if that's the first step in gaining your confidence, then, then brilliant. You can download them for free or you can buy the laminated ones and they're three to four pounds. So really affordable. But maybe there's a takeaway for organisations like ours and, and some of the bigger ones to potentially um, somehow provide more of this uh, information, maybe for schools or libraries or other things. Would that be of interest, do you think? Um, yeah, definitely. I think if if every school had a small selection of guides, I mean, some of them would do already for the kind of mandatory GCSE kind of biodiversity subject. But um, yeah, if if every school had a small collection of books, even if one or two students use them, that would be great. And about about the FSC thing, a lot of it, it's not necessarily just buying and downloading these kind of charts. There's there's keys. So even if you want to get into a really tricky group, you can often find a key to maybe an obscure beetle family with like hundreds of members. So it's anything from that to butterflies and birds. Mm. absolutely and that's you know that's then you're starting to train the brain in real scientific sort of discovery and, and and that's the start potentially of exciting journeys that people like ryan have gone on to 10 years later there you are at the wildlife trust ryan yes so um i think the thing is looking at um a lot of people want to get into conservation as a career and um it's obviously a, a wonderful career to be in so i think that's the thing we need to think about as well, how we support people and show them that they can um, go into conservation as a career, including in um, monitoring and recording wildlife. So a lot of, um, obviously there's the habitat management side and a lot of that does go on on reserves, but also we need to make sure that our conservation work is backed up by this hard science and this, food, this feedback loop of informing the management on reserves. So, um, yeah, it's about enjoying it and showing people that you can um, develop careers in this area. And um, yeah, I think I think that's spot on. And I think, you know, one of the things that we have to work really hard on and and, and listen, there are all, all the big players are doing it, you know, having traineeships and, and entry level jobs. But, you know, funding for, for getting funding for those is always a challenge. But, you know, the, the need is is great and growing. Um, and, and I think this forum today, today's panel have shown quite clearly um, that we've got some fantastic young people out there kind of just waiting to get involved uh, and develop careers uh, driven by passion and knowledge 
and hands on science. Um, and so I wanted to basically say thank you so much to all of you for giving up your Saturday afternoon when you could have been out birding or, or watching the football or whatever it would have been that you might have been doing. But you've chosen to give your time, your expertise, your passion and your knowledge to us today. Uh, and so thank you so much to all of you for, for that time. Nick. John, thank you. Well, can I just echo your thanks? I've genuinely been blown away by that session. It's been absolutely fantastic. Your time and energy, your thoughts, um, your preparedness on a Saturday afternoon to give up your time is just, it's just inspiring stuff. It's brilliant. So, John, thank you for that. Um, what I would also add is this session didn't just kind of suddenly jump together. Um, we've had quite a few sessions like this. You've also given up evenings and quite keen to help shape the design and kind of shape the thinking of, of the session itself. So it's hopefully a session designed by yourselves for other people um, who want to hear your, your story. So absolutely brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you guys for, for that. And John, for your time too. Brilliant. So really we've Somehow, despite the, the jumpy start, so half past nine this morning, we've kind of got back on track and um, tech has played in our favour this afternoon, really, to to, to, to bring the, the, the session to close and ask Elaine, our chief exec, to, to say some kind of words of wrap up, really. Um, so, Elaine, I'll hand over to you in a sec. And then we, we did have a welcome video uh, that we tried to play this morning, but also didn't play. But um, we might finish with that as well. But, Elaine, if I can hand over to you to to pull together some thoughts from your, your take of what you've heard today. and um, and where we go next. Thanks all. So, you know, thank you to all of our sort of 29 or so speakers and hosts for today. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of messages that we can take home after this session. Um, and I wanted to particularly thank Nick and Wendy, of course, who organised this event and, and Lizzie, who helped behind the scenes. And without people like Nick, Wendy, Lizzie and, and the rest of our team, these events just wouldn't happen. So thank you very much to them and also to our audience for engaging so positively throughout the day. And I should also say that the National Lottery Heritage Fund supports a lot of our work. And again, this event wouldn't have happened without them because they fund quite a considerable amount of our work. So in terms of key messages, really what came across to me today was the passion and commitment of everybody involved and the sheer numbers of people and the amount of data that are generated. And of course, citizen science has something for everyone. And that was really clear today. There's a huge range of opportunities and subjects to cover lots of organizations involved. And of course, it's easy. You don't need to be an expert, but you can become one. And there are multiple benefits. So we've heard about collecting data to inform scientists and to influence policymaking. And it also contributes to a much bigger picture. And it also tells us, and I think Alan made that quite clear in his presentation, it tells us where the conservation measures are actually working. And there are also huge benefits to people's mental health and well-being. I think that came through really strongly from a lot of the presentations. And also connecting people with the places that they live and connecting people with each other, which I think has been really important over the last few months with coronavirus and a lot of us not being able to get out in the way we might have wanted to. And it's helped build a sense of community, whether that's on the ground or online. And of course, people have also learned life skills and it's really come across very clearly how much fun it is. So in terms of what's next, you know, we've, we've just heard from some really passionate and very wise young people. And I think we can all learn from their experiences and from the top tips that they've just given us. And we need to understand the barriers and how we can help them overcome them. And we need to make sure that everyone feels welcome and can get involved. So I'm now going to make sure that I pass the mic, as John mentioned, we, you know, we want our our older generation to pass the mic to the new one. I'm gonna pass the mic by concluding again to just thank everybody for being involved. Thank you for all the hard work that you're doing. And if, if you're just sort of toe in the water at this point, then I hope it's inspired you to get more involved. And I'll leave the final words of, like, well, I'll leave the final words to the introduction that you would have heard at the beginning. So thank you all very much.